Well, I have 9 a.m. on my clock. I noticed that the screen, the council screen shows 8.58, so we'll wait. Oh, now it says 9 o'clock. How about that? Just instantly refreshed. So we'll get started in about 30 seconds, so everyone get comfortable. All right, I am pleased to call to order the 258th, 258th meeting of the Pacific Fishery Management Council, this time conducted via webinar. This meeting is open to the public and copies of the meeting agenda and other documents used by the council during this meeting are available on the council's website. We encourage members of the public to testify and provide the council with their comments on any agenda item taken up by the council. In planning to testify, it is important for anyone wishing to testify to understand that when the, when, that when the council will take up public comment on a particular agenda item cannot always be accurately forecasted in advance. In particular, people should be aware that agenda items currently scheduled for the end of the day might be taken up the next day. Agenda items may also be moved up a day. Please note that the chat feature should be used for technical issues and not to make public comment. To comment on an agenda item, you must sign up on our electronic public comment portal available on the March Council meeting webpage. After public comment has begun on an item, no more names will be taken to testify. Each person has one opportunity to testify on each agenda item. Testimony on behalf of another person not in attendance will only be allowed within the period allowed for the person in attendance. Generally, I will limit individual testimony to five minutes for individuals, and 10 minutes for groups or individuals representing organizations. Some agenda items may have several people wishing to testify and if necessary to allow time for everyone to be heard, I will reduce the amount of time per individual or per group. We have a visual countdown timer that shows your remaining time allotment. Anyone wishing to include a presentation with their comment needs to submit presentations prior to 5 p.m. on the day before the agenda item is on the agenda. Documents need to be submitted to Chris Kleinschmidt and Sandra Krauss. Please contact Chris Kleinschmidt or the Secretariat if you have questions. Anyone wishing to include written electronic comments in support of your verbal testimony, please provide them in electric, electronic format to Chris Kleinschmidt and Sandra Krauss prior to 5 p.m. on the day before the agenda item and the comments will be made part of the official record of this meeting via the electronic portal. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed over the internet. Copies of the recordings will be available from the council website or you may purchase audio recording copies from the meeting recorder, Mr. Craig Hess. Let me remind council members and others to speak directly into the microphones that you're using so that we can all hear you. Lastly, I ask that all council members and members of the audience turn off the sound ringers on their cell phones and mute your connection while the council meeting is in session. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a, new, a new member of the council family, Ms. Rose Stanley, uh, NOAA General Counsel's Office. And uh, before I turn to Mr. Chuck Tracy uh, to call the role of council members, I'd like uh, council members, staff, and all of the public listening in on the webinar that uh, today is Executive Director Chuck Tracy's birthday. Uh, I'm not sure how old he is, but I doubt he's old enough to be eligible for a vaccine. So on behalf of the council, happy birthday, Chuck. And now I will ask uh, Mr. Tracy to call the roll. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks everybody for your 
uh, well wishes. Um, no, not not quite old enough for that vaccine, but that would that would have been a heck of a good birthday present. Okay, well, um, as I uh, call the roll, please uh, unmute yourself and, and acknowledge your presence. Uh, Mr. Corey Niles. Uh, present, thanks, Chuck. Happy birthday. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Phil Anderson. Happy birthday, Chuck, I'm here. Ms. Danny Evanson. Happy birthday, Chuck, present. <laughs> Uh, Mr. John Netto. Uh, good morning, present. Thank you. Mr. Bob Dooley. Happy birthday, Chuck. Thank present. You. And could someone uh, contact Brad? He's having difficulty getting online. Um, I just wanted to pass that on. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mark Gorelnik. Here. Dave Hansen. Here. Pete Hassemer. Present, Mr. Pisces. <laughs> Mr. David Hogan. Absent. Miss Maggie Summer. Present. Lieutenant Commander Scott McGrew. Uh, present. Virgil Moore. Well, I see Virgil, but I don't hear Virgil. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna mark him uh, as present because I see him on the screen. I hope he's listening. Uh, Mr. Joe Oatman. Present, happy birthday, Chuck. Thank you. Uh, Brad Pettinger, looks like he has not been able to join us yet. Uh, Mr. Butch Smith. Happy birthday, Chuck, I am here. Thank you. Krista Svensson. Yeah, good morning, I'm present. Ryan Wolf. Present and wishing our executive director a very happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, Marcy Aramco. Happy birthday, Chuck, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Louis M. And happy birthday, Chuck. I'm here. Great. Okay, so uh, just uh, gonna circle back here um, uh, to see if uh, Virgil has been solved his uh, uh, communication issue. Are, are you listening? Are you able to unmute yourself, Virgil? Okay, uh, if not, uh, perhaps we can provide, get some technical assistance to to Virgil, um, and then uh, I want to circle back to Brad Pettinger and see if Brad has been able to join us. I'm not seeing him here yet, uh, but presumably he is getting some technical assistance. In any event, Mr. Chairman, uh, you do have a quorum. That's uh, that's good. I'm I'm hopeful that Brad will uh, join us uh, very shortly. I, I do know that. Uh, there were some wind issues up there, but I'm not sure if that's, if that's the problem. So with a quorum, I guess we can move on and uh, go turn to the uh, executive director's, uh, well, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess the executive director's report. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the executive director's report typically provides information on the informational reports, uh, points of emphasis or updates on the proposed agenda, and updates from the Council Coordination Committee and matters of interest not on the proposed agenda and other matters associated with optimizing the council process. So I do have a, uh, a written report uh, in the briefing materials. It's agenda item A3, supplemental ED report. Uh, I'll go over that quickly here. Um, so the Pacific Council staff uh, received notice that our request for an extension to use our remaining 2014 to 2019 grant funds through 2021 was approved. So this was uh, an extension of our one-year extension. So that's good news. Our planned use of those funds in 2020 were curtailed due to reduced travel costs and agenda prioritization resulting from COVID-19 measures. Uh, NIMS has also reported their um, spin plan to the council coordination committee, 
which included a small increase for all of the regional councils, as well as a specific appropriation for the Pacific Council of uh, $250,000 to implement our fishery ecosystem plan and our climate and communities initiative. Uh, we have received the first uh, award uh, in January, which was at about 40% of our expected total uh, awards in 2021. So, uh, so we're in good shape in terms of our bank account at this point. Uh, we have canceled our hotel contract for June. Uh, we, will con uh, we will conduct June uh, by, by webinar as we have been doing uh, recently. We've not set the dates yet for the June meeting, uh, but they will be in the same general time frame as originally planned, which was June 22nd to 29th. Um, we are hoping that the September meeting could be held in Spokane as planned. Um, but uh, given the remaining uncertainty in hotel and travel costs and in consultation with the budget committee chair, uh, we're recommending that the budget committee meet in June to adopt a final operational budget. So that would be our next meeting of the budget committee. Uh, council staff has been working with the Pacific Sable Fish Transboundary Assessment Team to conduct a workshop uh, April 27th to 29th to gather recommendations from West Coast, British Columbia and Alaska stakeholders and managers for fishery objectives, performance metrics for assessing the attainment of fishery objectives and alternative management strategies to be evaluated by a management strategy evaluation. We've contracted with Misha Key to facilitate the workshop and our IT staff will be setting up a dedicated website for materials and registration by April 1st. So uh, keep an eye out for announcements regarding that. Uh, keep, we'll uh, put something on our website. Uh, and uh, if you have specific questions, John DeVore is our uh, lead staff officer for that. Um, and then as a reminder, the Pacific Council is host for uh, this year's Council Coordination Committee activities, um, which means that I get to uh, coordinate a lot of letter writing and report writing uh, for the group. Uh, but the spring, the CCC spring meeting is scheduled for uh, May 18th to 20th by webinar. And our fall meeting is being planned for October 19th through 21 in Monterey, California. The uh, CCC is proposing to send a letter to the Department of Interior and Commerce regarding Section 216A of Executive Order 14008 on tackling the climate crisis, crisis at home and abroad, uh, which proposes, among other things, to conserve 30% of our nation's lands and waters by 2030. A draft of the CCC letters included in agenda item C3 legislative matters where the council will consider approving the letter. So uh, please have a look at that letter and um, we'll be looking for approval and a quick turnaround to submit that to uh, Secretary of Interior and Secretary of Commerce. Uh, they have a deadline of the uh, about the 20th of April to uh, file a report with it with a task force related to the executive order. So we wanted to get our comments in so they have time to include them in their report. Uh, Section 216C of the executive order requires NIMS to collect input from fishermen, regional ocean councils, fishery management councils, scientists, and other stakeholders on how to make fisheries and protected resources more resilient to climate change, including changes in management and conservation measures and improvements in science monitoring and cooperative research. So uh, NIMS has announced a 30-day public comment period to get input on how to best achieve these objectives, uh, and that is included as informational report eight. Uh, Mr. Sam Rauch will be briefing the council on this executive order on uh, Monday morning, March 8th. So I expect to um, have an opportunity to converse with Sam on that day. Uh, I will note that uh, despite the 30-day public comment period, uh, NIMS has indicated that uh, they, are, they will be continuing outreach efforts and other targeted um, uh, ways to uh, receive input on this uh, beyond the 30-day period so that there's not a, a huge crush, for example, for the council to get their comments in uh, within 30 days. As a matter of fact, a number of councils won't even be able to, won't be meeting between uh, during the public comment period. So uh, the NIPS will be making allowances for that. Uh, Executive Order 13990 has two sections of note to the Council. Uh, section 2 requires immediate review of all agency actions taken between January 20th, 2017 and January 20th, 2021. Uh, one such regulation is the revised uh, NEPA implementing regulations that went into effect uh, September 14th, I believe, of 2020. 
Um, the CCC has established a subcommittee to work with NIMS in developing issues and questions for a workshop to look at potential revisions to that uh, reg to those regulations, uh, as well as a considering approach to potentially allow at least some of Council's Magnuson Act processes to be considered functionally equivalent to the NEPA process. Um, however, as a result of the uh, this latest executive order, the workshop has been postponed. Uh, with that said, the CCC subcommittee is continuing work towards uh, uh, towards that objective and uh, believe the functional equivalency aspect uh, in, in particular can be pursued under authority of the MSA, whether or not the NEPA rule is rescinded. So uh, so we continue to work on that, although at a bit slower pace than we had uh, anticipated. But I think there is still some interest uh, uh, from National Marine Fisheries Service in, in considering that. Uh, and then uh, Section 3 of uh, EO 13990 requires the Department of Interior-led review of the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument, including consideration uh, for restoring a commercial fishing prohibition in that National Marine Monument, uh, which was uh, that portion was rescinded during the Trump administration. So the CCC has sent a letter to the Department of Interior uh, commenting on this. Uh, this letter is essentially the same as three previous letters we've sent to earlier administrations opposing setting fishing regulations except under Magnuson Act authority. Uh, so that letter, uh, again, uh, n nothing new there, just uh, um, just sort of a reiteration of, uh, of all eight councils' positions in the past. Uh, that is uh, a supplemental attachment one um, under this agenda item. Um, a couple other things to note, uh, uh, we council staff and NIMS uh, staff continue to uh, discuss the regional operating agreement uh, process. Uh, so we, we are due for an update of that. Uh, we've had some discussions back and forth a couple of times. Uh, we continue to uh, make progress on that, I believe, and uh, expect to bring something to the council, hopefully in June, uh, with the uh, uh, sort of a a first um, look at, uh, at at our proposed changes with the intent of uh, trying to finalize an agreement by the end of the year. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is that uh, you, we uh, council staff had our usual retreat this year, except it was by webinar and uh, maybe a little bit truncated in terms of uh, the agenda. But uh, but one particular item has has come up. Um, uh, you know, and I'm sure you all are wondering about it as well. And that is, you know, how how are we going to uh, move forward once um, you know some of the COVID restrictions are lifted and we're able to meet in person again? There's uh, obviously we've uh, learned a lot and uh, seen some uh, some benefits and some uh, um, disadvantages, I guess, too, of the webinar-based uh, meetings. But uh, we want, you know, we continue to look uh, on how we can uh, uh, kind of separate the, the wheat from the chaff and, and maybe keep some of the uh, better features of webinar-based uh, meetings as we move forward. So uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, we've kind of been calling it a hybrid meeting uh, model. And so we're uh, we're continuing to look at that. We, we don't have anything to announce at this point, but, uh, but just wanted to let you know that we are looking at that um, as we move forward. So that's something that uh, staff will be working with uh, as, as we move forward. So uh, I will Pause there to see if there are any questions about any of this. Uh... All right, thank you, Chuck. We'll see if any hands go up, any questions on your report. You covered a lot of topics there and referred to a lot of materials that are in the briefing book. I am not okay. seeing anything, so carry on. Okay, and then I just want to, wanted to go over the uh, um, some of the informational reports uh, that we have. Uh, informational report one is a, a procedural directive on uh, uh, what to do when uh, stock status uh, determinations uh, come back as unknown. Uh, so there's some changes in how that, uh, uh, how that is handled. Um, informational report two is a uh, uh, discussion on modernizing uh, recreational fisheries uh, report. Uh, it's a report to Congress. Um, 
informational report three is a uh, uh, letter from the uh, Mid-Atlantic Council on uh, um, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service licensing inspection requirements for U.S. squid fishery. So this is just kind of a follow-up from uh, one of our comments on on that uh, uh, executive order uh, from last year, uh, noting that uh, squid squid are handled uh, treated differently for import export uh, review uh, from other fin fish species. So um, uh, just kind of a follow up on that. Um, information report four is on the economic impacts of the COVID on West Coast fisheries. Uh, information report five is an Office of Law Enforcement report on uh, uh, compliance summary for uh, trial rationalization. Uh, informational report six is uh, WDFW applications for federal relief funds. Supplemental report seven is uh, Salton Saul Kennedy uh, announcement for development of a programmatic environmental impact statement for awarding those funds. And then, as I mentioned, uh, supplemental uh, information report eight is the letter on the Northeast uh, Canyons Monument uh, issue that the, the CCC sent. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes uh, my remarks. All right, let's see if there's any, uh, uh, Mr. Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chuck, I just had a question on uh, vaccines and how it's affecting your ability to get back to work as a, and all your staff and actually working from your facility rather than at home. And just an update on that and if vaccines are playing a playing a role in getting people back together and getting back to normal. Uh, not yet, uh, I, I guess is the short answer. Um, the, um, you know, I think the age, you know, the, of course each, state and uh, has their own uh, rollout program for you know authorizing um, vaccinations uh, I, I don't know if any I don't know if any staff has been vaccinated uh, most of us are not quite at the uh, the age thresholds uh, for sort of universal uh, um, uh, ability to get a vaccine um, I'm sure there's probably other uh, caretaker type exceptions, but again, I'm, I'm not sure. So, so no, there, there hasn't been anything uh, yet. Uh, <clears throat> we have been working on uh, uh, sort of protocols for uh, for um, uh, office reintegration, I guess. Um, but uh, but you know, at this point, we we're not seeing any uh, uh, seeing any effect uh, of that with with staff. So we are all now uh, continue to uh, primarily telework. Um, there, there's a uh, very few of us that come into the office on a fairly regular basis, um, just because we have wall to ceiling or floor to ceiling walls and doors, and um, we also have a, an adequate internet connection, which is why I come to the office pretty much every day because I don't really at home. So, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, just uh, one follow up. It, it would seem like you'd be considering essential workers as well as you know, the rest of the fishing industry. I mean, it's important to, to have you, have you pursued that to try to uh, see if you can get some, some priority prioritization of vaccines within the, within your staff and you. Uh, we have not. Uh, yeah. To the extent that, uh, the, you know, that we are involved in, uh, in uh, food security. Uh, I think we are considered um, essential. However, you know, I guess uh, we have also been able to uh, more than adequately, I think, uh, conduct our jobs in a telework situation. Uh, we've not come across any uh, problems doing that. And um, so I think uh, we will continue to encourage um, uh, teleworking to the extent uh, we can, uh, uh, just as a precautionary measure. Uh, to reduce exposure, uh, potential for exposure. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, we also have a lot of staff that has, still have children at home uh, due to uh, the schools not being fully op reopened. So uh, um, again, we're, we're not, um, it, it hasn't been a problem for us to, to work this way. So uh, we've got this 
as you know, uh, fantastic IT staff that uh, keeps us all uh, well supplied with equipment and uh, and software technology and uh, good communications. And so, uh, so we've been, I think, uh, pretty successful at the at the telework. So we, we plan to continue that um, until uh, such time as, uh, um, well, certainly. I mean, you know, we're, we are still under uh, uh, right here in uh, Multnomah County, Oregon. Uh, we're still under, you know, a uh, fairly high uh, uh, cautionary uh, phase in our in the re in the state's reopening plan. Uh, so, uh, you know, we will continue to uh, abide by those local uh, guidelines as well. Thanks, Chuck. That was really, really good answer to all my questions. And certainly our, <clears throat> there's no, no visible sign to me that the, the, there's any lacking in the staff and, and the production. You guys are just doing an amazing job. So thank you. Welcome. All right. Any any questions of Chuck or any discussion on the executive director's report? All right. We'll move on then to approval of the March agenda. Let me first see if uh, we'll get that up. Well, you all have copies of the agenda. It's, it's on the it's on the website. It was in the briefing book. So um, let me see if there are any suggested uh, changes uh, to the agenda, additions or deletions. And uh, I'm not seeing any suggestions. So at that point, at this point, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Uh, Phil Anderson, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I uh, move that the, um, we approve our um, council agenda under agenda item A4. Thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, Bob Dooley, your hand is raised. Is that the second? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Uh, not seeing any. I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve the March meeting agenda, say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Uh, the motion passes. Well, any abstentions, I don't imagine. The motion uh, passes unanimously. Um, so thank you, everyone, for that. Um, I believe that concludes this portion of the agenda, the call to order. Uh, and unless, well, Corey Niles has his hand raised, followed by Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just um, didn't get my hand up fast enough before that vote there. I just wanted to acknowledge um, and, and that we will be hearing a request to, to maybe to alter the agenda here under the open public comments and just uh, maybe webinar fatigue didn't, didn't discuss it earlier, but just flagging that um, we are we are interested in hearing that and, and expect to be taking that up later in the agenda. Okay, and I guess procedurally we can do that later if there is uh, a, a reason to amend the agenda. But I guess right now we don't have that, so um, we'll proceed at least for now on the agenda as published. Anything further on this agenda item? All right, this concludes the call to order portion of today's agenda and takes us to open comment, and for that, I'm pleased to hand the virtual gavel to our Vice Chair, Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as we go to open uh, comment, I'd like to uh, Chuck to start us off, Chuck. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. So this agenda item provides the opportunity for advisory bodies, management entities, and members of the public to submit comments to the council on matters that are not part of the scheduled meeting agenda. 
such comments may be comprised of both written documents and oral testimony. So uh, for the um, brief materials uh, for this, uh, we do have some, uh, uh, we do have a report from NEMS, the science centers. Uh, so they're, they're going to present some information on the surveys, I believe. We also have a uh, advisory body report from the CPSAS. Uh, there's several written public comments, five, and I believe we have four people signed up for, um, for oral comment here. So, um, uh, so I suggest we kind of move through it in that order, starting with the NIMS report, uh, then the CPSAS report, then move to public comment. Um, I would also ask that uh, uh, when people are signed up for oral comment, um, if they could uh, raise their hand uh, so that uh, Patricia can find them easily and allow them uh, to speak when it's their turn, uh, that uh, helps smooth the process a little bit. So. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's uh, that's my overview. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. And uh, with that, we'll go to the uh, Science Centers and um, uh, Kristen Koch and Dr. Kevin Warner. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I guess I will go first. Just confirm it. You can hear me first. Um, you're good. Excellent. Thanks again, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Kevin Warner. I'm the director of the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Um, I want to extend my wishes for our executive directors. Happy birthday as well. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk about surveys as we have over the last year. We've been providing a coordinated report between the two science centers, between Kristen Cook and myself, around the state of our surveys. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and go first. I'm going to talk about our, this, this, there are the state of our, our surveys. I'll talk about the specific surveys we have planned for this year. We have three major fishery surveys that are most interest to the council. We have an ecosystem survey, and then we have some assorted other surveys. Then I'll offer some general comments about our surveys, and then I will um, turn it over to, to Kristen to do the same with the Southwest Center. So for the Northwest Center, we have, um, again, three major fishery surveys. The first is the the, the West Coast Groundfish Survey. This is a four boat survey. Um, this is an annual bottom trawl survey. It's the cornerstone of our mission to ensure healthy ecosystems and productive sustainable fisheries as mandated under the Magnuson Act. Our top priority is providing long-term time series data for the scientific management of West Coast groundfish and their ecosystem with this survey. The survey collects groundfish ground fishery independent data on abundance, distribution, and biology of the 90 plus list species included in the West Coast ground fish management plan, as well as coastwide environmental sampling for monitoring change within the California current ecosystem. The 2021 ground fish survey will be conducted from Cape Flattery to the Mexican border between May 14th and October 22nd. The survey will sample the entire coast using two chartered vessels, two chartered fishery vessels, for past one, which will occur between May 14th and June 23rd, and then a second pass with two additional vessels from August 13th to October 22nd. Our second major fishery survey is the Southern California Rockfish Hook and Line Survey. This survey is used by the Northwest Center um, to, or, sorry, this Northwest Center is planning to conduct this survey in the fall of 2021. This is a cooperative research effort that charters three vessels from the commercial sports fishing fleet to generate abundance, biological, genetic, and ecosystem information that is used in assessment and management of groundfish species in the sh shelf depths throughout Southern California. The hook and line survey complements the, the bottom trawl survey that I talked about previously by sampling hard bottom habitats in areas of structure that are not easily accessible mm -hmm. to the trawl nets. Mm -hmm. The 2021 survey will be the 17th year in the time series that dates back to 2004. And the proposed dates for this year's survey are September 20th to October 8th with mobilization in Oxford, California and demobilization in Long Beach, California. Our third major fishery survey is the Joint U.S.-Canadian Integrated Ecosystem and Pacific Hake Acoustic Trawl Survey. This will be conducted jointly by the Northwest Center and the, on the NOAA ship Bell Shimada and the Department of Fishery Ocean Canada on the Canadian Coast Guard ship, Sir John Franklin. The survey will begin in Newport, Oregon on June 27th, where after a calibration of acoustic systems, the NOAA ship Shimada will steam south to Point Conception to begin running acoustic transects. 
The survey is designed primarily in 10 nautical mile space transects from point conception to the northern end of the west coast of Vancouver Island, and then 20 nautical mile space transects from there, northern of Vancouver Island, to the Dixon entrance in Alaska. The Franklin will join the survey on August 11th off of Newport, and will cover a portion of the U.S. survey area until the two survey vessels meet on the west coast of Vancouver Island to conduct the inner vessel calibration from August 28th to September 3rd. The Franklin will then conduct a post-survey calibration and return to port on September 6th, and the Shimada will finish surveying the northern Canadian portion and will return, that will then steam to Seattle to conduct the post-survey calibration at the end of the survey on September 24th. I mentioned that we have ecosystem surveys. The primary one there is the Northern California Current Ecosystem Survey. This survey collects data on biological, chemical, and physical indicators used to create an ecosystem status report for the Northern California Current Ecosystem off the Oregon Shelf. We successfully field this survey in September of 2020 using the NOAA Shimada. Unfortunately, last month in February 2021, the survey in the Shimada was canceled because of severe weather. Um, that severe weather impacted both the ship's planned operations as well as the COVID testing, getting those results back and forth to the, the Marine Center in Newport. Given the short one-week plan duration of the survey, it was not feasible to delay or reschedule that survey last month. In addition to those surveys, we have numerous other small boat surveys and field operation planned for 2021. Many of those are already underway. Um, so I wanted to offer just a, a, a couple of general comments. Um, First being that our survey teams are, are diligently researching and planning ways to ensure that our surveys are accomplished this year. This includes a, new, a number of things, including safety and, and travel protocols, contingency plans, staffing options, and contract options where necessary for all surveys and maintaining when we're maintaining steady progress on gear readiness. We are also working closely with our assessment team to identify data collection contingencies. Critically, we believe we have the minimum staffing identified for all surveys. At this point, we're on track to execute the full suite of surveys planned for 2021, with the exception of the February 2021 Northern California Current Survey I mentioned before. That said, things can change. <laughs> it is possible we will encounter situations such as weather, unexpected staff shortages, or other conditions that would force us to reevaluate one or more surveys. Wanted to say a little bit about the vaccine. The COVID vaccine status is a common question that, that we're getting in and that I'm asking. Um, in late 2020, NOAA compiled a list of 6,100 critical personnel to prioritize for vaccines. This list includes both survey and observer personnel. This is both federal employees as well as contractors and other staff that, that are critical to executing these missions. However, NOAA has no access to vaccines. Vaccine distribution remains a state rather than a federal function at this time. States are welcome to contact NOAA for that list of the 6,100 critical personnel and to utilize that list as they see fit. Finally, I wanted to say we will continue to keep the council informed on our survey status throughout the year as we have over the last year. At regular meetings such as this one, we also stand ready to provide additional updates as requested and welcome discussions on our surveys, including one we just had this morning with the gap. So Mr. Vice Chair, that's my portion of the report. I will stop there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for a great report, and that sounds like good news. Um, questions for Kevin before we go to uh, Kristen? Okay. Oh, Bob Dooley. Bob? Uh, Kevin, thanks for the great – thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank, uh, thank you, Kevin, for the great report. Um, I was just curious. You talked about vaccines and that you have a list of people that are critical to – to getting our surveys accomplished, including observers and and scientists and staff that are on these on these vessels, I I'm curious. You said it's a not a federal. You don't you have don't have any control over COVID vaccines. However, the states do. Have you actively reached out to the states to see if there could be some kind of uh, assistance there, or is that is there some something preventing that, or just I'm just get, trying to get a better understanding because it just seems to me we ought to be all hands on deck, and that's about as essential uh, fish workers that I can possibly even think of. And I think we ought to be able to get uh, get some vaccines to get all those people vaccinated. So at least we'll have that box checked going forward. So I'm just curious what your comments might be on that. So thank you. Yeah, through the vice chair. Great question, Bob. Thank you for that. Um, 
it's we we have we haven't I would say we the direct answer to your question is no we haven't um, we haven't directly reached out to the states with our our, our list of folks it's, it's intended to go the other direction from the states reaching out to the, the agency um, as, as as you're probably aware there, there's a lot of sensitivities in our system of government about federal agencies um, reaching out to states and telling them what to do so I, I think that sensitivity has precluded us from being um, aggressive in reaching out to the, the states with our, our list of, um, of folks. That said, I mean, we, we do have the list, we stand ready to provide it, um, and we stand ready to engage. And that, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Mark Grelnick, Mark? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Kevin, do the, do the individuals uh, on these lists know that they are on a list uh, I, I can you know, speak at least for the state of California that uh, it's largely on the honor system. So if you're a desert, you know, if you're in the food and agriculture uh, sector uh, and, uh, you know, you can now sign up for a vaccine. So it may not even be necessary to um, involve state governments if these individuals uh, are advised that that they they have that status so have they been notified to, that they have the status and perhaps encouraged to take the initiative themselves through the vice chair good question i i believe the answer is yes that they are aware that they are on the the, the list i i would need to confirm that but i, I believe that's the answer um and i think there might have been more to your question i'm not answering well i guess the, the second half is once they know they're on the list, uh, have they been encouraged to take the initiative themselves to uh, obtain a vaccine based on that designation? Or because, and I think some folks are reluctant, you know, to, to they feel like they don't want to jump the queue, uh, so to speak, especially if they're younger and healthy. But if they're an essential worker in this sector supporting fisheries, uh, at least in the state of California, they're eligible for a vaccine and they should go and get it because we don't want to jeopardize uh, these surveys because without the surveys, we <laughs> it, it, it handicaps our ability to harvest the resource. Right, absolutely. Um, good question. The, the standing advice from NOAA leadership is if you're offered a vaccine, you should take it. <laughs> so... Um, so yes, we are um, encouraging people to 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 take advantage of. I'll take advantage. We're, to, we're we're encouraging people to to get the vaccine as it's offered. Okay, thank you, um, Bush. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Kevin, you stated something that um, it kind of um, maybe maybe you misstated. I I just happen to have a daughter that works in the health department field. So I know a little bit about the shot distribution and stuff, but I, I think that um, the federal government wouldn't actually be dictating to the states um, by letting uh, uh, letting them know and, and asking them to make sure they know, uh, you know, how important uh, these workers are getting shots to our uh, coastal communities and our, and our state's economy, being uh, fishing is, a, a, a real big importance, not only you know to our economy, but to supplying food for the nation. So, um, it's probably uh, uh, worth at least making the governor's offices aware of the three states or four states or whatever it might be to to let them know that we have this segment of the people here that uh, could be could be affecting our ability to feed the nation and. Uh, and so I, I don't see that as I understand what you're saying, but I don't see it at this case as, you know, the 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 uh, proverbial government, federal government telling the states what to do on this issue. So I, I would just uh, I would just offer uh, uh, somebody to work with the governor's offices to, uh, on these on these workers to let them know uh, the importance and maybe they uh, can, uh, can get in line. I, I know just a couple of weeks ago in the state of Washington. Uh, teachers were so far down the list, um, you know, they wouldn't get a shot till next next July, and now they've uh, been added to the list where they could uh, get shots, which makes perfectly good sense to me, uh, being that we need our get our kids back in school. So anyway, that's just a couple of thoughts uh, from uh, from my perspective. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay. Thank you much, uh, Pete. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Dr. Warner, for the um, report. Just a question. Last year, uh, NOAA had canceled the pit tag crawl in the estuary, and I, I know it's not federally managed waters, but uh, salmon survival and ocean abundance is important. Is that, are there any plans to resume that this year? Yes, sir. I, 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 I believe you're talking about the paratrawl survey in the lower Columbia. Um, and yes, we're working on 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 resuming that right now. I, I, I just signed off on something related to that last week. So um, still a work in progress, but like all of our, our, like most all of our field work and our surveys, we're, we are taking steps to resume those data collection efforts this year. Thank you. Okay, uh, Louis Zim, Louis. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, and uh, good to hear you from you, Dr. Warner. Um, I know that the NOAA Corps personnel, our uniform personnel, and, and maybe we have discussed this before, but uh, the Department of Defense is, is working hard to get their, all their personnel vaccinated, the Navy, et cetera. Um, has there been, been any discussion that for the NOAA Corps personnel to be vaccinated by the Department of Defense? Yeah, through the vice chair again. Um, good question. We just got an update this morning from our Office of Marine Aviation Operations where the NOAA Corps resides organizationally. Um, and that it, it, it was basically saying that, yes, there are um, many OMAO personnel um, are receiving the vaccine. And I've heard also, you know, along the lines of this, this conversations, I'm getting G chats from, from folks that are, are Inform me that, that that our observers are, especially in California, are actually getting vaccinated. So we, we do have progress, but we are making a lot of progress um, in terms of getting personnel vaccinated. And I expect to see that continue to accelerate in the days and weeks to come. Thank you. Okay. Um, seeing no more questions. Um, thank you, Kevin. We'll go to uh, Kristen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, good morning, members of the council. Happy birthday, Chuck. Uh, I'm Kristen Cook. I'm the director at the Southwest Center, and I'm following Kevin um, as usual with our, our survey update this morning. I'm pleased to be in front of the council also to give our update. Uh, and and essentially, uh, what Kevin said in his uh, the latter part of his comments applies to the Southwest as well, but I'm happy to take any additional questions. So let me run through our survey plans for 2021, uh, and then um, I have a couple of wrap-up comments as well. So for 2021, the Southwest Center has an extensive ship survey schedule that includes five surveys on our uh, larger NOAA FSVs and two partner surveys. Uh, for a total of 204 days at sea that we planned this year. So I'll run through those briefly uh, in the order in which they will occur. So first is our winter Cal Coffee cruise. The Southwest Center completes quarterly ecosystem surveys as part of our California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations, or Cal Coffee program, which has run for 72 years and is joint with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and with uh, the state of California's CDFW. Our first NOAA fishery survey of 2021, the Winter Cow Coffee aboard the NOAA FSV Ruben Lasker ran from January 12th through February 5th. So this is actually our first survey is already executed. I'm happy to report and we did that um, successfully. So the safety and scientific preparations for that survey were the result of a tremendous effort by a lot of people. Uh, while Cow Coffee cruises are, are typically a joint effort between the Southwest and Scripps, due to differences in sheltering and place protocols, Scripps researchers were unable to participate and the survey was staffed entirely by NOAA personnel. Our spring uh, coastal pelagic survey aboard the Reuben Lasker is scheduled from March 20th through April 13th, and it will complete an acoustic trawl method survey for the central substock of Northern Anchovy, as well as other CPS stocks from Central California to the Mexican border. It will also be run in conjunction with nearshore sampling conducted by the fishing industry. 
our spring Cal Coffee survey. The spring Cal Coffee survey is scheduled aboard the Shimada from March 25th to April 18th, 2021, and will be staffed entirely by Southwest Center personnel. Our rockfish recruitment and ecosystem assessment survey, the RREAS or juvenile rockfish survey, is scheduled aboard the Reuben Lasker from April 28th through June 22nd. While this was one survey that we were able to execute in 2020, effort for the 2020 Juvenile Rockfish Survey was considerably reduced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic due to limited sampling and spatial distribution that was conducted on a charter vessel rather than a research vessel or a fishery survey vessel. For 2021, we plan to resume our normal sampling effort off of Northern, Central, and Southern California for that survey. The California Current Ecosystem Survey, or otherwise known as our Summer CPS Survey, is scheduled for 86 days uh, on the Reuben Lasker and will be conducted from July 2nd through October 15th. This is a little bit uh, later than, than usual. The survey is in the planning stages now and permits are being sought. The hope is, and this is new and kind of exciting, a news um, from our perspective, the survey, um, the hope is that the survey will extend from Vancouver Island to halfway down the Baja California coast and be run in conjunction with the Mexican government. The intent is to sample for coastal pelagic species along the U.S. West Coast, as has been done in recent years, and then continue into Mexican waters to sample transboundary CPS stocks down to Punta Eugenia with the Mexican research vessel, the Dr. Simon Fraser, continuing on to Cabo San Lucas and all the way into the Sea of Cortez. Sampling in Mexico is still solely dependent on whether the appropriate permits can be finalized, but we think it looks promising thus far. Uh, we, have, we have requested all the required permits from the Mexican government and we are awaiting to hear more um, on that. But uh, sampling, uh, let's see, this would be the first time we have ever surveyed in, in Mexican waters for CPS in conjunction with a similar Mexican survey. So we're fairly hopeful about that. Sampling along the US West Coast will also be run in conjunction with nearshore sampling conducted by the fishing industry. Options to find synergies between the summer CPS survey and the Northwest Center Pacific Hake survey for this and future years are also being explored. The summer Cal Coffee survey is scheduled for July, 20, July 16th through 31st, 2001, 2021 on the UNALS vessel uh, Sally Ride. Since this survey is being conducted on a UNALS vessel, it's expected that Scripps personnel will participate. The Southwest Center normally sends about two people on that survey, and we expect it will be able, we will be able to do that as well this time, as long as safety protocols for both NOAA and the SIO can be complied with simultaneously. And finally, the Fall Cow Coffee Survey will take place from October 31st to November 15th, 2021 on the, on the uh, Sally Ride, and the plans are similar to the Summer Cow Coffee Survey. So just a few more comments. The ongoing pandemic conditions continue to bring challenges for planning, executing, and staffing surveys. We are putting more effort than is typical to conduct these surveys, and we'll continue to explore a variety of different options and contingencies to conduct them while complying with NOAA safety protocols. We were able to fully staff the winter cow coffee survey and expect to adequately staff both the spring and summer CPS surveys. As has been happening over the past year, conditions are ever changing and plans may need to be modified or, or changed. We will keep the council updated with survey activities throughout the year. Similar to the Northwest Center, all Southwest Center seagoing personnel, both federal and affiliate, have been placed on the agency's priority list for receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. We will keep the council updated throughout 2020 on our survey status as things may change. And as always, we welcome discussion on our surveys. I will just add here at the end in, in response to some of the questions, uh, Southwest Center personnel on that vaccine prioritization list um, have been notified that they're on the list. Uh, some of them have been vaccinated based on, you know, age requirements or, you know, within the state of California, according to what they have put out in the priority order. Um, so I do know some of our employees have received that, the vaccine. Um, uh, so far, I don't have a, a, a list of those folks or, or anything like that, but I do know some of them have received it thus far. 
And I think that concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, questions? Okay. Seeing none, I believe uh, Chuck had a question. Chuck? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, uh, so a question kind of for uh, actually both uh, Kristen and Kevin, but um, just uh, <clears throat> just curious if uh, uh, all of the uh, transact spacing or cadence, however you describe that, uh, are back to normal uh, or if there's any modifications to those. I, I, I noted in the uh, in uh, Kevin's presentation that uh, that there were some 10 nautical mile uh, transacts uh, in the uh, US Canada uh, uh, Hague, Hague survey and some 20 mile transacts uh, in the northern end. So I just wonder if that's normal or if there's any other uh, areas or, or surveys that have a different cadence than, uh, than what we're used to. And, uh, and then I would also just make a comment. I think that's fantastic news that. Uh, uh, there's a good chance we'll be surveying uh, in cooperation with Mexico uh, further south. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Chuck. Uh, to my knowledge, give I, I I don't have specifics yet on, I have seen draft maps for transects for our summer CPS survey, which is probably the one that most folks are interested in at the council. Mm -hmm. um, given the number of days that we have scheduled on the Lasker, um, uh, we do have some issues with these 45-day bubbles and some new constraints in 2021 um, that we have with the ships in terms of the, the, the way that they are um, operating them this year due to COVID protocols. Um, and so we, we are looking at how those uh, new restrictions will impact our surveys. I don't believe on, on the summer CPS survey, we typically do 20 nautical mile transects. I believe we will be able to um, keep to those. However, every year we do uh, an assessment of uh, CPS habitat, Pacific sardine habitat, and that helps guide our survey design for the year. And so it, it, it does change somewhat um, each year based on, on that. Uh, but I don't anticipate any any major changes to transect lines or things like that, just based on what I know about the, the, the amount of available time we have on the ship. Um, if I get some more, I'm texting with someone here. If I get some more information, I can come back after Kevin responds. Okay. Again, I, I can chime in there too, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks for the question, Chuck. For the Northwest Center, I mean, it's it's a good question about like what is normal, but yeah, I mean we're. We have the same 45-day window constraint that Kristen alluded to with the Hake survey in particular. That's our only survey on a NOAA ship that, that is longer than 45 days. So we've, we've had to make some adjustments based on, on that. Um, we're also making adjustments. This is the first year that Franklin, the Canadian Coast Guard ship Franklin, is going to be doing the survey. So there, there, there's got to be some overlap with the, the Franklin that wouldn't necessarily need to overlap in you know future years or past years. So there, there are sort of different things this year um, from, from those two things and from what happened in the past year. But I'd also say that in the past, there's, there's been um, constraints and, you know, including weather that, that have forced us to deviate from what would be the ideal um, plan or the ideal transect spacing. So I, I think we're in a, in a pretty good place going forward this year. And, and like Kristen, we can certainly um, get into more specifics um, with folks as, as there's interest or, Need, need to know, desire to know. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Chuck, anything else? My name is Mr. Meister. Okay, uh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning. Um, uh, this is, I think, primarily for Dr. Werner. The, you know, we uh, had the issues associated with uh, funding shortfalls. Um, with some of the ground fish trawl surveys that you, you've uh, helped us um, with in terms of formulating our arguments to take uh, to the people who have the uh, purse strings. And I was just wondering uh, where things stand um, in that regard and if you're having to cut back uh, because of the lack of funds in areas that you would otherwise uh, want to do. Um, 
added, you know, either additional vessels or additional vessel time, that sort of thing. Thanks. Yeah, through the vice chair, thanks, Phil, for that question. Um, just to provide a little context for those that maybe didn't track the question, in 2019, there was a funding shortfall that caused us to do a two-boat instead of a four-boat survey for the West Coast Ground Fish Survey. And then in 2020, obviously, we canceled the whole survey because of COVID. So those two years, those two years there was you know, obviously less than full effort on that survey. Um, this year, I mean, the good news is that we're, we're fully funded for this year. Um, we, we look like we're at this point well positioned for, for next year as well. So in the short term, um, the, the funding for the West Coast Grandfish Survey is looking good. That said, I would hasten to add that there is still a long-term concern in terms of the, the cost of that survey in aggregate, including charter vessel costs, salary, gear, travel, transportation, all of that. Um, those costs have been increasing at something significantly greater than the rate of inflation year over year. Um, and our budgets have not been, you know, not even been keeping up with inflation. So there is a long-term concern still out there, but that that is not the case for this year and probably next. Okay. Uh, Louis Zip, Louis? Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And this is directed toward, toward Kristen. Um, I ran <coughs> SIO ships uh, uh, into Mexican waters to do surveys. And, and one of uh, the uh, requests from the Mexican government was that uh, we would have a substantial amount of our scientific party be Mexican. And we had to uh, uh, negotiate this through the State Department. And I, I'm sure you know all this, but I, I just want you to keep in mind uh, this, this this challenge that uh, that may be part of the ask for Mexico. And of course, you'll have to worry about whether uh, their COVID protocols are, are up to your standard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zim, for that uh, remark. Yes, we are well aware of the Mexican um, requirements and requests we have made available to them as part of our permit request, um, at least one bunk on the ship, I believe. And yes, we're aware of all the COVID protocols um, having to be a, a abided by by all parties so that's all part of the negotiation it is enormously complex to try to survey in mexican waters we have done it with our protected resource surveys um, over many decades and so we've been successful getting into waters down there to do that we just have not been able to do it with our fishery surveys so i'm i'm we do have a lot of um uh, experience surveying in Mexican waters with NOAA ships, um, and we have taken Mexican scientists aboard on those surveys. Of course, that was not during a pandemic. Um, so there are added complications. I, I guess I would say at this point, given where we, we have had surveys had to be canceled um, uh, and with not a whole lot of notice. So I will just add here that I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, um, but there's always things that, that can go wrong and, and, and uh, more so uh, probably this year. So I'm I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm uh, but I'm realistic about what, what what's at hand as well. Thanks. Yes, uh, through the vice chair, uh, thank you. Um, I, I did experience one one case where we uh, proceeded all the way down into Mexican waters and then had to return. So uh, being realistic is uh, definitely a good approach, and I really appreciate your experience and and all all the experience of uh, the NOAA White ships doing this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Louis, uh, any more questions for the science centers? All right. Well, thank you both. It's uh, good news and um, look forward to a successful uh, survey season here. So, all right. Next up is the uh, CPS uh, advisory sub panel. And I believe, uh, I believe we have David Crabb given that. David? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, good morning, council members. Uh, happy birthday, Chuck. Uh, Chuck, I did want to let you know that my birthday party invitation must have went to the wrong address. With that, I'll be reading from agenda item B1A, Supplemental CPSAS Report 1, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Open Comment. 
The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory subpanel is extremely supportive of both fishery surveys and the health of survey crews and notes that vaccinating survey crews and observers would provide the most complete COVID-19 protection to the West Coast seafood supply chain. In our view, these individuals are essential workers in the food production business and would be placed in and should be placed in the that high priority category. Almost all surveys were canceled last year. And while it is possible that the mentioned individuals will be vaccinated following the normal processes, there have been delays in the manufacture and distribution change chains and the vaccination schedules are not fixed. We understand that this is not a role where the council can take direct action. However, we recommend that the council urge the National Marine Fisheries Service and state departments of fish and wildlife in supporting vaccination of these essential workers. We believe this may help garner support to ensure that the survey crews and observers are vaccinated with other essential food production workers. This would reduce chances of further disruptions in our data collection and fishing businesses. Scientific field surveys from the Foundation of Stock Assessments for CPS and prosecuting these surveys in 2021 is essential to produce accurate stock assessments. This seems like a goal everyone should be able to support. And with that, that concludes our report. All right, thank you, David. Uh, questions? Okay, seeing that, we'll move, uh, we'll move into uh, public comment. And uh, we have four, I believe, four people signed up. And I believe um, first up would be uh, Dan Waldeck. Uh, Dan? Mr. Chairman, good morning. You hear me? Uh, we do. Uh, I'm going to turn down the gap in my other ear so I can have my full attention on all y'all. Um, I am Dan Waldeck, Executive Director of the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative. And I'll just start out by saying that I sincerely miss seeing all of you in person. Um, so I am here to speak today um, about our request that the council recommend to National Fishery Service to implement an emergency rule to allow an at-sea whiting processing platform to operate as both a mothership and a catcher processor in the same calendar year during the 2021 whiting fishery. Uh, first, some comments to provide context about the importance of this request. COVID impacts in the 2020 whiting season resulted in lost fishing time, stranded whiting, and direct revenue losses of millions of dollars. During the 2021 Alaska Pollock season, three shore-based processing plants and three catcher processors experienced outbreaks that resulted in nearly three months of lost fishing and processing time. It is uncertain whether this lost time will result in, will result in stranded fish. However, the industry has already spent more than $10 million in just preparing for the 2021 season. Going into the 2021 whiting season, we now know that the occurrence of coronavirus will cause an entire operational shutdown of three to four weeks where no fish is processed, further exacerbating foregone opportunities and increasing response costs. These outbreaks and resulting shutdowns and impacts illustrate the continuing and elevated risk the whiting fishery faces from the coronavirus pandemic. In addition to these issues specific to fishery operations, it was clearly unforeseen in 2020 how long the pandemic would last, that coronavirus variants would emerge, and that vaccines would take so long to become available. An emergency action to address these unforeseen events is warranted as the ability of managers to craft long-term solutions continues to be hobbled by the coronavirus, as evidenced by the council being forced to hold virtual meetings and strictly curtail meeting agenda. This limitation, combined with the unforeseen and changing conditions, means the immediate benefits of an emergency action outweigh the value of advance notice, public comment, and deliberative consideration of the impacts on participants. That typically occurs under normal rulemaking. Without emergency action, lost economic opportunity to the mothership sector could result. In 2020, NIMS issued an emergency rule allowing a vessel to operate as a mothership and a catcher processor in the same year. We have been asked, why was the 2020 emergency rule not used? Um, as we note on our request, during the 2020 season, the one company that holds both a mothership and CP permit experienced four coronav coronavirus outbreaks, resulting in three vessels losing a cumulative four months of fishing time and stranding approximately 10,000 metric tons of whiting in the CP sector. A, ve a vessel acting as both the CP and mothership in the same year was not feasible due to the magnitude of the coronavirus outbreaks, 
the long downtime that was required to respond to these outbreaks, and the, the extended length of the Alaska pollock season. The available mothership permit was made accessible to other at sea processing companies free of charge, but because of the extended pollock season, shipyard schedules, and COVID fatigue after a long, difficult season, the mothership permit and the 2020 rule were unused. It has also been asked, why did industry not request an extension of the 2020 rule? In simplest terms, had an extension been requested at that time, it would have covered a lengthy period when the whiting fishery is closed, that is from January 1st to May 14th, or 133 days of the available 186 days of any theoretical extension. It is important to recognize that while the requested regulatory remedy for this emergency petition is similar to the 2020 action, the underlying causes of this emergency are different from those that precipitated the emergency action in 2020. The emergency facing the wider fishery in 2021 is that catcher vessels delivering to a mothership will strand fish because A, there is no available replacement mothership processing platform if one experiences a coronavirus outbreak, and B, the company in 2020 that elected to put their vessel in the CP sector and not in the mothership sector will be forced to again make that same operational decision that resulted in lost fishing opportunity for the mothership catcher vessels, again jeopardizing a significant portion of the mothership allocation. So moving on to solutions that we're requesting. In the short term, the only vessels likely to serve as replacement motherships or CEPs are the existing mothership and CPs. In order to give, in order to give potential processors the necessary flexibility and to provide opportunity for catcher vessels that could be displaced due to the COVID pandemic, at sea harvesters and processor participants request that the council recommend NIMS implement an emergency regulatory change for the duration of the 2021 season. The emergency rule would allow a processing platform to be a mothership and a catcher processor in the same calendar year versus opting to be one or the other. The solution would potentially allow catcher vessels to ensure the harvest of their mothership sector whiting and provide potential opportunities to other vessels whose fishing plans are disrupted due to ongoing COVID pandemic or other operational problems that arise in 2021. Since the current request is similar to the 2020 action that was recommended by the council and implemented by NIMS, the workload associated with the current request should be reduced because the council, its advisory bodies, and NIMS have already developed a record of decision. As a reminder, in the rulemaking implementing the 2020 action, NIFS concluded that, and I quote, maintaining the prohibition on processing platforms operating as both the CP and mothership in the same calendar year would have serious economic impacts. The, the quote continues, that the prohibition on processing platforms operating as, a both, as both a mothership and CP would place both sectors at ec economic disadvantage by limiting the operational flexibility of the at-sea sectors to respond to recent unforeseen events. Continuing, NIMS found that temporarily lifting the restriction on mothership and CP operations would increase the likelihood the mothership catch vessels have markets to deliver catch. And finally, continuing the quote, and stated that the operational flexibility provided in the emergency action would prevent significant ec direct economic loss to at sea whiting participants. So moving on to rationale. The rationale for this action is sub substantially different than 2020. Uh, in terms of the global pandemic, it is unforeseen that whiting participants and everyone would still be dealing with the effects of this pandemic over one year later. Students aren't in school, workers can't go to their offices, basic human activities are not possible. This is not a viable option for the fishing industry. We have to be on the water and we continue to, and continue to react and respond to this ongoing crisis. So simply put, we need your help to provide the flexibility to effectively respond and maintain our operations. Uh, to the coronavirus itself, the, the increase in spread of coronavirus and recent variants was unforeseen. It is unknown what the effects of these variants will have on the industry. In addition, and importantly, despite our best efforts, the fragility of our quarantine bubbles, the ease which COVID spreads, and how quickly an outbreak can overwhelm an operation were unforeseen in early 2020. And in terms of outbreak response, it was unforeseen how the development and implementation of local, state, and national health directives would impact the fishing industry in response to vessel outbreaks in the fishing industry. It is important to note a critical distinction. So I'm moving on to sort of concluding statements now. And, it, and so it's important to note a critical distinction. While this remedy seeks a similar response to what's in the mothership utilization package, the goal of those two actions are very different. That action, is analyzing and considering changes to address chronic under in the entire mothership sector. 
This emergency request is directly focused on a cause and effect relationship and associated negative impacts of a global pandemic. The goal would be to prevent significant and direct economic loss to the sector that would be in addition to or beyond the existing challenges the sector faces. So finally, in summary, to date, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted numerous at-sea vessels and shore plants in the Whiting and Alaska groundfish fisheries. The impacts of the outbra these outbreaks have been severe, and every Whiting mothership, catcher vessel, and catcher processor risks losing fishing time and or markets due to further outbreaks and closures. It is critical to the catcher vessels, their crews, and processing markets that companies have the broadest opportunity to bring in replacement, ve replacement vessels if additional coronavirus outbreaks shut down fishing or processing in 2021. So again, in a nutshell, this is about um, operational flexibility. This is about uh, ensuring optimal yield. Um, I, I think we, we tried our best to outline and highlight um, how things are enhanced, how they are different from the 2020 situation. And uh, I, I thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, questions for Dan? Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the testimony. Um, can you give me a sense of how many um, CPTs or um, might be in a position to take advantage of this opportunity where it provided? I know last year we were, I think we were primarily looking at one vessel that ended up not utilizing it for the reasons you articulated. I'm just wondering, uh, are there other vessels that uh, might be in a position to take advantage of this? Thanks. Uh, through the vice chair, Mr. Anderson, uh, you're, you're right. I, I think primarily it, it, it looks as though um, it is potentially one vessel that could take advantage of this flexibility. I, I think it it's, might be too early to, to sort of provide a, 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 a succinct direct answer to that question, given we don't know what the, the TAC is going to be yet, and we don't know what sort of outbreaks might occur. And so I, I think, again, it's this question of, of, of having the flexibility to address potential problems when they arise. And it's hard at this point to foresee what type of problems might arise. And so I, I apologize for not having a, a clearer answer. Yes, it is clear that that one vessel uh, would, would be, you know, prepared to, um, to use this flexibility were it provided. Um, I think, though, the, the potential is always there as problems arise for other platforms to also take advantage of this flexibility. So I hope that addresses your question. Thank you, Dan. Um, Maggie Silver, Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dan, for the, the testimony. A question on um, the statement in the letter that says the company in 2020 that elected to put their vessel uh, in the CP sector and not the mothership sector will be forced to again make the same operational decision. Uh, can you just give us a little bit more information, if, if you know it, on the um, factors and, and the timing of that operational decision making on uh, you know, as how it, it would relate to the, the need for an emergency rule here and, and the potential timing of one. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Summer, that is a, a very good question, and I, and I thank you for that question. My, my preference would be to def defer that question to Mr. Trent Harthill from American Seafoods, who I think is um, better prepared and, and actually um, more appropriate for him to speak to those company-specific issues, if that's, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Uh, further questions? Um, seeing none. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Trent Hartle and uh, followed by uh, Jeff Schuster. Trent? Yes, good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Uh, my name is Trent Hartill with American Seafoods. Um, I would like to speak this morning regarding the uh, proposed emergency rule that's submitted under this agenda item. Um, as you probably know, we own both uh, CP and mothership permits and historically operate four vessels in the CP sector and one in the mothership sector. Um, we support this request for emergency action and the flexibility it, it would provide our vessels um, would definitely be very helpful. 
Um, there's several important distinctions between this emergency request and the one last year. Um, and first, I want to emphasize that, that we are not asking the council to repeat the emergency rule from last year. Um, the requested remedy is the same as 2020, but the conditions of the emergency are different than, than in 2020. Um, Dan highlighted an, a number of these items, um, so I won't go through all of them, but you know, first and foremost, it, it's unforeseen that, that the whiting participants would still be dealing with the risk of stranding fish, as well as the operational shutdowns due to coronavirus a year later. Um, and second, for us and the industry at large, it's been totally unforeseen how just how impactful a coronavirus shutdown can be. At this time last year, we definitely didn't see uh, just how damaging an outbreak could be and how it would prevent us from, from getting fish out of the water. Uh, to illustrate this, you know, American Seafoods experienced four different outbreaks last year, and our vessels uh, lost um, four months of fishing time due to that. Um, in addition, uh, going into the 2021 Alaska groundfish season, multiple CPs have had outbreaks as well as numerous shore plants. You know, this illustrates the risk of a shutdown is present for all at sea participants going into this whiting season. Uh, all of us will have to, all the at sea participants will have to quarantine crew, which has failed for at least a subset of the industry in every season um, since this pandemic began. I think that that point is important. Um, the point that despite our, uh, the industry's best quarantine and coronavirus mitigation efforts, you know, the virus continues to find a way onto vessels and into processing plants um, is, is definitely unforeseen. Um, the last, last point is, um, you know, as a result of these changing conditions and, and the very real risk that this pandemic, that the, that, that pandemic related shutdowns to our vessels, um, we have to choose between operating as a mothership and risk stranding CP fish or operate as a CP and strand fish in the mothership sector. This emergency rule would provide a pathway where fish won't have to be left in the water. Um, and as such, you know, we've committed to start the season operating as a mothership if the council and the agency move forward with the emergency rule. Um, so I request that the, the council support this and the agency uh, help the industry out uh, in these trying times. Um, with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Trent. Uh, questions for Trent? Uh, Maggie Summer. Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Trent. Uh, same question I had posed to Dan. Can you tell us a little bit about the the timing that would go into your uh, operational decision on uh, beginning the season as a mothership, as you just said? Yeah, uh, through the Vice Chair, uh, Maggie, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think there's there's two lines of thinking here. First is if if there is not an emergency rule that that would provide any flexibility, you know, our decision making process would would hinge on a number of things. First being, you know, how does the remainder of the Alaska Pollock fishing uh, go? Um, all of our vessels are still engaged in Pollock. We have a, a, a ways to go with that. Um, you know, thankfully, as uh, thus far in the season, we haven't had any outbreaks. Um, however, we have crew rotations, and you know, there, there's a possibility of of, of an outbreak occurring, um, and that would affect the timeliness of of us concluding that season, as well as the timing of uh, quarantine for the spring whiting season. Um, so that that's a big factor. Second is the uh, the, the the whiting quota. Um, you know that that's in the process of of uh, taking place, and the size of that will will uh, help inform you know our, our operational plans. Um, and basically, you know, we would be looking at you know how can we maximize you know getting fish out of the water. Um, you know, as of right now, if if you know coming out of this meeting, we have an indication that. Um, you know, the emergency rule would be uh, developed, you know, we're prepared to commit to um, operating as a mothership to start the season be because we would know we would have some flexibility to accommodate, you know, unforeseen circumstances in, in shutdowns and being be able to maximize um, getting fish out of the water. You know, I think the, the other element that's important to, to consider here is, is communication with the catcher vessels. 
um, you know, we need to be able to have enough time to, to let them know what our plans are, um, let them know that, that we're going to be, you know, in the mothership sector or not. Um, and, you know, having, having, uh, uh, the, the council and the agency, you know, provide us that indication would be able, uh, would provide us the ability to, to tell the, you know, the catcher vessels that, you know, we're going to be there, um, come May to, to take their fish. So I, I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Trent, for coming forward here and testifying today. I appreciate it. I, I have a question. <clears throat> You're talking about having a, a prerequisite of having the emergency rule uh, in order to assure that you can use your vessel as a mothership in the, in, in the opening May 15th season. Um, it, it occurs to me that, you know, there's, that's pretty quick. That's, that's coming right at us pretty full force. Are you looking to have the, uh, it, as a prerequisite, are you looking to have the rule in force or the rule in the pipeline to be approved, uh, as that, you know, decision point? And if the rule is, is, uh, is going through the pipeline to be approved at some time, maybe even after the season start date of May 15th and maybe even into June or even, you know, uh, as long as it's, it's, it's going forward, is that enough to make your commitment that you will have that vessel on the grounds? Yeah, uh, through the vice chair, uh, Mr. Dooley, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, the best case scenario is that the rules in place, um, you know, ahead of the season or, or at least by May 15th, um, you know, last year, the, the, this, uh, the similar request in 2020 was brought to the council in April and the subsequent rule was, was put in place, I believe June 19th. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I, I hesitate to, you know, think to, to know what the, the agency's ability to turn this around would be, but I, I'm hopeful. And I, and I think that it would be able to be in place by the, the season start date. Um, if it's not, if there is an indication from the council and from the agency that it's in the works, it's a matter of time, it's coming, you know, that's enough for us to continue with our plans to, to start the season as a mothership. Um, you know, if we know it's, it's just a matter of time to implementation, you know, we would, we would still start the season, you know, in the mothership mode. Thanks, Trent. That was a good uh, the answer I was looking for, so thank you. Okay. Um, further questions for Trent? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Trent. Um, next up is uh, Jeff Shester, uh, followed by uh, Heather Mann. Jeff? Great, thank, thank you. This is uh, Jeff Shester representing uh, the conservation group Oceana. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, present a new scientific publication uh, in Frontiers in Marine Science that uh, I also presented at the 7th International Symposium on deep sea corals in Cartagena, Colombia, um, the, along with my co-authors. Uh, the, 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 the paper highlights the international leadership of the PFMC in protecting essential fish habitat, deep sea corals, and restoring fishing opportunities uh, through strong rebuilding and catch limits. And we believe it's very relevant in the context of President Biden's executive order, uh, climate change resilience, marine planning, and biodiversity protection and also highlights the role and perspective of NGOs like Oceana in the process. Next slide, please. So as you know, uh, corals uh, are, are not just uh, beautiful in, in terms of biodiversity and, and visual appeal, but also are, uh, provide important habitat to many uh, fish and deep sea marine life, uh, particularly the, the many fish in the ground fish assemblage. Next, next slide, please. And uh, Calif the, the waters off the U.S. West Coast are actually uh, surprisingly diverse uh, and abundant in terms of deep sea corals. There are over 101 different species of, of corals off the U.S. West Coast. Most people don't realize them because you don't see them as often in shallow waters. Uh, but in some of these deeper waters where the fisheries exist, uh, these corals provide an important structure uh, on, on an otherwise potentially uh, flat seabed. Thank you. Next slide. And, and importantly, in terms of the recovery time, uh, some of these are the oldest animals on Earth. Uh, deep sea corals off uh, Hawaii, uh, black corals dated to be over 4,265 uh, years old. 
Uh, and, and we're still discovering new species. For example, this uh, Christmas tree coral, which was discovered off of Santa Cruz Island and recently then uh, later found off other areas, uh, as well as uh, things like Lophelia coral reefs that weren't even thought to exist here are now recently being discovered. Next slide. So uh, where our paper starts is looking at the, the 2006 U.S. West Coast uh, protections that, were, that occurred uh, that protected much of the, the waters off the West Coast from bottom trawling. Uh, in 2006, as a result of council action and as, as well as actions by various states, uh, over 350,000 square kilometers of habitat was protected, uh, representing about 45 percent of the uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, as well as extensive rockfish conservation areas in various depth bands. And these closures, we estimate, uh, displaced about roughly 14% of the prior bottom trawling effort, which is how we're, we're estimating uh, the economics uh, and the economic impacts of some of these closures. Next slide, please. So what, what the paper describes and what many of you remember uh, uh, is that the, this council took, took on a, a pretty robust process that I think serves as a model for other processes through, through its EFH review and, and, uh, and Oceana and, and many other groups participated in the, the process of developing proposals and alternatives. This included a review of existing information and synthesis by NIMS. Uh, and the EFH committee, uh, uh, significant tribal outreach, industry meetings, uh, National Marine Sanctuaries putting forward proposals and, and convening their own processes, uh, GIS mapping overlays, uh, development of a collaborative proposal uh, across uh, you know, industry and various NGO stakeholders, uh, various analysis, and then public outreach to generate excitement and, and interest in, in what otherwise I think is, is more of a fishery management topic, but getting people excited about the idea of protecting habitats. Uh, so we, the, the, this figure shows kind of one of the examples of how we overlaid various substrates uh, and, and coral and sponge data, as well as fishing effort to develop uh, the, the proposal for, uh, for changes to essential fish habitat uh, that Oceana submitted in 2013. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, uh, over this time, Oceana conducted a whole series of uh, offshore expeditions to increase the information base. Uh, to, to the council, uh, several off of uh, Oregon, as well as off of uh, Monterey and uh, Southern California. And next slide, please. And we presented the, the, this information in a series of reports and pre presented our findings uh, publicly and to the council. And, and uh, this, this served as important information. Uh, importantly, also the, that this included the documentation of commercial fish species managed by the council co-occurring with uh, various species of corals and sponges uh, from the various research dives. Next slide, please. So the, all of this happened, I think, in a very timely manner, right at the same time as the uh, there was a really dramatic uh, recovery of several of the overfished species. This is just showing an ex one of the examples of lingcod, which rebounded uh, uh, very successfully as a result of various measures the council had put in place. And this provided uh, an important opportunity to consider uh, the simultaneous reopening of the rockfish conservation area with new EFH conservation areas uh, to prevent adverse impacts that might otherwise occur if the RCA uh, were, were opened uh, in isolation or independently. And so this really provided the opportunity for, I think, what we, we're characterizing as a win-win outcome. Next slide, please. So the council, uh, through uh, much of this process in 2018, uh, unanimously uh, made a, a decision that was hailed uh, by, by fishermen and conservationists alike as, as a win-win and a success, uh, a grand bargain. Uh, uh, and, and this included over 140,000 square miles of new protections, including uh, 53 new EFH conservation areas, as well as uh, reopening several hundred square kilometers of, of conservation areas this new deep sea ecosystem conservation area that was closed uh, under the provisionary, uh, the discretionary provisions of the Magnuson Act, uh, closed to all bottom fishing. 63% uh, of the trawl RCA was reopened. And uh, as a result, cumulatively, this resulted in 90% of the US West Coast EEZ closed to bottom trawling, which you can see uh, in these maps here, coastwide, as well as some specific areas uh, like uh, Grays Canyon, like some areas on the, on the, off the Farallon Islands and Cordell Bank, as well as the, the, the impressive protections around the Southern California Bight uh, that protected most of the unfished areas while still maintaining 
uh, near shore areas uh, where state managed fisheries occur. The next slide, please. So we analyzed in the paper the increases, not just overall, because I think a lot of this is dwarfed by the offshore deep sea protections, but you can see in terms of total area, uh, coral and sponge observations and hard substrates uh, across different depths uh, that there are increases in these. Uh, the, the blue shows the shelf or shallow areas, the orange is the upper slope and the gray is the lower slope. And you can see increases, particularly on the number of coral and sponge observations and hard substrate uh, across various steps uh, that resulted in, from the cumulative changes uh, by the council. Next slide. Uh, you can also see this in terms of just breaking it down by specific bioregions. There are uh, three uh, bioregions, both looking at uh, the, the shelf and upper slope for each one. And you can see all of these boxes where they're, they're green were increases in, and in that bioregion. Uh, the the uh, oranges were slight decreases and yellow were basically no change. So you see overall for most of the bioregions, uh, with a few notable exceptions, there were increases uh, across uh, coral and sponge observations and hard substrate, even though some total area was uh, ultimately less protections, uh, particularly off the northern and, and central bioregions. Next slide. In addition, looking at this measure of uh, displaced bottom trawl effort, we looked at the amount of bottom trawl effort, as I said before, that was displaced by the original 2006 suite of closures and compared that to uh, how much uh, of the earlier trawl effort was uh, displaced later. And we basically found that coast-wide, the combined set of actions actually restored nearly 25% of the historic fishing effort that had previously been displaced by these closures on a coast-wide basis. Next slide, please. And you can see uh, in this table three, uh, it, it, in particular, the areas where the most uh, of trawl effort was restored include the uh, upper slope and shelf of the north bioregion, as well as the upper slope of the central bioregion. So basically uh, waters off of uh, central California all the way up to the uh, Canadian border. Next slide. So we believe that the, there are many elements here that really enabled a win-win outcome. You can see this map here showing uh, this growing uh, uh, effort from, uh, from the Arctic down through to the Mexican border, uh, including uh, British Columbia of moving toward a freeze the footprint approach. Uh, we believe that the success here was really uh, put forward by a, a transparent public process with collaboration and analysis, a precautionary approach based on the science of deep sea corals, the combination of both RCA opening and EFH in, in, in one cumulative process, uh, creating incentives for transparency, data sharing, and research. And really this shows that adaptive management can allow for win-wins that benefit both conservation and the fishing community if the initial protections are strong. Uh, last slide, please, and then next slide. So we wanted to just voice our appreciation for uh, the council, the various advisory bodies and scientists and uh, tribes uh, states, conservation groups that participated in this, and, and really uh, hope the council can view this as a, as a major success story uh, to build upon in the future. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff? Uh, Marcy, uh, you're in go. Marcy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Jeff, for the presentation, and I want to congratulate you and your colleagues uh, on a nice scientific publication. Um, on your very last slide, you reference um, a number of thank yous. Um, and one of them is to the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program. Um, I believe we'll be uh, hearing a little bit in our next agenda item from sanctuaries on their work um, to um, map and explore um, areas within the sanctuaries um, continuing on with um, NOAA's deep sea coral research and technology program to locate and study uh, the distribution and abundance of corals and sponges uh, both in and out of EFH. Um, I'm just wondering if you can help um, me understand exactly what the um, relationship is between the various study programs. Have you all pooled your data together uh, so that it's in a comprehensive 
uh, system? Um, how, how is that managed? Are, are we, or is everybody sharing all of um, the, the outcomes of the surveys? Um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about um, the collaborative nature of the work. Great. Uh, thank you through, through the vice chair and thank you, Ms. Uremko, for the for the question. And uh, yes, definitely appreciate the, the work of the sanctuaries, which I, I referenced earlier in this process and, um, and and the collaboration with the Deep Sea Coral Program. Um, I, I think there has been a really uh, positive collaboration between various researchers and uh, the and the NOAA, uh, various branches of NOAA. Um, for example, on our Southern California expedition, uh, we collaborated uh, both with the Channel Islands uh, National Marine Sanctuary and the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program on the actual uh, data uh, uh, collection methodologies to make sure that our transects and way of collecting data were consistent with the way other researchers are collecting that data. And we were, uh, be because we had done so, we were able to uh, to put in our uh, the, the findings from our research uh, into the uh, NOAA Deep Sea Coral database, which is probably the the kind of go-to uh, best spot to, to where where there's the most comprehensive uh, database of uh, deep sea coral records and, and sponges uh, throughout uh, throughout the world, actually, uh, including on the, the west coast. And and our our information was able to augment that and contribute to that larger data set. Which then that that was the kind of key data set that we used and was used in our analysis to look for to look at both the presence and the actual uh, documented occurrences of deep sea corals. So I think there has been a really uh, positive uh, interaction. Um, we we participated in the um, the, the deep sea coral and uh, in, 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 uh, there's a West Coast initiative as well as Alaska initiative that's starting up soon. Um, so th these provide opportunities for research for NGOs like us to, to provide input. And, and one of the real key uh, areas that was really focused on is doing some important, some, some baseline or pre-work prior to the 2020 implementation of the EFH closures uh, so that there is actually a before and after both for areas that are being newly reopened as well as for areas that are newly becoming closed. So you have the before picture which uh, there wasn't really time to do and didn't happen in the 2006 closures. So I do anticipate that as a result of all these collaborations, we're going to have a, a much better body of, of information to, to base future management decisions on in the future. And definitely want to report that there has been a very positive collaboration among the academic uh, NGO and, and government sectors, particularly led by the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Program and the sanctuaries. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyone else with questions for Jeff? Okay. This is Chuck. I've got a just a comment. Um, yes. Uh, Jeff, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for you and your team putting this together and and uh, publishing this. This is a great uh, resource to have everything sort of put together in one place. Um, and um, so uh, I think uh, this will be a very useful document for us going forward. And I think there's some certainly some. Uh, relevant issues that are developing now that, uh, that this sort of uh, will help us uh, characterize. And uh, so thank you very much for your for you and your team's efforts. Thank you, Chuck. Right. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is um, Heather Mann. Heather? Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, Council Members. Good morning. My name is Heather Mann, and I represent the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. I wanted to take a few minutes to share some of what's been on my mind as we begin this March Council meeting. Um, so I'll jump right in. Um, there's simply not enough capacity in this process to take on all the groundfish issues that need to be addressed let alone enough capacity to take on all the issues across all sectors and fisheries in our region. And by capacity, I mean council floor time, uh, NIMS staff capacity, the GMT workload. You know, this was a problem prior to COVID and now one year into COVID, um, I'm worried that the management process is on the cusp of finding itself so far behind uh, that it never catches up. In the meantime, there are fundamental improvements that need to be accomplished and implemented for our fisheries. They're either stalled or in some cases tabled indefinitely. 
emergency rules are proposed that could bring some immediate relief, but approving and implementing those rules can cause further NIMPS workload issues. And I think you've um, been talking about 1ER this morning. Um, because of the capacity issues, we end up having sectors and gear types that are pitted against each other as we try to convince you council members and NIMPS that our particular sectors fishery deserves the priority. And this is really an unfair position for all participants to be in, stakeholders and decision makers. Um, the industry tries to compel you, the decision makers, and, and you're forced to make decisions that literally, you know, could mean the life or death of a family fishing business. And right now, this is all exacerbated by the pandemic. And everything is done remotely, which adds to the isolation and misunderstandings and hard feelings that many are experiencing. Uh, this morning, we heard in the gap that NIMS is tracking vaccine distribution, but not actively pursuing vaccines because they're prevented from doing so uh, because vaccine distribution is up to the states and NOAA is a federal body. And you, you talked about that with Dr. Warner. Um, I just want to say that I've been working tirelessly to find ways to get my fishermen vaccinated, just as I did to get them tested prior to the 2020 hake season. And I don't understand why NIMS would be sort of passive and sort of proactive and aggressive, ensuring their survey staff are deemed essential and get them vaccinated. Um, this might seem like a small issue to be frustrated about, but I believe it's critical that surveys happen this year, uh, no matter what. In our current situation, it's not just the harvesters and processors and communities that are negatively impacted. It is obvious that the situation has put extreme strain on advisors, the management teams, council members and staff, as well as NIMPS and state employees. I've come to recognize that the stress on managers, NIMPS employees and others is very real. And I am truly empathetic. The stress on, in, stress on industry members is also crushing. Not only are our fishing businesses struggling to overcome unprecedented hurdles due to the pandemic, the regulatory improvements and changes we so desperately need are caught up in a quagmire of inadequate government capacity and bureaucratic red tape. And this current situation is not only untenable, it's unsustainable. So as we approach the meeting this week and the decisions that need to be made, I've been thinking about the essential needs of fishing businesses, thinking about sacrifices and results and paths forward, and I'm thinking about fairness. Um, the Trawl ITQ program has resulted in tremendous conservation gains, but as you have heard time and again, the economic benefits have been realized much slower and not at all for some. We could not have rationalized the fishery without the industry-sponsored trawl buyback program and the capacity reduction which followed. The flip side of that is the trawl industry having to compensate the government for retiring 91 vessels and the associated permits. That has cost the remaining active trawl fishermen over $40 million since 2005. And as of January this year, we still owe another 12 million. And this is after all the work we did to remove approximately 6 million from the outstanding balance, thanks to legislators securing an appropriation to help us remove that excess interest um, that was tacked on due to a delay promulgating repayment regulations. With the rationalization program came 200% monitoring, 100% monitoring, on the boat, 100% at the processor, all on the industry's dime. This is way more coverage than any other West Coast fishery by far, and the other sectors that are partially observed do not have to pay for that monitoring. On top of all these expenses, we've been writing checks to the government for cost recovery. Since 2014, the trawl industry has paid over $11 million to the agency. If you tack on the buyback loan payments during that same time, trawl fishermen on the West Coast have had to pay over $30 million to the government in the last seven years. Almost $30 million in the last seven years. And don't forget, this money is deducted off the top of every delivery made to a shoreside or at sea processor. I learned last week of a family trial business in Newport who made the painful decision to uh, no longer participate in the groundfish fishery. And they have been delivering groundfish into our port for decades, but they can no longer afford to participate under the trial IQ program. 
They're not the first to make that decision, and unfortunately, they probably won't be the last. Because of the sacrifices of the trawl industry and our commitment to sustainable fisheries, we have an amazing conservation story on the West Coast. Rockfish species have been rebuilt decades in advance of when they were expected to. Trawlers and non-trawlers alike have benefited because of the actions of the trawl industry. Our 200% monitoring reduces uncertainty in stock assessments, and that benefits all ground fish users across sectors and gear types. Our voluntary commitment to utilizing Sea State as a monitoring service and sharing information from the whiting fisheries has resulted in even more spatial knowledge for managers and decision makers that would otherwise be unavailable. Um, people may not know, but we've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for this, above and beyond what the direct costs of participating are. We have our willingness to shut down tens of thousands of square miles of ocean to fishing. We've arbitrarily set strict harvest guidelines for ourselves in order to minimize Chinook interactions. Even though the biop says the trawl industry could harvest 19,500 Chinook with no jeopardy to ESA listed stocks, um, we know that that's not right. And so we show our dedication and willingness to work for the greater good of all fishermen and sectors. This too comes at a cost for us, whether it's the fuel cost to move uh, because of these voluntary limits um, or the time lost. And so now we enter a week where the trawl industry will have to fight to get our issues prioritized. The mothership sector has not performed as was intended and participants, some of them are leaving hundreds of millions of pounds of whiting in the water each year. The fixes we have proposed could lead to meaningful improvements, uh, but they're gonna take a long time to implement. And we've been notified that in order to work on fixing the sector, uh, we'll be charged cost recovery so that NIMS can recoup their expense for time working on a sector that has never performed as intended. We have an electronic monitoring program that's set to move to regulation in 2022, even though there are a myriad of problems with the proposed program, not the least of which is transitioning all of the expenses to the industry versus the cost sharing approach that exists now. Uh, and we're being caused or charged cost recovery to develop an unsupported EM regulatory program. There's a good chance that non-trawl issues will be prioritized at this meeting, probably at the detriment to trawl fisheries. And the irony here is that a lot of the opportunities that other sectors are looking to take advantage of come as a direct result of the work and sacrifices of the trawl industry. Sectors with very little monitoring or accountability are benefiting from the 200% monitoring that the trawl sector endures and pays for. Do not get me wrong, I believe all sectors and fisheries and fishermen deserve to have their fisheries managed to achieve OI. I fully support fishermen getting access to the non-trawl RCA, but I do believe the trawl sector faces a unique situation. We have all the financial and operational burden of being rationalized, but we do not yet enjoy all the benefits of a rationalized fishery. I respectfully ask you as decision makers and managers to keep that in mind as you make choices on actions and priorities this week. We're counting on you not to forget about us, not to forget about the huge financial burden we face to participate in this fishery, and not to forget that many of the opportunities other sectors are looking to are available in great part because of the efforts and the expense of the trawl fleet. The trawl groundfish industry contributes greatly to fishing communities in all three states, and I and others stand ready to continue to work with all our partners in this process moving forward. Please don't forget about the trawl industry and the unique situation we are in. Thanks for your consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Vice Chairman, Council Members. Thank you, Heather. Uh, questions for Heather? Uh, Maggie, Maggie Summer? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> Thanks, Heather, for your testimony and for your really eloquent description of the capacity challenges that everyone involved in this process is facing. Um, I'll say it is indeed a, a, a challenge and, and very difficult to be in the position of making these decisions for the, the management participants, but we all recognize the impacts on industry uh, that you described as, as potential life or death decisions for family fishing businesses. Um, I actually want to ask you, uh, while you're up here for public 
testimony and available to us. I know this is not um, something you really specifically touched on in your comments, but uh, I wanted to ask about the request for an emergency rule for a processing platform to be both a mothership and catch a processor in the same year. Um, and you're a representative of a number of uh, catcher vessels that participate in the mothership sector. So if, if you don't mind, uh, can you talk about the need for an emergency rule from the catcher vessel perspective? Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, Ms. Summer, thanks for that question. Uh, if you read the emergency rule document, um, we are listed, Midwater Trawlers Cooperative, as uh, one of the um, signees to that proposal. Uh, MTC is supporting the request because American Seafoods has committed to starting the rover in the mothership sector, um, where it, it has started every year until last year. Um, and it will take the fish of two of my members who left their entire allocation in the water last year. So that was a little bit more than 30 million pounds. Without the emergency rule, they have told us they won't be a mothership. And so um, we've agreed to support the emergency rule. I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, uh, further questions? Okay, um, seeing none, um, that will conclude a public comment. And we've been going at this for a while, um, almost two hours here now. And so let's, uh, let's get back here at 10.10 uh, 10 and we'll conclude this. Uh, with the council discussion.
Okay, this is uh, the um, 60 second warning or one minute warning before we start up again. Okay, we're back. And uh, the council uh, discussion um, on uh, B1. Um, with that, do we, uh, do we council members want to weigh in? Nobody? I know, oh, Corey Niles, Corey? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, yeah, sorry, having problems with my uh, mute and raise hand buttons this morning. Um, I do hope we could have a bit of discussion on the testimony we heard here about the emergency rule. Um, we've had some virtual hallway talk um, about some ideas, and so I wanted to get um, Chuck's reaction and, uh, and, and Ryan's, assuming Ryan's here with us in the NIMP seat on ways we can talk about the uh, the, the trade-offs workload being the one that we're seeing as, as potentially of interest. Otherwise, this emergency rule seems to clearly meet the criteria. I'm wondering why, not remembering why, we didn't use the uh, public health um, provision the last time this was done, um, which, which allows a rule to uh, stay in place as long as the public a public health emergency the conditions still exist um so in a large part i'll, I'll stop there um yes that's saying if, if it was simple to do as it now stands it seems like we would want to do it again but a process question for for chuck and ryan i know we used the model last september where we talked about um, the issue during our ground fish workload planning that that seems like a good place to to do that again but expressing interest and in having that discussion and, and ideas on how that might go forward okay thank you Corey and um, I think you see Ryan's hand is up so uh, Ryan yeah thanks uh, Corey for the question so on your uh, latter point regarding the public health uh, aspect um, for in Magnuson for emergency rules, uh, that wouldn't be applicable here for um, for this since the emergency rule, uh, what, it, well, we could have used that if the emergency rule was still in effect, um, the emergency rule expired, the previous one from last year expired in December. Um, so uh, there's no opportunity to use that, although, um, you know, we are very aware of that clause now um, for emergency rules and, and paying attention to it uh, across the country. Uh, we utilize it for observer waivers, for example. <clears throat> Getting to this request, just on process, um, I would agree with, I think what you said, Corey, I, this is definitely, uh, if the council wants to take this up, it would be more relevant to have a discussion on this under G2, along with all of the other priorities <clears throat> there an emergency rule uh, would take precedence um, well, by, its, by its own nature. So therefore, it would have implication for workload as well as potential delays on, on non-emergency rules. And then I think I hear, heard you say that you thought it, that it meets the emergency criteria. And I think, I think a discussion does need to happen around that a little bit more deeply. Um, there, uh, the in particular, you know, how this situation is different from last year uh, and any additional justifications. And I think we could uh, have that discussion in G2 if that's where the council wants to take it. And I'll stop there. 
Yeah, thank you, Ryan, for some uh, clarity on that. Um, I think as some of the discussions we had earlier today was uh, that we would um, that the G two would be where we'd uh, take that out back. So, anyone else? Uh, this is Chuck. I'll just uh, pretty much echo Ryan's uh, response there. I, th I think uh, having an opportunity to uh, to look at the um, you know the prioritization exercise under G two. Uh, putting this in with that, I think, is a, would be appropriate. Uh, I think uh, would also give folks some time to think a little bit about the last point about emergency rule justification and and uh, laying that out. Um, so uh, I, I, I guess that's uh, that would be my recommendation as well. Okay, um, Ryan, your hands up. Sorry about that. No problem. <clears throat> okay. Uh, further discussion, uh, Maggie. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, certainly agree with discussing it in the context of ground fish workload prioritization and um, hope that the National Marine Fishery Service can provide us with uh, some thinking at that time on, on the uh, amount of workload and effort involved and um, any details on potential delays to other items. Um, and I know we will, as a council, also want to be thinking about uh, potential impacts on the GMT and, and council staff. Effort. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else? All right, uh, Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I, I would ask too that you know I, I appreciate the comments before me here and, and Ryan I appreciate your response. I would um, just ask that you you know comment at the time when when it's appropriate on the ability to use the the data that was or the analysis that was done in the previous EM last year and how that might uh, you know truncate the process and maybe actually enable us to get it done in a, uh, without without so much workload. So just curious of that and might take some time and willing to hear, hear when we get to the agenda item that were, was mentioned before. Thank you, Bob. All right. Okay. Um, seeing no further hands, I guess we'll conclude uh, open uh, comment and move to uh, administrative matters. Um, C1, the report of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And with that, I'll look to, um, I'll look to uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Griffith, Carrie. Yes, good morning, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item C1, report of the Office of National Marine, Marine Sanctuaries. Um, the ONMS, uh, Office of National Marine Sanctuaries is presenting information to the council today on activities on the West Coast and the several national marine sanctuaries that uh, are along the U.S. West Coast EEZ. Uh, this is the annual agenda item where uh, they come to us and present information on what's coming down the pike with regards to sanctuary management plan reviews and condition reports and uh, uh, proposed sanctuaries and the inventory and that sort of thing. It's very helpful. This is the <clears throat> fifth year that our <clears throat> sanctuary colleagues have come and presented. So happy fifth anniversary. Um, this has always been very well received and I think it's a really good opportunity to maintain the, uh, the uh, avenues of communication. Um, Mr. Bill Duros is the director of the West Coast Regional Office and he'll be presenting the report in a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, and Dr. Elisa Voning uh, will be available to answer questions afterwards as necessary. Um, in your advanced briefing book materials, there is the written National Marine Sanctuaries Report 1, uh, agenda item C1A, electronic only. And then there's also one public comment uh, that was submitted that is um, available in the public comment um, uh, webpage. Um, so after this overview, we'll turn to uh, Bill Duros for the report and then go to reports and comments of management entities and advisory bodies. I'm not aware of any at this point. Uh, and then public comment and council discussion. So there's my overview, Mr. Vice Chair. All right, thank you, Kerry. Um, questions for Kerry from the council with, uh, before we start? 
and seeing none, uh, welcome uh, Bill and uh, Lisa. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Just doing a sound check. You can hear me okay? We're good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Kerry. Um, you covered a lot of ground. Uh, I, I certainly wish I was there in person. I bet we all wish we were there in person. You know, we're all going on a year in this shutdown mode, and uh, I sometimes worry that we're all getting a little too good at adapting to it. Um, but nonetheless, I'm glad we've been able to keep this um, presentation. You've wanted to hear it. Um, it's been important to us to just provide you information with where we're at. So you, as Carrie noted, we've had about a 10 or 11 page report this year. It's a little lighter than past years, um, written report. I've got a PowerPoint slide that'll go over, you know, most of those issues, but in, in lesser detail, but some of the highlights that I want to cover. So if you can go to the next slide, um, you know, as noted, there's information in, in here about the nomination process. I think there'll probably be some discussion on that. Um, the various levels and stages of management plan review processes. We've done a lot um, on habitat research, a lot of it really focused on deep sea coral. And you just heard from Jeff Shester um, about you know, this West Coast wide work. It's been really impressive overall. And then we'll touch a little bit on wind farms um, at the end. If you go to the next slide, just you know, as a matter of orientation for the old timers on the council, uh, this is old news, but I just wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page about what are National Marine Sanctuaries. There's a, a separate act, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, which um, allows the Secretary of Commerce to designate areas and then to manage those areas once they're designated. Um, the principal goals are raising public awareness, um, understanding education, and improving management. Um, you know, coastal economies and helping to improve coastal economies and then promoting uh, public use of um, activities that are compatible with the goal of resource protection. <clears throat> so these are the place-based initiative. They are marine protected areas. Um, and for those that have been around a long time on the West Coast, they're different than other marine protected areas. For instance, they're not marine reserves, although there can be marine reserves designated by the state or other parts of the federal government ourselves inside them, ourselves meaning NOAA, you know, the council's got some bottom trawl areas that are inside marine sanctuaries, but broadly it's about ecosystem-based conservation, protection, and management, and, and given the open access of oceans, involving the public in that overall process. Next slide. Um, this map shows where the marine sanctuaries are um, today, the blue dots are existing marine sanctuaries or marine national monuments. Some of the six or seven marine national monuments um, are managed by the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Within National Ocean Service, some are managed by National Marine Fisheries Service. Papana, Makua Cay, and Rose Atoll down in American Samoa are the two monuments. Um, and then there's five marine sanctuaries on the West Coast that uh, overlap with the PFMC's responsibility. And then you can see um, in the Great Lakes there are two areas that are going through a designation process, and I'll touch on that um, in a moment. Next slide. So uh, these areas that are, are um, have been nominated the, uh, about six, six, seven years ago, at the time as President Obama restarted the sanctuary, the process to nominate areas for new marine sanctuaries. It hadn't been open for 20, 25 years. It's very community-based. Um, it's a pretty extensive process that you know, allows for and requires communities to put together proposals for areas that they think are important and significant. There's some pretty strenuous criteria that NOAA adopted through a public rulemaking process. Um, and that we use in reviewing those nominations. Um, and you can see on this, there are five uh, sites that are in the inventory presently that have not been designated. There's um, two that are going through the process. Now, one has been designated, but I think what's also important to note is that there are nominations that came in that um, we initially found them either incomplete or not meeting the criteria others that met the criteria but were withdrawn. So it's it's not like anyone's idea instantly gets on the inventory list. We take that review incredibly seriously. 
um, in reviewing them against the criteria. And thus the ones that get on the inventory are suitable sites that could possibly one day be designated. You'll see in purple, there are two. Um, and I talked a bit more last year about it. Um, SoCal, Southern California Offshore Banks, um, which is, is uh, in uh, San Diego predominantly and Orange County, uh, mostly Tanner Cortez, but a few other banks around there. We actually declined to put that in the inventory, um, but Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary in Central California is in the inventory. And I'm gonna talk about the five-year review process that we went through on that. So this is what this inventory of sites looks like today. Uh, next slide. So the, the five-year review process, this is the first one that the that NOAA has done on any sites that are in the inventory. When the overall uh, process was reconstituted um, six, seven years ago, it included a provision that after five years, we'd review nominations and determine whether or not they should remain <clears throat> in the inventory. The first one that came up for this, and then mind you, this is for a site that's not yet started the designation process. Um, and so Chumash Heritage was the first one that triggered that because we'd accepted it into the inventory in October, 2015. So by October, 2020, we needed to complete a review of that. We had a pretty extensive public process, um, some virtual workshops in May, um, a comment um, process for the public, um, a mechanism to get advice from the original proponents on whether or not they wanted to maintain it. Um, and through that process, we got about 14,000 comments and folks signing on to petitions. Uh, most of it was in support, but some was in opposition to it remaining in the inventory. And that was an important aspect of this review is that we were, um, and do with these five-year reviews, uh, assess whether or not the site continues to meet the criteria. We obviously, obviously made a decision that it does meet the criteria when it was put in the inventory originally. So our goal was to evaluate what's new, what's different, what's changed um, regarding the original proposal, if factors on the ground have changed or if other issues that may have been a concern have been ameliorated in some way. Uh, so it's, it's that pretty straightforward focus. Um, we aren't at that through that process making a decision, should we designate it or not? It sh should it remain in the inventory? And after this extensive review, and, and as you know, uh, Dr. Lisa Wonick, who's one of your members of the Habitat Committee, was the lead for this. Um, we produced a report, and the National Marine Sanctuary Program Director um, de determined that this should remain in the inventory for five more years. We don't have any active plans at the moment to designate it, but it's one of the now five candidate sites that could be designated because it remains in the inventory. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> I want to pivot now and talk about uh, the condition report process. Um, again, those that have been around a while have heard this term before, but it's um, an assessment that we do um, within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries with an awful lot of help with science partners and other stakeholders and users to assess the conditions of a marine sanctuary in advance of um, carrying out a review of the management plan. So they precede the management plan review process. It's about every 10 years, you know, we'd like to do it every five years, but you know, that it's really almost too soon of an interval. Uh, but that process in includes an update of the past condition report. We've been using the NOAA IEA indicators. National Marine Fisheries Service um, is an active participant in all of these condition report processes. Um, and we get a lot of input from partners um, to develop uh, an assessment of the conditions, you know, from good ranging from good to to poor, um, and and there's a lot of detailed information that goes into it on six or seven, seven or eight different criteria, both habitat considerations, um, but also sort of physical considerations too. And because we manage uh, shipwrecks and submerged cultural resources, that's an element of our assessment as well. So the Olympic Coast process is underway right now. That should be concluding by the end of this year. Uh, Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, we started last year. And there's probably one more year to go on that. Um, and then Greater Fairlawns, um, we started that process earlier this year, and that'll take about two years, as, as they all do. We, um, you'll see in a minute, we've, we've done the man, we've uh, initiated the management plan review reviews for Monterey Bay and 
uh, Channel Islands, those condition report processes were completed prior to those. So I want to flag these because I think they're a really good um, mechanism for us to be collaborating um, with fishery service scientists. We're using indicators that we've been developing together um, with, with National Marine Fisheries. They're, they're NOAA-wide um, indicators, uh, and these are for the California current. There's separate processes going on in New England and in the Gulf of Mexico where we're collaborating again there, but using different indicators that are specific to these large marine ecosystems that we're all responsible. So if you go to the next slide, um, this uh, gets to the other um, two sites. Um, and so once we do a condition report, we then initiate a you know, extensive multi-year public process to revise the management plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. In many past years, we've been bringing the results of those reviews at the draft phase to the council, and we've kept council staff apprised along the way. Monterey Bay's is very close to being finished. Um, we anticipate later this year having the final documents released, but um, there's some new action plans there dealing with climate change and marine debris and dealing with issues like coastal erosion management. Um, but there's very few regulatory modifications that we're making, none of which affect fishing or fisheries, but they, in this case, get at reusing dredge material for the be beneficial uses for habitat restoration that may come from harbors and also making some adjustments to motorized personal watercraft, um, two different zonal choices there. But that's it. Um, in the past, we have done more extensive modifications with past management plan reviews, um, boundary modifications. None of that's in the Monterey Bay uh, management plan. And, and I believe you all saw, and, and I, I know various NIMS offices gave us feedback on the proposed rules, proposed rule there. <clears throat> For Channel Island Sanctuary, they've initiated that process about a year ago. They had a couple new um, action plans that they're working on there. But right now we don't anticipate any um, regulatory modifications and certainly none that directly or indirectly impact fisheries. I do think there's some really tiny cleanups like what's the address for the sanctuary office and things like that, but um, it really is um, and will likely be a de minimis um, review. Now that would be the proposed rule, so that's not been released yet. Of course, if we do change, if there's anything in there that could affect uh, or be of interest to the PFMC, we will bring that to you, but that, I would expect that more like the fall of this year. We're always ambitious. Maybe it's more like the winter um, to get those released, but we're, we're making great progress on that management plan. Um, the next slide I think shows a schedule for you, just so you can see um, where these are at. You know, just sort of a simplistic uh, schedule. The Monterey Bay Condition Report, as I said, was completed in 2016, and that review for the management plan should wrap up this year. Uh, Channel Islands wrapping up probably at the end of 22. The Olympic Coast condition report is going to lead to a management plan review process starting at the very end of this year, we anticipate. Um, Cordell Bank a year later, Channel Islands a year after that. So this can give you a, a schedule of where we're at. It's, you know, it's there's not a precise date, you know, by the 15th of the month, you will see <clears throat> because public processes uh, <clears throat> take time. And we do spend a lot of time with our advisory councils going over potential issues and uh, sometimes with public working groups on and stakeholders if we've got a particularly thorny problem where we need a lot of input. So that, that can add time. Um, sometimes it can subtract time. So that's the uh, overall status where we're at with these management plan reviews and, and uh, what you might want to anticipate, if anything, that's going to intersect with PFMC activities. Next slide. So um, as noted, and, and there's a lot more information in the report, um, this last three, four years, three years, has been very active in terms of deep sea habitat research. Um, you know, in, in some ways, the whole essential fish habitat process in Amendment 28 goes hand in hand with this. Uh, your council and your advisory panel spent a lot of time on th those issues, you know, really over the last 10 years. Um, but it's been also met with new science and new data from the West Coast Deep Sea Coral Initiative, which for uh, two years leading up to 2020 had done a lot of field work 
This last year, some of that got curtailed due to COVID, but a separate initiative with the Ocean Exploration Trust using the Nautilus vessel um, led to some great exploration projects and some renewed uh, revisiting some sampling sites from past West Coast deep sea coral projects in the past. And uh, there are a couple sites in Olympic Coast, in uh, I believe Quinault and Grays Canyon, and then Pioneer Canyon in Monterey Bay Sanctuary and Davidson Seamount. And then we did some additional work um, in the area proposed for Chumash Heritage on the Santa Lucia Bank and at the Channel Islands. And, and all of these sites were, you know, I can safely say we're in partnership with NIMS. We got a lot of input on where to go, what to look for, you know, anything you need us to look out for, we'll go look out for it. Um, and, you know, even revisiting past sites at NIMS. Um, scientists had been to. And and it is, as I think someone asked the question to Shester about how well we're all collaborating, I think it's pretty darn good. I think it could be better in terms of what we're then going to do about this. But, um, you know, most of our work is focused inside the sanctuaries with a little bit outside of it. But West Coast wide, I think we should all be proud of the exploration work, the repeated survey and science work we've done on deep sea coral and sponge habitats seafloor mapping that's gone on. Um, and then really importantly has been this outreach opportunity to the public. It's certainly been a focus of ours and the EV Nautilus allows for that. And, um, you know, this last year we had lots of folks doing their work from their home offices. There's a lot of incredible creativity amongst the science teams. That's part of the vision with the Nautilus is you can't get all the people you might want on the boat, including the science partners, but by technology, they can all be part of the mission. And there's ample examples from all of these sites that we've been to this year and in past years where, you know, at the last minute, you know, for instance, last year, I think I mentioned you a whale fall, uh, Monterey Bay Sanctuary totally retooled the mission mid flight because they found a whale fall and got all kinds of advice from scientists who began, began beaming in, asking, you know, hey, what's this species? Can you take a sample here and there? And it's a really interesting, really interesting model. And the outreach opportunities are very important, I think, for all of what the council wants to do, what fishermen want to do, what our scientists in NIMS and um, NOAA and National Marine Sanctuaries want to do. Um, and I, I think it's something we should be proud of. Next slide. Um, the main interagency coordination opportunity I wanted to flag, and I know you're getting information, I think on Friday now, is regarding offshore wind, um, which is uh, one of the uh, bigger challenges that um, we're all dealing with. I, I think in some ways, from my opinion, from my agency's opinion, marine sanctuaries, it's an important thing for us all to be tackling. Um, it's It's not just scientists or you know, environmentalists, you know, air quotes, who are concerned about climate change. I know a lot of fishermen that are worried about it and how the ecosystem might change. And, you know, this, this movement to consider action that may be necessary in order to find, all, you know, alternative energy sources, non-carbon-based energy sources, is something where our view is we all share a role in at least, you know, trying to give our best ideas, staying open to other people's best ideas, and that's been exemplified with this offshore wind group that Representative Salud Carbajal from Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, got going because, you know, after some initial work from Boehm and the state of California, there were conflicts with where fishermen really wanted, you know, them to avoid the development that Boehm was pursuing and, and that uh, the Department of Defense was concerned about. And there were certainly have been ideas about, well, put it in a marine sanctuary. Well, you can't put it in a marine sanctuary. Well, what about in the proposed Chumash sanctuary? So we've been at the table, um, along with some of these other core agencies, working on options and ideas that then go out for public review. Nothing gets decided. It's just, you know, you can't have 200 people putting circles on a map, but rather it was four or five agencies trying to really discern what's best. And um, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but it's been an area of focus that, that led to a lot of public comment um, over the summer, this last summer. And a lot of really good feedback came in from the shipping industry, the wind industry, fishermen, of course, um, members of the public. We brought it to the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Advisory Council. We got their feedback. And, and that's all this upper area 
you know, off Cambria, the southern uh, part of Monterey Bay, County of Monterey Bay, and the Sanctuary, and Morro Bay. But at the same time, and I think that's what you're going to hear about on Friday, at the same time, there's another project going on, um, two projects, in fact, that are proposed in state waters off Point Arguello, um, down in, in uh, the west end of Santa Barbara County. And those are very close to shore, whereas how close to shore has been a big issue for the um, the ones that, that BOEM is pursuing in federal waters. Um, these are very new proposals that are in state waters, two and a half, two and three quarter miles from shore. And, and you know, pretty decent size. They're demonstration projects, but they could lead to more. I don't think that's on the council's agenda, perhaps because it's in state waters. Um, you know, Marcy and others at CDF and W are, I'm sure, tracking it, but a separate agency is leading it. And I'm flagging it only because there are coordination um, needs and issues that exist on what are we all going to do about it. And my view and, and concern and, and certainly guidance to my own staff and suggestions to collaborators like yourselves is it's a problem that we all face. And what, you know, how do we find this uh, new source of wind offshore? Should there be any at all? And it's been in that spirit of compromise that we've been at the table to at least hear ideas. And I think we've all got to have that that perspective. Um, and how are we gonna solve this problem? Where are we gonna do it? How do we spatially provide uses? Um, yeah, and there's more detail and I'll, I'll certainly leave it to Friday and you can hear from Bohm on um, what they're trying to achieve in the state of California um, on the part in federal waters. I, I will just wanna flag one other thing that's going on in this area too, and that's abandonment of platforms. Um, that's coming and that's gonna be an issue to deal with um, for us, if we were to be moving forward with a Chumash Heritage designation or designating the sanctuary, that'll be um, an issue that we'll have to deal with, but the council will as well. And of course, it'll beg the question about artificial reefs and can't we just leave some behind? Let's just put a pile of the stuff on the seafloor and is that good or bad? And, you know, there, there's still a lot to come, especially in this area of San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara County stretching down into Ventura. So I think we'll have collaboration opportunities there. And I know at the staff level between my staff and, and NIMS staff in California in this particular stretch of coast, we coordinate all the time on these particular issues. Next slide. Now, yeah, so this is, I think is the last substantive slide. Um, just to, to flag these things, you know, some of this I've touched on are, are shared values and interests pertain to a healthy and resilient ecosystem and a productive California current. The IEA, the NOAA IEA indicators and tools help us get to that point. Um, collaboration on climate change science and communication on that, I think is an, is an area where we're doing well and could do a lot more. I've just touched on the industrial development activities. Um, I haven't mentioned anything really about response and recovery on endangered species and threatened habitats. Um, whether they're a PFMC issue or not, things like white abalone, <clears throat> black abalone, some education we're doing to help tell the story on, on salmonids and their dependence on both the ocean and our national forests on the West Coast um, is some cool work that maybe we'll talk about next year. Um, and then these other issues, including education and outreach to boaters, fishermen, and the public. We do a lot, you do a lot, and I think we can you know, always make improvements, but I continue to be impressed with where we're at and the sense of collaboration and the spirit that our values here and our interests uh, should drive the day and give us a chance to sort of work around what may be positions that could otherwise get us hung up. So I think that's the last slide I got that sort of captures what's in that written report. And I will pause there and take questions you have or if there's any public comment, if you want me to respond to the public comment, let me know. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Bill. That's a great overview. Um, questions for Bill? Ah, oh, Louis M. Louis? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And thank you very much, Bill, for coming. It's always very informative and uh, particularly interesting uh, in the topic of offshore offshore wind. Um, it's been asked before whether offshore wind could uh, take place in marine sanctuary. And uh, I think you answered very clearly. The answer is no. Uh, 
Um, so I thank you for that clarity. Um, what I wanted to ask you about is what uh, place at the table do the marine sanctuary have in marine planning? Uh, we've seen before that, you know, Department of Defense, uh, et cetera, et cetera, seem to have an equal place at the table, whereas uh, our council uh, has sort of an advisory position. What, what place do you view that you have in marine planning on this coast? Yeah, that, that's um, a, a wonderful question because it's sort of rich on several levels, but um, at, at its center is the reality that a, a national marine sanctuary, when you look at sort of the boundaries of that, what goes on through a management plan, the regulations, and for those that spend time at sanctuary advisory councils, you see that it is a marine spatial planning enterprise. Um, and within the sanctuary boundaries, there's, a, you know, we got to, if not a seat at the head of the table, we're at the head of the table with others. Now, for instance, we don't, with that seat at the head of the table in a sanctuary, control, you know, fishing activity. That's in federal waters or for federal fisheries. That's your role or the state's roles. But we may give you suggestions and advice. Um, DOD has certain exemptions for their training activities inside marine sanctuaries. It's not unlimited, however, and there's a considerable amount of consultation that takes place. Um, if someone wanted to build a fiber optic cable through a marine sanctuary, um, they'd have to go to the Army Corps of Engineers to get a permit from them, but they need a permit from the marine sanctuary too. So we, you know, there, there's a lot of folks, I guess, that sit at the head of the table. We're just at the head of the table for a lot of the issues. Um, Outside of a marine sanctuary, it sort of depends on how close it is and what impacts it may have to natural resources and users of those resources in a marine sanctuary. There's a provision of the National Marine Sanctuaries Act that requires any federal activity to that's outside of a sanctuary that could harm a sanctuary resource to go through a consultation process. It doesn't get used a lot, but there's a lot of informal consultation that helps to shape um, activities. Um, and then the third sort of species, if you will, are these proposed new sanctuaries where a lot of the rules and the provisions of what that sanctuary is going to be about have not been set. Um, but unless we have, we know I have more flexibility on what we would do, but there's some pretty standard things one would expect. And, you know, some of those have been laid out in, in the past. You know, I, I, let's assume we would ever designate Chumash Heritage. I would imagine there'd be a provision in there that would limit disturbance of the seabed, but exempting trawling, just like you see in Monterey Bay Sanctuary, Channel Island Sanctuary. So um, those new sanctuaries, though, there's a lot more flexibility, um, you know, for us to have a role there. And, and the last thing I'll say is that, that the bone process is interesting regarding offshore wind. And, and I just want to go back to something you said at the very beginning. Right now, we don't, BOEM can't issue a lease inside a marine sanctuary, but the legislation that created BOEM's authority says those host agencies have or don't have their own authority. So a national park may or may not have authority to deal with wind inside of a national park or a marine sanctuary. And we have no plans to develop that within a marine sanctuary. We have explored and are still thinking, well, what would limit it? What would, why would we want to do it? Um, and I will say this review process over the summer, we got very clear advice from many in the public and the Sanctuary Advisory Council and commercial fishermen saying, don't put a wind project inside Monterey Bay Sanctuary. And so that's important information for us to have and guidance for us to have. But I, I think ultimately not even DOD can deny BOEM's development outside of a marine sanctuary. Um, the council, I'm, I don't know, I, I don't want to advise on your role or authority with BOEM, um, but the, you know, ultimately, I can tell you, agencies like BOEM and like our own really don't want to go forward with a, with, um, a lot of dispute and disagreement among federal agencies or even with state agencies. I think the goal is, and certainly has been as part of this wind planning process, can we find a place where most everyone can you know, accept. It's not it's everyone's favorite, but folks can accept it. 
And I think your view and opinions on that are really important. We've been advising in these working group meetings that this is just the beginning, not the end, because there's lots of folks like fishermen, Fishery Management Council, Cal Fish and Wildlife, California Coastal Commission, et cetera, who have a really important stake in what gets decided. And, and I think that's all still to come, how that gets resolved is still to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Um, Marcy, your room go. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Lisa. It is really great to have you with us here today. Just want to um, echo Carrie's uh, thanks uh, in the overview. Um, thank you for prioritizing the council and getting us a report this year. I know how tough uh, this year has been on agencies to um, get all of just their core uh, obligations uh, completed. Um, so it's it's really, um, it's much appreciated. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for um, taking the time to pull together uh, the material that you've provided us uh, today, both in your written report and in your PowerPoint. Um, it's really useful for us to have kind of a succinct summary of where things are at with all of the management plans and all the condition reports for all of the sanctuaries. Um, and uh, notably the habitat research that you've uh, brought to light uh, for us uh, with the deep sea exploration work. Um, <laughs> I really look forward to checking out the octocone uh, that you've described <laughs> for us out at the <laughs> Davidson Seamount. I, I can't wait to see some video of that. Um, you provided a slide for us on offshore wind and your role, and we've had quite a bit of discussion here on that. And that's it's it's really helpful to hear um, how the sanctuaries fit uh, in the context of those discussions. And and as you've noted, things are going so so quickly, um, and that you're you know. Uh, staying on top of all of that and engaging, um, and that's that's really appreciated. Um, you also mentioned um, upcoming discussions about uh, abandoning platforms and artificial reefs that are also kind of um, brewing topics um, that you expect to be very much uh, engaged in. Um, so thanks for um, flagging those. Uh, one question I have for you um, pertains to the role that you see the sanctuaries having with regard to aquaculture development here on the West Coast, and particularly um, the aquaculture opportunity area siting process that's getting underway, and um, just generally speaking, the role of, of the sanctuary in aquaculture development. Um, you mentioned just a minute ago in the discussion about offshore wind, um, you know, that activities don't necessarily need to occur directly in a, a sanctuary boundary to have an effect on sanctuary resources. So maybe you can just give us a little bit of an overview of where you see the sanctuaries uh, in the developing um, aquaculture uh, processes that are, are quickly getting underway. Yes, happy to, Marcy. Thank you. So, um, the aquaculture development zone, that's not quite the right term, I realize, aquaculture opportunity area, um, focusing on Southern California. Chris Mobley, who's a superintendent for Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary, is our lead and is participating in that multi-agency work group. We um, have in each of the sanctuaries are slightly different, not precisely identical, slightly different in terms of the regulatory authority they have over aquaculture activities. And um, some of that stems back to the time when these areas were designated. But if we just sort of focus on Channel Islands now, um, part of our participation in that is to be aware of and, and advising the groups about what the Channel Islands regulations say. Within Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, we don't have an overall policy on these are good, these are bad, and you know, anything like that. It's sort of site-by-site -site regulations. And in the case of Channel Islands, it's, it's possible to have an aquaculture project within the boundaries of the sanctuary. Our concerns, and, and we've um, had you know, many years of working on this with, with Cal Fish and Wildlife and Department of Fish and Wildlife in the state, 
um, have, has been over introduced species. And our, our very, very strong preference um, is that if there is an aquaculture project in, let's say, Channel Island Sanctuary, it'd be native species and would rely on you know, food that comes from within that system, that we're not introducing a new species um, and that we're not introducing a new food type for them. Um, and so that would be, you know, sort of on its face through the regulations, our priority. But if, if projects were to, to develop one way or another, we probably would get advice from our Sanctuary Advisory Council there, the Channel Islands Sanctuary Advisory Council, and a research activities panel, um, but also rely on, you know, our partners at the state and with the National Marine Fisheries Service and academia on well, what's the right sort of science-based decision to make on this? So because it's not a blanket yes or a blanket no or a blanket exemption and there's a, a permit pathway that would be involved, you know, I think those would be the parameters that we have in mind right now um, as we look at these projects as they unfold. Now, as it expands further, and I just keep it on the West Coast, there's a, a stricter no introduced species um, rule in Monterey Bay and Greater Farallons, though there's a review process with the state that we've set up over the years. Um, and, you know, we would work with you on that. But it's largely the same. There's some subtleties about, you know, what's allowed versus allowable. Um, and, and I think that's where, you know, the nuances would matter. But my view is, unless it's changed, that we're talking, you know, beyond Southern California, we're talking maybe five years from now. It's not something that's as imminent as the potential to develop in Southern California. Okay, uh, further questions uh, for Bill? Oh, Louie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Bill, you just pinged on me there, a question that I asked the uh, uh, proponents of one of the farms proposed off Ventura. Um, they're talking about Mediterranean mussels, which are extent in Southern California, but not native. And of course, if I asked that question, why would you want to introduce? And the answer was, well, it's here. Uh, <laughs> do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> um, because it tastes better, right? Uh, no, so I, I don't know really much about that. If it's, you know, in Ventura, probably our worry might be, is it in, you know, maybe off Anacapa Island? And I haven't heard about that, but I'll look into it. Um, because I. I just don't know enough about it to have much of an opinion. I do, as I said, I do feel that our, our regulations would make it pretty darn difficult to permit a new introduction. If it's already there, we still try to limit further introductions of something that's already there. But I'll, I'll look into that further and I'll check with the Channel Islands gang and, and I can get back to you or through the council staff, just give you any input that we have so far. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, thank you, Louie. Uh, anyone else? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Bill, for the uh, great presentation. Yeah, thank you. You bet. And I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing no um, public comment cards. <clears throat> so that would, <clears throat> excuse me, that would conclude that portion. Uh, any council discussion? By chance? Okay. Okay. With that, that'll take us to Habitat, but it is 11.58 at my time. That's probably close enough to, uh, I think, uh, call a break and uh, be back here at 1 o'clock to start off with uh, Habitat. At 1 o'clock.
Okay, we're at uh, one minute out from starting. So this is your one minute, uh, one minute warning. Okay, welcome uh, everyone. Um, welcome back. It, um, it's one o'clock, so uh, we'll start off with uh, D1 Habitat, and I believe uh, Jennifer is uh, going to lead us uh, lead us off. Jennifer. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the council. Looking at agenda item D1, the Habitat Committee met on Tuesday of this week to discuss salmon rebuilding plans. Ecosystem matters, uh, essential fish habitat for highly migratory species, and other issues. Um, and uh, as directed by the council, the Habitat Committee developed, and the council sent a quick response letter to the Department of Commerce on aquaculture opportunity areas. And it is available on our council correspondence page at the link on the situation summary. So. Um, we have Mr. Lance Hebden here to read the report of the Habitat Committee, and there is also a, an SAS supplemental report. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, okay, with that, um, Lance? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just check in my audio. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, again, this is Lance Hebden, Chairman of the Habitat Committee, and I'll be reading agenda item D1A, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report. Salmon Rebuilding Plans Update. The Habitat Committee member, Corey Green, discussed efforts by the Habitat Committee, Salmon Technical Team, and others, including the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Scientists, to develop more comprehensive stoplight tables for the Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook. Both stocks were the focus of rebuilding plans following recent determinations of overfishing, which prompted recommendations that habitat indicators be linked spatial, spatio-temporally to life history stages of key salmon stocks. In response to the recommendations, the HC and the National Marine Fisheries Service Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team produced stoplight tables of habitat indicators for these stocks, which were published in Appendix H4 of the California Current Ecosystem Status Report. These tables will help inform whether particular indicators were poor in the critical years associated with the rebuilding plans, whether multiple indicators were associated with poor stock performance, and whether conditions persistent in the years after the critical brood years of the rebuilding plan. With this, the Habitat Committee views its role in addressing habitat changes relevant to rebuilding plans as completed. Nevertheless, review by, review by individuals from various advisory bodies pointed to additional interest in the stoplight tables. These could include further development to use as indicators to inform council engagement. There was also interest in evaluating whether the indicators could inform forecasting. Before the indicators were because the indicators were not developed as forecasting tools per se, further work, i.e. correlation structure, evaluation of redundant indicators, predictive power of indicators relative to adult returns, as expected by previous studies, and additional indicators would be necessary. Regardless of any potential value for forecasting, the indicator tables could be useful as additional indicators in the larger suite of ecosystem indicators reported each year in the CCIEA report. The next update is on the Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas export terminal and gas pipeline project. 
The proposed Jordan Cove liquid natural gas export terminal project in Coos Bay, Oregon, and the associated 229 mile Pacific connector gas pipeline project, which connected the LNG terminal to pipelines in the Rocky Mountains and Western Canada, has again stalled after a series of key state and federal regulatory decisions. In April or in February 2020, Oregon issued an objection to the project's coastal zone management consistency certification, citing inadequate information and adverse effects to species, habitats, fisheries, and other resources. The project applicant appealed, requesting that National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Administrator override the objection. On February 8, 2021, NOAA completed its review of the appeal and sustained Oregon's objection. In its decision, NOAA found there were insufficient information to evaluate the project's adverse effects on coastal species listed under the Endangered Species Act, critical habitat, essential fish habitat, water quality, cultural resources, and cumulative effects, and thus NOAA could not balance the effects against any national interest furthered by the project. NOAA's decision was informed in part by the Council's comments on the, prod on the effects of the pipeline construction on salmon habitat and the cumulative effects of project dredging activities and the Port of Coos Bay's channel, channel modification project on eelgrass EFH for salmon, ground fish, and coastal pelagic uh, FMP species in the Coos Bay estuary. This is the second federal action to uphold the state's finding and deny authorization to the project. In January 2021, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission denied the project's petition, calling for FERC to override the ODEQ denial for water quality certification under 401A1 of the Clean Water Act. At this time, it is unknown if the Jordan Cove project will reapply for state and federal authorization. Um, next, we'll be talking about the Klamath Dam Removal Project. After years of planning and delays, the removal of the four lower Klamath dams is now imminent. With the removal of physical structures scheduled to start in January of 2023, it is likely that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission will order a National Environmental Policy Act process to begin in mid-spring of 2021. Dam removal will likely res result in important changes in the stock, which has constrained fishing south of Cape Falcon for years. Removal of the four Kalamath hydropower dams will open about 420 miles of habitat and will have dramatic long-term positive impacts on all Kalamath Falls Chinook-based fisheries, particularly in the Kalamath Management Zone. The Habitat Committee is aware that the Kalamath te Technical Working Groups have identified a number of challenges to collecting data on spawning and returning fish as dam removal begins and salmon repopulate the upper reaches of the system and has raised concerns related to funding these needed efforts. The HC understands these challenges could have major implications on Kalamath River Falls Chinook stock assessments. The window of opportunity for developing new fish sampling protocols and collecting pre-removal baseline habitat data may be closing soon. The HC believes it would be constructive to invite members from the Kalamath Technical Working Group and other relevant parties to provide a brief briefing to a joint work session of the Salmon Technical Team and Habitat Committee in order to help council advisory bodies support successful salmon reintroduction and minimize impacts to the Kalamath River Fall Chinook stock assessment. Issues that could be addressed in a joint work session include fish data collection needs to evaluate progress and success of salmon reintroduction, information needed from newly opened habitat to inform and update stock assessments, address how Klamath driven, especially KMZ salmon fisheries may be managed immediately after Klamath dam removal to support repopulation of the habitat in order to maximize long-term benefits to council managed fisheries and discussion of how the council can support the process of securing funding for priority salmon management and reintroduction actions. Moving on to essential fish habitat related guidance documents. National Marine Fisheries Service is developing two documents that will update and consolidate existing guidance on EFH consultations and integrating EFH with Endangered Species Act consultations. Although a final release date has not been identified, these documents are undergoing the final stages of internal review and should be 
available soon. The Pacific Council, along with other fishery management councils, will receive notification once the documents are completed, if not slightly before. Moving on to ocean energy. Uh, proposed wind projects off of California. Two floating wind energy projects have been proposed off California. Sierco Flat, Sierco Project's floating wind demonstration and IDL USA's Vandenberg Air Force Base pilot. The two adjacent projects would be located in state waters offshore of Vandenberg Air Force Base and Point Arguello in Santa Barbara County, California. Both facilities will have four floating wind turbines ranging in size from 10 to 15 megawatts. The entire development will be capable of producing up to 100 megawatts of renewable electricity. The California State Lands Commission is a lead permitting and lease agency for offshore wind projects in California state waters. The State Land Commission found that the two project applications for the projects noted above are complete and the State Land Committee Commission is currently evaluating the two applications according to the California Environmental Quality Act and conducting stakeholder engagement activities. NIMPS, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife are tracking the planning and environmental analyses of these projects. Moving on to the second energy project, the first wave energy lease in US federal waters. In 2021, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management issued a lease for the first wave energy project in federal waters. The lease was issued to Oregon State University for the PacWave South project for testing wave energy equipment and marine hydrokinetic energy. PacWave South will be located approximately six nautical miles off Newport, Oregon, and will occupy approximately 2.65 square miles. The project will consist of four test berths to support testing of up to 20 wave energy converter devices, which are floating or underwater devices moored to the seafloor that convert the kinetic energy from moving ocean waves into electrical or mechanical energy. The BOEM lease is a prerequisite for a FERC license for project construction and operations. The PacWave research lease is the first marine hydrokinetic lease to be issued under the joint bohm FERC authority over marine hydrokinetic projects on the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf. And although not part of our report at the moment because it came in late, we were did just find out that FERC had issued the license for this project. Moving on to marine mineral leasing reforms in California and Washington state waters. Washington and California are both considering changes to current policies and regulations regarding seabed mining for certain minerals on state-owned submerged lands off the coast. In both states, the focus is on hard minerals such as metals, metal-rich sands, and phosphorite nodules. Both states currently allow for the issu issuance of mineral leases, and applications would be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Currently, there are no known mining activities or lease applications for hard minerals in either state, so the changes under consideration are precautionary in nature. In Washington, a bill in the state legislature would prohibit the Department of Natural Resource from issuing leases for hard mineral extraction. In California, the State Lands Commission recently approved a five-year strategic plan that includes a multi-stakeholder, multi-rights holder, and multi-agency dialogue that the commission would convene to broadly examine extractive uses of state-owned lands in the context of an evolving application of the public trust doctrine. The dialogue will include, but not be limited to, a review of commission policies on marine mining, and finally, as context, the state of Oregon prohibited exploration for or extraction of hard minerals in 1991. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, as a recap, the Habitat Committee had one request for consideration of council action, and that involved setting up a joint work session between the Habitat Committee and the Salmon Technical Team for briefing on the uh, Kalamath uh, dam removal and reintroduction. And with that, that concludes my report. Yeah, thank you, Lance. Um, a question for Lance, I see uh, Frank Lockhart. Uh, Frank? Frank, I think you're muted. There we go. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I have two clarification questions. The first is on the first section with regards to um, salmon rebuilding plans. You talk about the, in the last paragraph there, talk about the various advisory bodies pointing to additional interest. And then you talk about more work may be required. And I um, am wondering, um, does this mean more work just to see how they might be useful? Or is it kind of more work to develop more stoplight tables? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Lockhart, the uh, I think a little bit of both. So the the development of the stoplight chart was an attempt to evaluate the indicators that had fairly long time series that we could link with conditions that would be favorable or disfavorable for both marine and freshwater environments. Um, while we're fairly confident that the range of indicators is, is solid, what we did not have the time to pursue was whether or not some of those uh, indicators may have been redundant and um, highly correlative or how useful they may have been in a predictive capacity. And so the uh, follow-up work could take multiple um, <clears throat> angles, including just continuing to refine our understanding of the current indices that were put forward for those two stocks, and perhaps testing if there are if there are other indicators out there that we were not able to gather in the time allotted. Um, potentially looking at some of those as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may ask one other clarification question. Please. Okay. On the um, Klamath Dam removal project uh, section, um, we talk about forming a technical team uh, to talk about various things. But when I look at the issues, I guess uh, it seems like the first two are clearly technical, but the last two um, maybe go into the realm of policy. So I guess maybe my clarification question, is this meant to be a technical working team or is it is it or do you intending to have policy folks on this working team as well? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Member Lockhart. Um, the Habitat Committee brought this issue forward purely to raise the fact that this issue is coming at us rapidly. It's going to occur in the next two years and that there are sort of multiple tendrils into council management. Uh, it, would purely be the purview of the council on whether or not there were council member participation. I think on something this um, potentially this far reaching, that would certainly be a um, good idea. Frank? Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, further questions of Lance? Um, Marcy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Lance. Um, want a little bit of follow up on Frank's first question on the stoplight work. Um, I think I read the Habitat Committee's report to suggest that you've completed the task with regard to rebuilding plans, the task that was assigned uh, to the HC. Um, but I guess I'm just curious if maybe you can elaborate if if you're aware that um, individual uh, NIMF scientists or other folks that um, were uh, pivotal in creating um, the information to inform the stoplight table, if they are uh, maybe in progress and working on some scientific publications or um, other reports that they might um, be undertaking to carry the work forward, just maybe not associated with the rebuilding plans. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, member, your, your MCO. Um, so yes, we do feel that the Habitat Committee has at least completed the assignment under the rebuilding plans. Part of getting the stoplight chart into the uh, California, into the ecosystem assessment report was to make them a little more of a formal 
part of the process and at least ensure that they would be um, or make the recommendation that they would be updated on an annual basis. There may be some additional review of those, but I'm not aware beyond updating how much additional work is currently planned. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, any other questions for Lance? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Lance. Uh, next up is the um, SAS, and uh, I believe uh, Richard Eep is. Uh... Richard? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, I will be reading from agenda item D1B, Supplemental SAS Report 1, Salmon Advisory Subpanel Report on Habitat Issues. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel is encouraged to see that the Klamath dams are on a trajectory for removal in 2023 a goal the Pacific Fisheries Management Council has supported in the past. We concur with the Habitat Committee regarding the importance of having robust stock assessments in place following the removal of the dams, not only to assess the success of reintroduction efforts, but also so that we can appropriately manage for these stocks in the future. Therefore, we concur with the Habitat Committee's recommendation that an invitation be extended to the Klamath Technical Team and Klamath Basin co-managers to provide a briefing to the salmon technical team regarding plans for stock assessments or stock assessment activities following dam removal. That concludes my report. Okay, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, questions uh, for the SAS? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Rich. Okay, um, next up is public comment. And I do not see anything on my screen. Um, so that takes us to uh, considering the Habitat Committee report and uh, any recommendations from the council. So uh, council discussion. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, appreciate the work of the Habitat Committee this week. They had. Um, a long couple of days and I know we're working on reports uh, for quite a while as well so I um, want to thank them for um, putting some thought into a number of issues that are very much uh, important to the council family. Um, definitely support um, the work and the discussion on the stoplights um, and thank their work um, as it uh, contributes to the salmon rebuilding plans and um, into the future with the um, California current ecosystem status report. Um, look forward hopefully to seeing some other products um, or other reports uh, maybe coming out in the future uh, with this content in more detail and, and maybe some um, conclusions from, from the work um, by salmon uh, and ecosystem scientists. Um, when we get into the content on Klamath Dam removal, um, I'll be honest, I got a call last night from one of CDFW's uh, inland fishery managers in the Klamath Basin, and um, we have some pretty significant reservations about um, jumping into this issue right here and now and um, digging into content that really is um, not well developed yet. Um, specifically, um, you know, we are still um, waiting for action on the part of FERC. Um, we're still um, waiting for the NEPA process and the biological opinion uh, to get underway, uh, the relevant parties that are interested in discussing um, key pieces of Klamath Dam removal as it pertains to salmon and habitat. Um, most of those agencies are already signatories to the Klamath Hydropower Settlement Agreement, and discussions are going on in that venue and keeping them in that venue. Uh, at this time is where CDFW would support 
they be. Um, having a joint work session and inviting folks from that um, realm of work uh, in support of the uh, agreement seems somewhat um, redundant and also premature um, with regards specifically to um, developing monitoring programs uh, for reintroduction. Um, CDFW is going to be working on developing um, monitoring plans and we have staff that are actively doing that right now. Um, but it's it's really, I think, too early to get into detailed discussions about the elements of those plans. And also, I think, you know, we're, we're feeling a little bit like this is an overreach on the part of the council um, to have um, really deep scrutiny into an inland monitoring program. Um, you know, this is really the, the state's you know, in, in river territory. And, um, you know, while I can appreciate that there's interest in the topic, um, you know, the council doesn't tread deeply into the activities of the states in their development and implementation of their monitoring plans. It's really, um, you know, those are activities that we develop in conjunction with um, you know, our agency's priorities and um, co-manager priorities and, and, of course, are always um, driven by availability of funding and uh, the needs of the funders. So it's a, it's a complex process, and all I can really convey at this time is, you know, our, our inland staff are um, underway with some work on this, but um, we're really not um, in a position to come to a table and discuss um, a lot of the elements of what um, are yet to come because they're still being developed. So um, I think, you know, we also have, um, you know, our freshwater fisheries uh, and the monitoring we do um, requires permitting, you know, for that activity on its own. And, you know, that permitting process has to be a priority for us and adhering to the terms and conditions of those permits. So, you know, I think we're just feeling like um, beginning these discussions and kicking off a, a, a new um, activity for the STT and the SAS and the SSC uh, at this stage is, is really uh, not quite right. Quite right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marcy. Um, further questions? Okay, Marcy, your hand's still up. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, with that, um, that concludes the, uh, the reports, and I can go to um, to public comments, and I see none. So uh, actually, I guess we're already there. Um, anybody else? Marcy, your hand's still up. No, it's up new this time. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I don't know if you are um, considering motions on this report um, or if we just, um, you know, consider the report and and don't act on it. But I guess I'm I'm just asking that you know somewhere in the meetings at minutes that it be reflected that CDFW is not supportive of the recommendation in the Klamath Dam removal section. Well, I think we're talking about recommendations, so I don't see a motion on the uh, uh, just for um, uh, so I think we're probably good there. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Jennifer, you want to weigh in and tell me uh, if we're good here? Yes, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, um, if there are no recommendations, um, yes, I believe this uh, agenda item is complete. Okay, with that, we'll go into um, the next agenda item, which is um, E1, uh, salmon management. And I'll look to Robin to uh, kick us off.
And Robin, if you're uh, speaking, um, we can't hear you. Thank you. Just getting my uh, audio lined up and uh, sending a message to the STT to let them know that salmon is on the floor. So thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with uh, E1, if that's appropriate for you. Please. Thank you. So this is agenda item E1, the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. NEMS, uh, Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Centers in the West Coast region will briefly report on recent developments relevant to the salmon fisheries and issues of interest to the Pacific Fishery Management Council. We have a report from the Fishery Science Centers where Dr. Steve Lindley uh, will report on the thiamine deficiency syndrome in the Central Valley Chinook salmon. And then he also has a presentation on salmon habitat research. Um, you also have attachments one and attachments two, which will complement uh, the presentations he will uh, give to you. Also, we have Susan Bishop, who will inform the council on the status of amendments 20 and 21 for the salmon fishery management plan and the status of regulatory processes for the salmon rebuilding plans that were approved by the council in 2019. And in addition, uh, she'll brief us on a notice of intent to sue, uh, which is provided in attachment three that was received by NIMPS in late January. So the council uh, action today is uh, technically just a council discussion. You do have your uh, reference materials. You have the uh, three attachments provided and um, a couple of PowerPoints that Steve Lindley will provide. And that, I believe, concludes my opening statement. Oh, okay, thank you, Robin. I guess uh, next we'll go to um, Susan Bishop. Susan? Susan, are you, uh, are you there? Oh, this is Frank. I know she was listening, but she may have been listening as an attendee and not a panelist. So um, I'll try to check with her. Yeah, it looks like she's uh, she's on a uh, web browser version and isn't able to speak. So I think we're trying to uh, trying to work around that. And it looks like Steve Lindley's also in the same boat. So uh, we might just have to hang tight here for a couple minutes. Okay. This is this is Steve Lindley. I am on the call uh, now. Oh, great. Whoa. Okay. And, and Susan just chatted me asking if we can hear her. <clears throat> and the answer is no, Susan, if you're listening. Oh. Hmm. So, Chuck, I look to you. Do you want to... Uh... Well, um... Well, I, I'll look to Robin, but we, uh, perhaps we could move to, to Steve since he's uh, online and we can work on getting um, Susan uh, Susan's technical issues fixed up in the meantime. Just that's okay. That was a question. Yes, I think it'd be appropriate to start with the PowerPoints from uh, Steve Lindley if uh, the council desires. I think that's probably the way to go. So, please. So, Mr. So Sandra, are you putting up the PowerPoint? Yes, she is. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, hello, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the council. Can you hear me clearly? Um, yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, it's really uh, my pleasure 
uh, to speak to you today about a, a couple different issues. I want to start with a, a brief overview of an emerging issue that might be of great interest um, to those interested in salmon uh, about thiamine deficiency. And I'll follow that up uh, with a presentation about recent and ongoing research on freshwater estuary and marine habitat work um, that ideally would have been given by Corey Green, but he had a conflict today. So I'll do my best to uh, present that work. So uh, starting off here, thiamine deficiency. This is an emerging issue for the California current that uh, first we became aware of last year, although people have been starting to wonder about this in Alaska and in Japan uh, for the past few years. Uh, thank you for that slide. So yeah, you can move to the next slide. Um, we became aware of it here in California last year when uh, we heard some frightening reports about disease outbreaks, apparent disease outbreaks that were simultaneously afflicting a number of Central Valley Chinook salmon um, hatcheries. And um, after the, the fish hatchery managers and fish health experts uh, ruled out really all sources of known disease to them and did some uh, Googling around and, and some research, wondered if they might be observing thiamine deficiency. And they put these six fry into thiamine baths and they immediately recovered. So that's pretty strong proof that that's what's going on. But we immediately um, got very interested in this and you'll, you'll see why it's of uh, more interest than you might even think uh, having to do with things going on in the ocean and put together a, a team of people that's been growing by leaps and bounds. Rachel Johnson is the leader of this along with Nate Mantua and several other people at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. But we have collaborators from across the nation uh, at different universities and other agencies, and even now in Sweden, where this issue has been uh, long recognized in the Baltic Sea. Uh, so there's a list here of the many people that are involved growing by the week, and we are able to do the work that I'm gonna tell you about today through the generous and very timely funding from the Delta Stewardship Council, which allowed us to do some pilot work. So the next slide, please. So what, what is thiamine deficiency? What is thiamine? Thiamine is, a, is the vitamin B1. It's an essential vitamin, and it's one of the first vitamins ever to be discovered. And it's the, the B comes from beriberi, which is a disease that um, was known about in ancient Chinese medicine, although the cause was unknown really until the late 1800s, when it was discovered that um, if animals are deficient in this vitamin, they suffer uh, a lot of different symptoms up to death. Um, but they, invertebrates um, often are expressed as a loss of equilibrium and in fish, some um, strange swimming behavior, lethargy, hyperactivity, and uh, internal bleeding. And a lot of these are kind of neurological symptoms. And in Salmonids, where it's been recognized in the Baltic since the 1970s, this is often seen in fish hatcheries when um, everything seems to be going normally, the, the fish are spawn, the eggs hatch out, but then the, the emergent fry kind of lie on the bottom of the tank. And there's a picture here of, on the left of healthy fry upright there, and on the right, some thiamine deficient ones that are, that are upside down and they just lie there. Uh, and if you poke at them, they'll swim rapidly around until they kind of collapse back to the bottom of the tank. If you look closely in that photo, you can see some kind of dark red spots along their yolk sac there, which is internal hemorrhaging. These fish, if not treated with thiamine, will be dead in a couple of days with 100% mortality. Uh, so the next slide, please. So this is what was observed in the hatcheries. And we um, kind of started out with five different interrelated um, research projects that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit now. And we have some very preliminary results. So one of the first experiments that we want to do is to understand how this might be treated. While the thymine baths of the fry are helpful, the fly, the fry do suffer permanent damage from this thymine exposure that um, expresses itself in suppressed immune function later in life. And that can have you know, negative consequences as they deal with different pathogens in the environment. And it's uh, conceivably possible to treat adult salmon by injecting them with thymine, especially if you can hold the salmon in the hatchery for more than a week or so. And uh, winter run Chinook salmon, this is completely feasible to do. So we uh, have embarked on an experiment there, which is outlined here where um, thiamine was injected into some 
of the adult females, but not others. And then these were um, measured, the thymine in the eggs later on to see whether they actually take up the thymine from the mother. The survival of the fry were then uh, followed to see if this had a survival effect. And um, we could potentially identify how much thiamine is needed in the eggs to avoid mortality. And then for fish that suffered from some low level of thiamine uh, before, or for the fish that were not treated by injection to the females, we could look at how uh, fish perform later after the early fry stage in terms of uh, their physiology, swimming performance, and things like that. Um, so those, a lot of those studies are ongoing, but I can show you some early results if we go to the next slide. This figure shows the effect of ejecting the mothers with thiamine, and on the left, the red bar, uh, were the thiamine levels in untreated females, and we can see they have about an average of five nanomoles per gram of thiamine, a few outliers with higher levels, and the females that were injected, their eggs had um, thiamine levels then that were 30 to 40 nanomoles per gram. So the injection does really work when that's feasible. And if we go to the next slide, we can see how um, the thiamine levels affect survival. So on the y-axis here is the egg thiamine that was observed uh, from the, the spawned females, and then the proportion that survived uh, for a few months after injection. And we see, uh, if you click the, ne the next slide, some little lines will appear here, that um, you get about 50% mortality with a thymine level of about 2.7 nanomoles per gram. Uh, only a few fish were observed to be below that, but quite a few, if you go to the next slide, uh, we're below this level of five nanomoles per gram, which is um, basically above that, there's very little or no effective thiamine deficiency. So uh, this is an important piece of information that we can then uh, monitor eggs and know whether we have a problem or not. This level is a little bit higher than lake trout. Uh, the other place with thiamine deficiency has been heavily studied is in the Great Lakes. Um, and they've done a lot of work on lake trout, which are a little less sensitive to thiamine than Chinook salmon, apparently. Uh, so this is a, a really helpful piece of information. And we go to the next slide. Um, so we've been looking at eggs from all of the hatchery programs in California, uh, in the Klamath and the, and the Central Valley to see how widespread this phenomenon is. And they're arranged here, uh, kind of in chronological order with the late fall Chinook at the bottom from Pullman. And these, are, these bars represent proportions suffering uh, from clearly negative thymine levels of below five nanomoles per gram in red. The orange is um, kind of getting close to that level that you'd be worried about um, some thymine deficiency in the diet of the, the fish in orange and then gray where they're pretty much replete in this vitamin. So we see that um, the late fall and winter look, were suffering pretty heavily from thymine deficiency. About half of the of the fish were going to be having serious problems with the survival of their fry. And with other stocks, spring run Chinook salmon, and then fall run Chinook salmon, just this, that have just been spawning this last fall, um, things didn't seem to be quite so bad. And at the top there is Iron Gate Hatchery um, and the, the treated fish. And so this is, does it seem to be happening to the Klamath at the moment? And the treatment seems to be entirely effective. So this is kind of widespread, uh, but varies among the runs. And we don't know yet whether that has to do with aspects of their life history timing and how that's interacting with what might be causing this, which I'll get to uh, shortly. So the next slide. So how are these fish becoming thiamine deficient? One way would be if their prey just didn't have enough thiamine in it, but we think it's something more complica complicated and sinister than that really, which has to do with them eating a lot of anchovies, uh, I think many of the fishers will have noted if they've been looking in their the bellies of the salmon caught from Central California, that uh, fish have been full of anchovies the past few years and not eating a lot of krill or juvenile rockfish, uh, where more normal conditions, you'd see a mix of these kinds of prey types. Anchovies and other clupeids are kind of interesting in that they produce an enzyme called thiaminase in their gut, which is thought to be useful for uh, recycling thiamine, and it, it has the, the side effect then when they're eaten by a, 
a predator, uh, the thymine in the gut has been released and it mixes with everything and it destroys what thymine is in the, the prey item. And uh, animals that eat diets that are in a very high proportion of uh, these kind of clupeid fish can become thymine deficient uh, to the point of their own death, actually, or um, offspring survival failure. Uh, and there are sublethal effects as well on swimming performance, disease resistance, uh, growth and maturation as well. So we think uh, anchovies have something to do with this. We're seeing record high levels in the very near shore waters in our rockfish recruitment survey uh, and a lot of anecdotal reports about abundant anchovies in the near shore waters. Uh, there's some pictures here of some guts that we've been sampling in collaboration with uh, California Fish and Wildlife and people in the, in the fishing industry as well, illustrating uh, the abundance of anchovies that, that were uh, prevalent. We can go to the next slide. So the gut sampling is useful for understanding what the salmon was eating just before you caught it, which may or may, may not be indicative of uh, its feeding over the previous days to months to, to years. And one way of getting at this longer term issue, because the thymine deficiency does take a while to, to uh, build up and express itself in the salmon, is through the use of stable isotopes of nitrogen and carbon. And here's a, a scatter plot uh, of uh, how different kinds of critters vary in their composition with these stable isotopes. And the, the neat thing about these is that these heavy, rare isotopes, uh, which are not radioactive, they're stable, they do accumulate as you move up the food chain. So top predators are enriched in these heavy elements, and uh, the base of the food web, like copepods, are lighter, having more lower values. And this can tell you something then about where an animal is feeding, because they're basically just a couple levels above their prey. And you can look at muscle tissues and things like that to get an idea of um, what the salmon may have been doing over the last month or two. But if we go to the next slide, you can get a lifetime chronology of this by looking at their eye lenses. So in the middle of the salmon's eye are little clear beads. They're about the size of a small lentil or maybe a piece of Israeli couscous. So they're clear and quite hard. And it turns out they're, they're made of layers. And many of you will be familiar with otoliths, how those accrete layers over the course of the fish's life, and the chemicals uh, that are laid down there provide some information about the fish's environment. Same is true for these eye lenses, but the eye lenses are made of protein, so you can actually get carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur isotopes out of them. This is a work by Rachel Johnson and her group at UC Davis, um, uh, where they're going to use this to figure out exactly what salmon have been eating over the course of their life in, in the ocean. It, it, there's some example data there. Um, what, what, what these things look like. We don't really have um, this worked up yet, but something to look forward to. And if we can go to the next slide. Another thing that we wanted to do is understand what might be an option for treating fish where you can't hold adults in the hatchery for a week or something like that. So most of the fall run Chinook production programs, it's not feasible to do that. An alternative might be to treat eggs and it's a little bit tricky because the cell membrane of the, the egg changes over time. It can only take up thymine during a, an early period, just before or after, maybe just before fertilization. And they also like to treat eggs in the hatcheries with, um, I believe, iodine as a kind of a disinfectant, and that will inhibit the thymine uptake. Uh, nonetheless, we did this experiment where we treated the eggs, and um, you can see for each batch of eggs here, the, the color dot on the bottom is the initial average thymine concentration, and the gray dot at the top connected by that line is how much it was elevated by the thymine treatment. So it is actually feasible to treat eggs uh, and ra raise their thymine levels well above that five nanomole per gram level, which um, should make them thymine replete and uh, healthy then as juveniles. Next slide, uh, the last bit of the experiments. has to do with whether this is an ongoing problem or not. And it's still a bit early to say about that. And I kind of already covered this actually. So I think we can go to the, the next slide. And I just want to finish up with some things to think about how this might be influencing our salmon fisheries. One is there are some pretty clear lessons for 
for hatchery managers, and they've been extremely enthusiastic to learn about this uh, and are planning on acting on this kind of information. So treating the eggs or adults with thymine injections and monitoring, ideally, whether this is something they need to be worried about or not, uh, because it, it does add some complexity and cost to, to the hatchery operations, and it, it could be monitored by looking at eggs of returning adults uh, or ones in the ocean that are forming up to begin their spawning runs as an early warning thing. And that, that's something we're, we're thinking about and talking to people about trying to implement. So you can treat this in the hatchery, uh, but natural production, there's no feasible way to treat it. There is an open question of whether eggs might accumulate thymine from the, the environment in the river itself. That's a, another area of uh, future investigation. But you should be aware that um, at, for certain runs and at certain times, it's possible and indeed likely that natural production in freshwater is going to be seriously impacted by thymine deficiency. And, and we think this was observed uh, this last year in extremely low catches in certain rotary screw traps, either no fish or dead fry in the trap, just something that you don't usually see. Um, that, so this is something to be aware of and, and to, to try to monitor going forward. And then finally, in addition to these lethal effects that are observed in the fry, I alluded to before that thymine deficiency has a variety of physiological effects, behavioral effects at sublethal levels that could be affecting salmon in the ocean, especially when they start feeding on fish like anchovies. And in cases where they're doing that, that very heavily, thymine deficiency could be affecting their ability to avoid predators, to capture prey, to even be caught on uh, a trolling lure, uh, their, their maturation. And those are processes that underlie the cohort um, regressions that are used for the stock forecast and could potentially explain uh, why we sometimes overpredict ocean abundance based on uh, H2 returns if there are subsequent uh, indirect mortality or delayed maturation due to thiamine deficiency. So this is something we'd like uh, to, to monitor systematically in the future. So uh, that's what I have about my main deficiency. I can take questions on that now, or I can switch over to give a little overview of, of some of the habitat work the centers have been doing and, and take questions at the end if there's time. Um, let's see if anybody has any questions for, um, for the, the first PowerPoint here before we uh, go to the next one. Anybody? Uh, uh, Danny Evanson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, and thank you, Steve, for bringing this information before us today. I'd actually like to speak to the accompanying report in uh, featured in our briefing book as attachment. Uh, it's E1 Attachment One. Uh, which was the NIMS SWFSC report on this topic. Specifically, I, I wanted to clear up a mischaracterization of the research referred to in this report that was conducted on Yukon River Chinook salmon that's uh, uh, concerning. Uh, the NIMS report uh, states in the section on previous evidence that an investigation by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game of low returns of Chinook salmon to the Yukon River found that a majority of eggs tested in 2014 and 2015 had levels of thiamine low enough to cause sublethal effects likely to compromise the population's productivity. That's a pretty strong statement and it is a misinterpretation of the conclusions from that work. The state did look at samples from Yukon River Chinook salmon collected in 2014 and 2015. And those results are published in a paper, uh, Larson and Howard 2019. But the paper stated, and I quote, egg thiamine concentrations may influence productivity in Western Alaska Chinook salmon stocks. In that paper, we did not imply that thiamine deficiency was solely or primarily responsible for productivity declines. Rather, that it could be partly responsible and that more work was needed to really inform what role, what role 
thiamine would or would not have on salmon populations. So I just wanted to clear that up on the record. Um, again, the Yukon population is mainly wild fish. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. Um, anyone else? Krista? Krista Swenson? Yep. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, and thank you, Steve, for the presentation. Um, it was really interesting, and I just am curious, are you seeing deficiencies in other B vitamins, or are you testing for that as well, or is it just thiamine? We've only been testing for thiamine. I, I would guess that people uh, in the Great Lakes and in the Baltic would have been looking at all kinds of vitamins and, and have determined that it's this one in particular. Um, and that's all we, we've been doing. Uh, okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Ch Vice Chair. Thanks, Krista. Uh, Chris Kern. Chris? Sorry, my mouse was moving around on the unmute button. Can you hear me? Yes. yes uh, th thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just going to um, uh, mention for folks, um, and I'm not an expert on where we're at with it, but I know we've in Oregon we've started doing some some testing on this general um, on on the thiamine issue as well, particularly with some of our steelhead stocks, uh, including some testing with supplementation of thiamine, so or, or, or supplementation. So um, definitely a topic of interest, really appreciate it. Uh, and there's uh, uh, appears to be a growing uh, interest in this topic as well. I can even recall the days when it was a, uh, a consideration for some sturgeon uh, populations that might be feeding on, um, on uh, herring family species, uh, et cetera. So I appreciate it, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, why don't you uh, go to your next uh, PowerPoint? It's good. And thank you for that. That was uh, very, very interesting. Okay, yeah, thanks for those good questions and, and that clarification. I'll, I'll loop back with my colleagues to make sure they understand that too. So, yeah, switching gears here now, this is a, a presentation put together by Corey Green. Uh, I am familiar with a lot of this work as well. It's, some of it is collaborations between the two science centers. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And this, uh, click again. I think there's some transitions here. Yeah, so I'm going to give some examples of habitat research that is conducted by the two centers in freshwater, estuaries, early ocean, and then how this is, gets integrated in, in certain ways. These are just um, a few examples from a, really a large portfolio of work that the two centers are doing here. And uh, we do a lot of work on, on habitat to develop tools and information that can be used to understand how uh, things going on in these habitats are driving the abundance of salmon populations and how um, our partners in habitat restoration might be able to um, mitigate or, or restore habitats to improve the situation uh, for salmon, because a lot of the troubles we have in managing these stocks really stem from, from their habitats, uh, much more so than, than fisheries management. So it was a big focus. So I'll give you some examples, things that are going on here with the next slide. So um, one example of the kind of work we're doing here is on the Chehalis River. This is a tributary that dumps uh, into Grace Harbor along the Washington coast. And uh, it, the work uses a variety of uh, large scale landscape analysis techniques to try to understand the historical and current distribution of different habitat types like uh, estuaries, the main stem river, floodplains, et cetera and relate that uh, to information on how salmon use those habitats and their typical densities there to try to understand uh, what the production level was in the Chehalis and what it is now. And with that information, uh, to try to understand how we might be able to restore the system. So we go to the next slide. So using this model of salmon habitat production based on habitat, the authors, uh, Tim Beachy and colleagues, 
look at how uh, different kinds of habitat restoration might improve the abundance of Chinook salmon and coho salmon in this system. And the idea was to uh, ask the question, what would happen if you could completely return one aspect of these habitats to its historical condition while all the others remained at their current uh, more or less degraded state? And uh, the left and right plots here show the different habitat restoration scenarios for spring and Chinook salmon, spring or Chinook salmon and coho salmon, and um, some of the different habitat restorations having to do with restoring uh, floodplains, beaver ponds, uh, shade, et cetera, are shown there in the different colors. And the gray bar is the current uh, average level of, of abundance in these systems. And you can see the patterns are pretty different between the, the two species. For spring run Chinook salmon, the most single effective uh, restoration would be to uh, improve the, the sediment size distribution, get rid of the fines, which seem to be a problem in that system. That would be the biggest effect. It would have um, some effect for coho salmon, but they would be more responsive to beaver ponds. That's uh, maybe not very surprising given the different way these two species use different kinds of habitats in these systems. That's one important point. Um, different actions will have um, differential benefits for these species, species. And the other is that no single restoration strategy is going to return these things to their historic level of abundance. It's really, there is no silver bullet. It's going to take a suite of actions to get improvements. Moving on to the next example, uh, a very wide scale example here. This is an assessment uh, by Morgan Bond and colleagues at the Northwest Center of trying to understand where floodplain restoration might have uh, the most effect throughout the entire Columbia River. And they did this um, using a variety of uh, different kinds of, of data, uh, imaging data and uh, elevation data to understand where floodplains used to occur and, and where they occur now based on their vegetation and, and things like that. And they find that the uh, opportunities for restoring floodplains are highly variable throughout the Columbia River. So the dark green areas are the ones where removing things like levees um, would have the, the would restore access to the most habitat. So we can see some areas there in the uh, Willamette River uh, that would could generate a lot more habitat and other areas um, relatively little. The next slide, please. This is a, another project based on using remote sensing kinds of data to try to understand how the, quali the quantity of habitat varies with stream flow, and this is a particularly important topic in regulated rivers, uh, which are really common throughout the West Coast, especially down in California where uh, I am most used to working. So there's some images here of um, aerial or satellite images of the landscape and multispectral data from those images that can be used to automatically classify the water surface area, which shows in that, that lower left corner picture there, the blue area, is identified as surface water. And combining that with hydrologic data from the national water model, you can predict, uh, you can develop a model to predict how much water habitat is available under different flows. And an example shown in the next slide. So this um, shows a number of reaches along this uh, study river here in the dry period in September at the top and in May uh, in the wet period. And you can see generally that there's not surprisingly a lot more uh, water habitat in the wet period and different reaches within uh, this river segment respond differently. So you, you can see that kind of um, tan color there visible in the September image are presumably gravel bars, and um, in May when the flows are higher, that reach to the, the left end of the figure floods up quite a bit more. And these kinds of uh, models are extremely useful uh, to understand how water projects influence salmon populations through their impacts on, on habitat availability. Um, and I'll touch very briefly on the very end of the talk about that. We go to the next slide. Uh, another 
example, not so much remote sensing, but actually on the ground is uh, investigations of the aftermath of removing two dams on the Elwall River in um, 2011 and 2014. There's uh, some pictures of the dams there before and after on the right. Um, very happy pictures if you like salmon more than dams. Um, these things do have in the long run, as I'll show you, great benefits, but they have impacts in the short term, which are, are negative and need to be considered and managed. So we go to the next slide. Here, um, one of the big impacts often of removing a dam is the, the sediment pulse that comes out behind the dam, which has been trapping sediment for the life of that dam. In the case of the Elwha, there was a lot of sediment in those reservoirs. And we can see the, the before and after picture of the mouth of the Elwha. Anybody who's driven around there, I think this is quite a striking uh, thing to see that there's a, a quite a large um, tidal delta now off what used to be in the, the near shore waters of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, that's probably some nice rearing habitat for salmon, but those sediments in the short term did have some big impacts on benthic invertebrates, which are important prey for juvenile salmon and steelhead. And you can see there on the lower left, um, the abundance of those benthic invertebrates plummeted after the removal of the Elwha Dam. And then after um, Glines Canyon Dam, when it was removed, they responded um, with there being more benthic invertebrates, but they were largely, for the first few years, diptera, which are fly larvae, essentially, um, before returning back to normal. So this is a short-term kind of negative impact for, for juvenile salmon and their production, but it fairly rapidly returns to pretty much normal. We go to the next slide. Uh, an interesting thing that they've done uh, with the Elwha River removals was a harvest moratorium for in-river sport and commercial harvest. And this is something that undoubtedly will come up as a, as a possibility for the Klamath Dam removal, which is coming up in a couple of years. And um, on the left upper, plot there are some bars showing the number of Chinook salmon reds in their distribution above and below where the former dams were. And we could see uh, that there was some fluctuation there. And naturally, after these impassable barriers were removed, the fish did move into the, the upper part of that river pretty quickly. And on the right, it shows the, the actual number of spawners that were counted, as well as what is expected to have been due to the harvest moratorium there in orange on top of that. And a point to take away from this is that by restricting harvest in the river, they got essentially an extra year of returns uh, in about five years of, of closures, which does help boost the recovery and recolonization of the Chinook salmon in that basin. We can go to the next slide. Uh, another fascinating thing that's come out of this, and really quite a surprise, and while not directly of in, probably of direct interest to uh, commercial fishermen at least, is uh, the very rapid reappearance of summer steelhead. So uh, summer steelhead are, are called that because they return to rivers in the summertime, kind of like spring chinook, and they hang out there uh, in upper areas of the watershed, and they spawn later in the year. And these were practically non-existent in the Elwha because there was no habitat for them to, to be in. Yet, following the removal of the dam, this life history type uh, very quickly reappeared. And it's thought that this basically reestablished itself from standing genetic variation in landlocked rainbow trout that were above this dam. And this is, a, a, uh, in addition to just being a fascinating finding, it, it has some implications if this is generally going to be the case that uh, we can get reemergence of life history variants or different phenotypes like early run timing in uh, the Salmonids with um, the reestablishment of their, their habitats based on this uh, standing genetic variation, which can be retained in populations. Uh, so that this is a surprising bit of good news. Go to the next slide. Okay, switching gears to talk about a few estuary projects. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, another project that colleagues at the Northwest Center have done is a systematic evaluation of the loss of tidal wetlands along the U.S. West Coast. And this used um, an in-depth analysis of historical 
elevation maps and current vegetation as well to establish what I think people were generally aware of what was a, a pretty dire situation of very extensive loss of tidal marsh habitats with the most severe loss, not probably not surprising to many, being in the central coast of California where the San Francisco Bay Delta has been largely converted to agricultural lands when it used to be a giant tule marsh. But this, this pattern is prevalent along the West Coast of dike lands being, uh, I mean, marshlands being diked for different agricultural grazing purposes. And uh, this is probably a significant loss of productivity for Chinook salmon and coho salmon throughout their, their range in, in North America. The next slide, please. Okay, moving southward. Uh, this is a joint project between the two centers that Stu Munch, uh, postdoc at the Northwest Center, and a number of scientists, including Will Satterthwaite at the Southwest Center, have been working on for the past few years of looking at beach sand data that has been long collected in the Central Valley of California. And um, never before have people done a whole lot with it. it. The conventional wisdom was that the nature of the beach sanding meant that it was pretty a pretty limited utility, maybe only useful for understanding kind of the timing of Chinook salmon movement through the system. But Stu and his colleagues have done a fantastic job of, of really getting a lot of great information out of these data uh, about how what, what the climate constraints are on the distribution of Chinook salmon in the system and exactly how much flow and escapement contribute to production and occupancy of restoration sites. So we go to the next slide and look at some results of, of this work. On the left here, um, the authors found that fry production increases, not surprisingly, with the number of spawners in the system rising up uh, to a, a peak of, at around 400,000 spawners. And this is a, a kind of a notable finding given that the current conservation target for fall Russian of salmon in the Central Valley is 122 to 180,000 fish. This analysis uh, would suggest that you could get more production out of fresh water with uh, more spawners, perhaps up to 400,000 spawners. The uh, little figure just to the right of that shows the response to flow, which shows no real plateauing in, in the system. The more flow coming out of the Sacramento River, the more fry are caught here. And this is um, you know, consistent with what we see that after during and after periods of, of uh, wet climate conditions that Sacramento River, Fall Chinook uh, usually do well, and during droughts, they do rather poorly. The figures to the right, I don't really have time to, to delve into these, but the gist of this is that if you're somebody restoring habitats in uh, the Center Valley or, or probably really in any system, and you're looking for a response to your habitat restoration in terms of site occupancy or abundance of, of fishes there, it really does depend on the, the context of what's going on in the system. So when um, the flows are high and there's a lot of fish spawning, you will tend to see more fish in your restoration area. Uh, and conversely, when there are a few adults or the flows are low, you may see very few or none. And you need to know that to evaluate the effectiveness of your, of your restoration. And the next slide. Okay, moving on to some early ocean work. Next slide. So one of the interesting projects going on at the Northwest Center with a lot of partners there is this Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. This is motivated by the observation of um, really plummeting early marine survival rates, uh, or, or marine survival rates, I should say, uh, since the, the 1980s, trying to understand what's going on with that. It's been seen in Chinooks, um, co and steelhead, and um, they hope to learn more about this so that they can improve forecasts uh, and better manage harvests and hatcheries. So the next slide gives a little overview of this project. Um, it, they have a, a lot of different elements to this, uh, investigating different hypotheses about what might be going on. So one theory is that uh, changes in Puget Sound related to or due to changes in primary production are reducing the, the food and energy flow from the bottom of the food web. And they're doing some really cool work with these gooey duck clams, which are really long lived. And you can see the 
the person holding the clam there, they have these um, growth rings on the shell, pretty visible there. And the width of those are related to how well the clam was feeding, which has to do with how much plankton was in the water. So you can use these shells to figure out like tree rings, um, how the clams have been growing over long periods of time and get a record of what primary production has been in the system. Um, they've also been looking at a variety of other hypotheses related to predation. It's been noted that uh, harbor seals are, have been exploding in abundance in Puget Sound over the past few decades. They've been doing all kinds of field work about that. And uh, they've been putting this all into an Atlantis model and um, developing a variety of ecosystem indicators for Puget Sound. And there's not really been a smoking gun for Schnook or Coho. They think that the seals really are affecting the steelhead, which are only in the system for a short period of time. Uh, the Coho and Schnook can reside in Puget Sound for longer periods. And it's not really clear what, it's probably not just one thing that's causing it. It may be a number of things. And the modeling suggests that it's probably more due to these bottom-up effects than than seals or, or orcas. But a lot more to come from this project. Uh, the next slide. Uh, moving a little further offshore is an ongoing, fairly recent study looking at the relationship between the uh, distribution of Schnook salmon in coastal waters of Washington and, and British Columbia and their relationship to southern resident killer whales. I know this is a, a topic of um, broad interest, both in the fishing community and, and the broader society. Um, we can go to the next slide, learn a little bit about this project. This is based on uh, catching fish at sea and implanting them with acoustic tags. These give off unique ID codes when they swim by a receiver, and you can monitor fish migrations with them. The fish are also sampled for uh, genetic data, which can determine their stock of origin, and they collect scales to determine their age. And there's a picture of uh, some of our colleagues there with a nice salmon that they're doing some surgery on there while offshore. Go to the next slide. And how you track them is using uh, moored hydrophones. The little red dots on the map show the locations of the hydrophones. So ranging from uh, Willapa Bay and the mouth of the Columbia River there or, or the Columbia River estuary, all along the ocean, uh, the, the coastal waters of Washington, this is a huge effort to run an array of receivers like that. Uh, there are also receivers in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and along uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island and uh, in the Queen Charlotte Strait, et cetera. So this can allow you to see how the fish are moving around uh, during different seasons, when, especially when the southern residents move out of Puget Sound and into coastal waters. And this is a huge, huge project involving three divisions at the Northwest Center, listed on the right and a number of collaborators, I'm sorry, on the left and a number of collaborators on the right. Um, lots more to come from this. Next slide, please. And then finally, some ways we're putting all this together. Next slide. Uh, one neat example here that uh, was recently published by Will Satterthwaite and many colleagues, Corey, and a number of other familiar names to you there, Jamil and Chris, uh, Michael Farrell, as well as looking at um, whether ecological indicators can be used to understand when the forecasting tools used for the ocean abundance forecasts might be more or less reliable. Uh, this is sort of a step towards including environmental covariates in those. Uh, and they did a really broad scale search investigation for indicators and thresholds that might be useful in this way. And they did find a few things. And we, I can show you that on the next slide. Maybe, oh, okay, this, this just gives a, an overview of the conceptual approach here. Here's a familiar figure of the salmon life cycle from freshwater in the ocean uh, with the return spawning migrations and the different drivers that might be influencing um, the relationship between spawners, ocean adults, and returning adults. We go to the next slide. And here's some results. So maybe the clearest results of this came out of uh, Sacramento River Fall Chinook, where they found that forecast performance, which is um, here is a, a good forecast is one with low error, which would be 
a forecast performance of zero, that when the Pacific Decadal oscill Oscillation becomes relatively negative, that um, the forecast performance declines dramatically. And similarly, the North Pacific Index, when that becomes uh, quite a bit more positive than average, um, this performance also declines. And in this case, these are when the forecast is an overprediction of ocean abundance. And th maybe this isn't hugely surprising that when basically when things get weird in the ocean that our relationships based on statistical relationships uh, that we've observed over some historical period are probably going to be less reliable. They found um, a number of results for Puget Sound as well. It's much harder to summarize. You'll, you'll need to look at the paper for that because of um, there are a lot of forecast models there and they found different things for different ones. But there's um, a reference, I believe. I can't see it on my slide, but uh, I showed it to you before. Next slide, please. So some other work that's been going on is developing habitat indicators. This, I believe, was done at the request of, of the council in relationship to the rebuilding plans where you know, everyone understood that while um, the fisheries were declared overfished, the cause of that was not due to overfishing. It was due to things going on somewhere in the habitat, uh, freshwater or marine. So uh, the idea is to develop some indicators of these conditions that can be used uh, readily to investigate this um, for this recent re episode of rebuilding and any future ones as well to, to be able to have this um, ongoing. And I can show you a little more about that if we move to the next slide. So this is actually gonna be presented in more detail in the uh, ecosystem status report. I believe it's gonna be on Wednesday when doctors Harvey and Garfield will be presenting this, but I'll give you a sneak preview now. This will be a familiar looking plot of the stoplight plot, which uh, in the past has been developed sort of generically for ocean conditions. This is, idea has been expanded greatly. Uh, we can click through a few slides here. There, there's some transitions. Uh, yeah, keep going. That's great, stop there. So um, yeah, this is organized now. Um, the, the different rows are years. And if you move from left to right, there are adult spawner related indicators, incubation indicators, and other freshwater and delta indicators, uh, as well as hatchery releases that are all things that would be influenced by freshwater variables, which are listed there below, and then some marine condition indicators as well. And uh, like the usual stop stoplight chart, the, the green or the, the upper third of uh, positive, what we think are positive conditions, and the red or the lower third. And we can see for the, the recent um, episode of, of um, overfished status, that corresponds to brood years 2012 through 2014. And the red colors are kind of all over the place there, but a lot of them spanning uh, freshwater indicators. And this is consistent with the fact that we were in a pretty severe and still remain in a pretty severe drought. Uh, but there were also some um, problems in the marine environment as well. This is in contrast to what we saw in the last kind of bad period in 2008, um, 2009, which were the 2004 and five broods where conditions were largely um, problematic in the ocean environment where we've since discovered uh, marine predation was at uh, record high levels. Uh, the next slide, or click forward. I think we could just keep going. Yeah. So trying to boil that all down, this is not an ecosystem status review, and I don't think it's going to be presented on Wednesday. Um, you, can, you can kind of just take the average. There, there's reasons why that's a, a bit of a problem, but just for points of illustration here, we've done that. Um, for the Sacramento and the Klamath on the right, the blue line uh, is the average of the marine indicators. The black line is the average of the freshwater indicators. And one of the kind of curious things here is in the Sacramento, those things tend to um, vary somewhat inversely. And that means that a lot of the time, if it's bad in one place, it's, it's good in the other, and it kind of averages out to maybe a mediocre year. But um, during the brood years, where we uh, resulted in the, the overfished situation, both the marine and freshwater conditions were, they were both poor. So you have a double whammy and, and that's not surprising that that should lead to kind of bad outcomes. Since then, the freshwater 
indicators have returned more to normal, but we remain in, in what appear to be poor ocean conditions. And, and I think this is related to the persistent warm offshore waters that, that we've been seeing the past few years. And I think you can look forward to learning more about that from Chris and Toby on Wednesday. Next slide, please. Okay, and I think this is it. So just to summarize, we're doing work across all of these different environments and trying to pull them all together uh, into, into synthetic products that are gonna be useful for management. One thing I didn't really mention here that I'd like to talk to the council about uh, in a future NIMS report is our development of, of integrated life cycle models that actually include population dynamics as well. We've developed these for uh, the Columbia River and Sacramento River would run Chinook and, and some other stocks as well. Um, largely to help people developing biological opinions understand the impacts of those water projects, but they are um, more broadly useful than that and can help in integrate all of this information. Uh, and I look forward to telling you about that at a, at a future update. With that, I think I can take any questions at first time. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, questions? Uh, Butch Smith? Butch? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, excuse me. Thank you. Um, Steve, hey, great. Great presentation. Um, you know, I was, I was wondering if you were aware in Puget Sound, the state just came out with a study that, that showed as many as 10 million smolts being eaten in South Sound by uh, oil seals and uh, could be a, a grand total of all Puget Sound stocks up in like 33 million. Um, you know, that's a significant uh, amount of, of fish, not counting the bird predation when you um, add in a 1% survival rate, that's, you know, like 330,000 less adults coming back a year. And I was just wondering if that, uh, I saw you, you, you noted that, but, uh, but it, that's a pretty significant uh, issue when you think uh, you've got this many smokes going out and you're losing them before they even get to the salt water. So I just wondering if, and hope that you, you, you keep addressing that and, and looking into that, because that, that is a big issue. Yeah, Thank thanks for chair. that. I, I know people are, they are very um, interested in the, the seal abundance issue in Puget Sound. Okay. Thanks for that comment. Yeah, thank you, Butch. Um, Chris Kerr. Chris? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I had a question, and, and it may not be one you can answer, and if, if that's the case, that's fine. It's just, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to take the chance to ask anyway. Uh, could could I get you to maybe go back to the the last of the the red light green light charts? Would that be possible? Make the question easier. Any one of them will do. Perfect. Thank you. So the the question really is is relative to marine residents uh, metrics um, in these sorts of analyses. And I apologize if this is is in some of the other documents we already have, but. Um, I didn't see it, so um, I'm going to ask. Um, kind of traditionally, we've we've really focused as the science uh, perspective a lot on early residents in the ocean, uh, and so commonly we'll look at at some of the marine indicators that are associated with that time frame where fish enter the ocean. Um, but we are, I, in my opinion, we're seeing a few things in some of our um, runs that might uh, indicate. It, it, well, I'll back up. And that, that certainly we know that early entry phase is a, is a really important driver for survival overall uh, and potentially explains a lot of the variance in, in, in return strength. Um, but we, I think we're seeing a few signs occasionally of some, some later uh, issues that, that occur, you know, subsequent to that first year, whether it's over winter or in the second year of residence or whatever it might be. Do you know offhand if, if, um, these indicators that are shown in this uh, are, are primarily focused on that early portion uh, as would sort of be traditional, or is there any range in there uh, of some later time frames that might start to get into that, that sort of later survival uh, question? You know, I'm going to have to follow up about those specifically. I suspect that these are probably tied to the year of ocean entry because that is traditionally how it's been done and, and a lot of past research has has found correlations there 
Um, but I, I would point out that uh, the work by Will Satterthwaite that I, sh I showed, I think just before this slide, of looking at when forecast performance falls apart, part, I didn't mention um, that those indicators are related to things happening just before return. So uh, people are thinking about that. And then going back to my talk about thionine, I wonder, because I've been hearing anecdotally too about um, people seeing lots and lots of shakers in in one year and then in the next year expecting it, it'll be banner fishing not seeing them but we don't see the fish in the fishery and they're not coming back to the river which uh maybe what you're alluding to about something happening after early entry and and finding is one of the things that really could be doing that uh and we could and we're thinking about what kind of an indicator we could get for that having to do with uh, anchovy abundance of distribution as well so that's something that maybe in the future we can bring in Great, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, anyone else? Okay, we'll see. Uh, this, this is Chuck. I've got uh, one quick question for for Steve. Um, can't raise my hand, but uh, anyway, just I guess since we're on the predation thing, uh, first of all, Steve, thanks. A great uh, presentation. So much uh, interesting research going on. Uh, if I was going to ha have you answer all my questions, uh, we would be here for a long time, so I won't do that. I'll just pick on one. But uh, if, if we go back to the stoplight graph, um, the predation, I'm focusing again on the marine predation. So uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the uh, 04 and 05 brood years had the really uh, very extremely high predation um, uh, index. And so um, I could maybe get into Chris's uh, point a little bit. So, uh, so is that uh, early entrance, or is that uh, you know? So is that bird predation for uh, early entrance? Is that uh, pinniped predation uh, for uh, for you know, you know mature fish, or, or uh, what 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 are the components of that predation index? I guess. Sure. Uh, first of all, just wish you a happy birthday, Chuck. Sorry, I'm not there to do that in person, but I do know about the, this one in particular. So I also should have mentioned that these indicators are specifically tailored for the stocks. And this is the Sacramento River one, but there's a similar table for Klamath. And in the case of the, the Sacramento River, uh, work by Brian Wells and colleagues identified um, that the abundance and distribution of common mirror uh, around the Gulf of the Farallons was a, a powerful indicator of predation, and that's what this one is. So that's uh, happening to the the juveniles as they enter the ocean for the, the first few months, uh, when there are um, not a lot of rockfish, and there are a lot of anchovies near shore. The mirror move away from the Farallons. They otherwise they'll feed on rockfish right there, and they move inshore to get the anchovies. But they they get salmon at the same time when they do that. So that's what that predation index is related to. Thank you. Okay, thanks Chuck. Anyone else? Okay, well thank you Steve. That's really good stuff there. Um, next we'll go to Susan Bishop. I believe she's ready to go. Susan? Hello Mr. Vice Chair, can you hear me? Uh, I can. Great, good news. Um, Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. I'm very sorry about the user dif uh, difficulties and I wanna express my gratitude to Dr. Lindley for being so quickly adaptable. Um, uh, I will be presenting on the regulatory activities, uh, giving you an update on a few issues. Um, but before I do that, as we kick off the salmon season, um, preseason planning in particular, I just want to acknowledge the recent passing of, Doc of uh, Doug Millward. Doug was a stalwart in the PFMC salmon family. He was a longtime STT member. Um, he was persistent in his fishing pursuit of the elusive Chinook, as we all know. And he was a much admired colleague and a good man. Um, I know that uh, many of us will really miss him, um, which speaks to his character. And I wanted to acknowledge that before I gave the rest of my report. So moving into the report, uh, like I said, I have a few things to update you on. Um, first, we'll cover the status of the NIMS adoption of the salmon rebuilding plans. I'll go quickly over the status of amendments 20 and 21, uh, the status of several ESA listing petitions, um, and um, 
And then briefly, I will point to a notice of intent to sue that we recently received that is in the briefing book. Um, the council adopted rebuilding plans for two overfished stocks of Chinook salmon and three overfished stocks of coho salmon in 2019 and managed the salmon fisheries consistent with these rebuilding plans in 2020. Um, we, NEMS has now approved and published the final uh, rules adopting both the Chinook salmon rebuilding plan that was in November of last year and the final rule approving coho sam the coho salmon rebuilding plans on February of this year. Uh, we do want to note that in early 2021, NIMS determined that the status of one of the overfished coho stocks, that's Snohomish coho, improved in 2020 um, to not overfished rebuilding. But because it is not yet rebuilt, uh, fisheries should still be managed consistent with its rebuilding plan. But we wanted to note that good news. Amendment 20 uh, would amend the salmon FMP to change the start date of the ocean salmon fishery from May 1 to May 16th and to change the southern boundary of the California KMZ from Horse Mountain to five miles north at latitude 4010. The notice of availability for Amendment 20 published in the Federal Register on February 9th. Um, the Magnuson Stevens Act requires a 60 day comment period, which will close on April 12th. And then NIMS has 30 days to make a decision with regard to that um, uh, amendment, whether to adopt, um, to decline it, or to partially adopt it. I want to note that NIMS cannot approve the Amendment 20 or take any action to implement its provisions prior to the end of the public comment period, um, which I indicated was April uh, 12th. NIMS will endeavor to approve Amendment 20 prior to May 12th. Uh, which would be the 30 days that NIMS has to make its decision. Um, NIMS, um, uh, which, which should give NIMS the time to incorporate both the schedule change and the line change into the 2021 salmon regulatory packages. However, it is unrealistic to expect that NIMS can complete the approval decision um, between the end of the public comment period on the 12th and the end of the April PFMC meeting on the 15th. Um, to allow in-season action for the early season fisheries to adjust the management boundary. Because the current southern boundary of the KMZ, which is Horse Mountain in the FNP, is defined in the FNP, it must remain in place until the change in the boundary is approved under Amendment 20. Therefore, we recommend that the Council and the STT plan um, that the KMZ boundary change will not take effect until May 16th, 2021. We have reviewed this with the SAS, and I know that um, Peggy is working with the um, STT and the SAS on some language to reflect this for the in development of the 2021 regulations. Uh, we do want to note that the 2020 management measures include three early season fisheries anticipated to open between March 15th, 2021, and the 2021 uh, final rule date, which is likely May 16th in Fort Bragg and, Cal and the California KMZ areas uh, that include the geographic boundaries that were described using pre-amendment 20 landmark of Ho Horse Mountain. So basically those fisheries would remain in place with the boundary being Horse Mountain. With regard to amendment 21, which, approves, which proposes to amend the salmon FMP to incorporate a management framework to limit the effects that PFMC salmon fisheries have on Chinook prey available to, to southern resident killer whales in years when Chinook abundance in the north of Falcon area is particularly low. We are working on an ESA consultation addressing the operation of the ocean salmon PFMC fisheries under the FMP, including Amendment 21. The consultation will be completed prior to promulgation of the 2021 management measures, if not earlier. As soon as that consultation is complete, we will transmit and notice the availability of Amendment 21 for public comment, um, similar to Amendment 2020, that would be for 60 days. Uh, and then again, we would have 30 days um, under which to determine whether we would approve that amendment, disapprove the amendment, or partially approve the amendment. Uh, we would like to uh, reiterate our appreciation for the collaboration assistance by the council and its advisory bodies, the agency, the tribal staff, the public, and a whole lot of people over the past two years um, as the Killer Whale Ad Hoc Work Group completed its work. 
That work we want to acknowledge was instrumental in informing our consultation. And we understand that it was challenging on many levels and we thank the council for its insight, its time and its patience. Finally, I'll move into an update on the four petitions that I mentioned to list, or to list uh, populations in Oregon and California of Spring, Chinook and Steelhead. Um, these populations um, that are subject of the, these petitions that we're considering are currently part of ESUs and DPSs where NIMS had previously determined listing was not warranted. So the petitions relate to specific life history types within those larger ESUs and DPSs. Um, NIMS has determined that the steelhead petition is not, was not warranted. We plan to combine the Oregon coast and Southern Oregon, Northern California petitions into one 12 month finding. Once those findings are final, that's still um, under uh, work. And we are still working on the status reviews for the upper Klamath and Trinity River um, spring run Chinook petitions. And finally, as I mentioned, um, in your briefing book, you will find a 60-day notice of intent to sue from Fish Northwest. That would be um, um, agenda item E1, attachment three. And that is related to north of the north of Falcon planning process. NIMS was one of several um, uh, federal agencies um, uh, noted in that 60-day uh, notice. The notice would, I believe was, uh, we received it on January 29th, and so it would expire at the end of March. And with that, that concludes my NIMS report. If there's any questions, I would be happy to take them. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, questions uh, for Susan? Okay. Oh, uh, Joe Oldman, Joe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, it's more of a, a comment, and I appreciate the information that uh, uh, Susan just provided uh, uh, regarding the uh, E1 attachment three, the 60 day notice of intent to sue. I'd like to provide a comment regarding that. So this notice of intent to sue refers to the treaty tribes throughout the document. These tribes have treaty reserve fishing rights. Treaty rights are critical to the Indian tribes as they allow them to meet their needs and carry on cultural traditions uh, in the various fisheries uh, that they're involved with. Uh, salmon is also a federal trust resource, meaning the federal government, government has a legal responsibility and obligation to fulfill the treaty commitments made with tribal nations. I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, share that comment with the council and with uh, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Anyone else? Questions for Susan on the NIPS report? All right. Seeing none, um, I guess we'll go to public comment. And I believe we have one card. I believe it's um, James Stone. James, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, you're up. Oh, we have two two people signed up. I see. Okay, but James, you're first. Okay, thank you. Um, I think my public comment that I submitted a letter to uh, Susan Bishop just concerned um, as the executive director for NorCal Guides and Sportsman's Association with the limited amount of uh, fish that uh, we saw come back last year and the low escapement in the past that we are concerned about escapement numbers and uh, just to ensure the sustainability of the fishery to make sure that we got over 122,000. I've had uh, side conversations. Um, with uh, state and federal officials about it and uh, stressed our concerns. And I think that uh, our concerns are recognized at this time. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, and questions for uh, questions for James? I see Joe you, uh, Oatman, you still have your, uh, your hand up. Okay. No problem. 
All right, thank you, James. Appreciate that. And uh, I was incorrect. Uh, that was our uh, one comment card, I guess, instead of two. So uh, with that, with that, we'll go into um, count or a council uh, discussion. If any, and seeing none, okay. I guess, uh, Robin, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I hope you can hear me okay. My headphones uh, are recharging. So um, I think that the uh, council has had a, a very good um, informative session here uh, from the fishery science centers and from NEMPS. And so uh, with that, I think you've uh, completed your work here under agenda item E1. Very good, thank you, Robin. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand the uh, gavel back to uh, Chair Gorelick. Mark. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Well, we've completed E1. We have two more agenda items for the day. Um, but we're going to take a break first. It's 2.45. We'll come back at 3 o'clock sharp to pick up uh, uh, the last two salmon items, E2 and E3.
Well, it's just about three o'clock, so why don't we get started in in a minute? All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have two agenda items left on day one, uh, Salmon E2 and E3. Uh, so we'll get going on E2, a reintrodu reintroduction above Grand Coulee Dam. And I'll turn to Robin Elke to get us started. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, this is agenda item E2, the re Salmon reintroduction above Grand Coulee Dam. 
Uh, at the September 2020 Council meeting, Rodney Costin, the chairman of the Colville Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, CT. CR gave a presentation to the council outlining the collaborative efforts of the CTCR along with the Upper Columbia United Tribes and other partners to implement a phased approach to fish, fish passage and introduction of salmon upstream of the Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee dams. The council at that time was informed of the progress made towards those efforts, which included the 2015 report from the Columbia Basin Tribes and First Nations, which is provided under attachment one. And that report described the feasibility study outlining a plan use, using a phased approach to reinduce the salmon to the upper Columbia River Basin. The plan consists of four phases and the phase one report is complete and provided as attachment two. The Upper Columbia United Tribes with support from the US Geological Survey, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and other key partners have investigated the feasibility of fish passage to the blocked area and support the effort. The CTCR had also submitted a letter which is provided as attachment three that requested the council to support the reintroduction effort, citing the expanded salmon geographic distribution and increased salmon production as some of the potential benefits of the plan. At the September meeting, then the council discussed this request and agreed to consider a draft letter of general support, which is provided as attachment four. So the support would be for conducting the studies and research to help inform the concept of the salmon reintroduction to the Upper Columbia Basin. Um, so in, in uh, my view, I think in September, the council did not necessarily agree uh, to send a letter, um, but did ask that a letter be draft so that they could review it here at the March meeting. And again, that's provided for you as attachment for. Um, we uh, did reach out to some of the folks um, to contribute or um, you know, give some insight on, on drafting the letter. We didn't get a lot of uh, comments back, but we uh, did reach out to Oregon and Idaho and um, I think the uh, Columbia River tribes, if I remember right. So either way, um, uh, just uh, trying to recap the conversation in September so we can pick it up here uh, at the March meeting. And so the council action is to discuss the response, which is attachment for uh, to the uh, Colville tribe on that topic of reintroduction. Again, you have your four attachments um, provided as reference materials. And we have two supplemental reports, uh, one from the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, and the second, a report from the SAS. And that concludes my introduction. Thank you, Robin. Are there any questions of Robin before we get going with our reports? I'm not seeing any, so. Uh, first, I would like to ask uh, Chair Costin to provide the report, Supplemental Tribal Report 1 from the Colville. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Robbie Costin. I'm the chairman for the Colville Confederated Tribes. And I just want to thank you again for allowing me to uh, um, share a few words today. In Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and California, salmon and steelhead are listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. The reasons are primarily habitat loss, overfishing, and climate change. Habitat loss includes hundreds of miles in the Upper Columbia um, with the construction of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams. The Confederated Tribes of the Culloa Reservation requests the support of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council for reintrodu reintroduction of anadromous fish to the largest blocked area for Chinook salmon in the Upper Columbia. We need to restore spawning and rearing habitats for anadromous fish to increase Chinook abundance. 
Before construction of these dams, between 1,000 and 2,000 Native American fishermen regularly used this site. One of the largest sites um, in our area was at Kettle Falls. In July of 1810, David Thompson observed fishing at Salilo Falls, the Dalles, the Cascade Rip Rapids, the mouth of the Sandpoil River, at various locations on the Spokane River and on the Methow River. Later, he wrote that the Kettle Falls had by far the largest population of Indians all heavily dependent upon the salmon. The Upper Columbia historically was a significant part of the Chinook salmon habitat. With the construction of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee dams, this has caused the loss of most of the important um, food resource for the Spokane, the Kalispell, the Kootenai, the Coeur d'Alene, and the 12 tribes of the Confederated Tribes on the Cobble Reservation. Loss of salmon to our tribes was the greatest impact to our traditional way of life. This has resulted in our people experiencing significant social and health um, inequities associated with intergenerational trauma and adver adversity. These tribes have experienced the loss of life, land, cultural identity, and traditional practices, and continue to experience, this, experience these losses today. This loss of our salmon has impacted traditional roles of the tribes and families and of our, and our children's connection to their tribal culture. They're having a positive self-concept, having um, clear goals and spirituality. We need our fish back before our handed down teaching, teachings are completely lost. We need to have our salmon reintroduced to prevent further social cultural risk. Reintroduction of our salmon will mitigate the need for us to reintroduce our traditional practice back to our present and future generations. In January, the New York Times and the States are in January, the New York Times article states of the 14 species of salmon and steelhead trout in Washington state that have been deemed endangered and are protected under the Endangered Species Act, 10 are lagging re recovery goals and five of those are considered at crisis according to the 2020 State of Salmon in Watersheds report. Salmon are our keystone species and the continued degradation of this endangered species will significantly impact many other animal and aquatic species, their associated ecosystems, loss of jobs for both commercial and sports recreational fishing, but for the Cobble Confederated Tribes, um, these impacts are far more devastating. We've lived now with uh, salmon for about uh, 80 years without having this, our fish coming back up into our upper reaches of the, the Columbia. And it's really critical for us at this time that we really need to, you know, have our fish back because we're losing so much. We don't have that intergenerational transmission of our traditional and cultural knowledge from one generation to the next. And it's so important at these, our fishing sites, so those traditional fishing stations all along the Columbia and the sand foil and the other tributaries. You know, th this blockage, you know, it, it's one of the greatest blockages in the, in the Pacific Northwest for Chinook salmon. And, you know, with uh, so much that is occurring, you know, with so much loss of habitat and the impact to other species associated with salmon, it's just really critical for us to really have uh, consideration, you know, of the, the expanding the habitat once again back to the historical reaches um, in the Upper Columbia. So I just wanted to thank you for allowing me to share a few words today and uh, let me know if any of you have any questions. All right, thank you, Chair Costin. Um, are there any questions on the report from Colville Tribe? Uh, Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Rodney Costin, for um, providing uh, this 
uh, report uh, to the council. I recognize that uh, we received uh, information uh, previously, uh, most recent, uh, some discussion on this topic at our September uh, council meeting. Uh, it, it was at that uh, time where one of the uh, areas of interest that I had uh, I requested a response on was uh, in the August 2020 letter to the council as well as in the PowerPoint that was provided to the council at our September meeting on this agenda item. Uh, there was a reference that um, this had the support of the other 14 Columbia Basin tribes. Uh, in response to that, I understood that at least the uh, phase one and uh, the phase two, that that uh, did not have um, the involvement or the support of the other other basin tribes uh, beyond uh, those that uh, you've noted uh, in, in your testimony uh, today to the council, uh, Chairman Justin. So I'd like to provide a, a comment. Um, Hopefully uh, this will be uh, helpful um, for the uh, Cobo Confederate Tribes as well as your partners, as well as that of the council. Uh, so I do know uh, that in the briefing book, we have the uh, attachment one, uh, that is the fish passage and reintroduction into the US and Canadian Upper Columbia Basin uh, document. Uh, so I do want to uh, take note at the outset of the value of uh, this joint informational report on salmon reintroduction that was put forward by the 15 Columbia Basin tribes and the uh, three indigenous uh, nations. Uh, this, this was an impressive report uh, in that so many different sovereigns came together to produce it. It is apparent that your collaboration with the other 14 tribes and three indigenous nations affected by the implementation of the US Canada Columbia River Treaty has provided you with an important platform to bring this effort uh, this far. I want to congratulate you on that success so far. The phase one report outlined substantial opportunity for available spawning habitats that can still be found above Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams. Uh, it appears to me that to have better success with stakeholders and others on advancing this reintroduction effort, reinvigorating the collaboration with the other sovereign nations that initiated this effort with your tribe will be important moving forward into your phase two efforts. I think your presentations uh, now and last fall would have been stronger uh, had you brought other necessary collabor collaborators with you such representatives from the Lower River Treaty Tribes whose reserve rights you know would benefit from this initiative. Having them here with you to speak to those shared benefits going forward will give you a stronger voice uh, through uh, this unity. So importantly, the joint informational report put forward by the tribes and indigenous nations notes the potential benefits to not just in river fisheries, but ocean fisheries as far north as Alaska. With the Lower River Treaty Tribe's expertise in the management of intercepting ocean fisheries under the U.S. Canada Pacific Century, uh, their partnership with you and other nations upriver will be important to the success of your efforts going forward. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair uh, and uh, Rodney Costin, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, provide these uh, comments with respect to uh, what you just provided here to the council, Mr. Costin, and uh, expect um, as we move into uh, council discussion uh, on this uh, draft letter, I may have more to add to that. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, are there any further questions of Chair Costin? All right, thank you. Thank you very much for your report. And Joe, I'm just going to turn back to you. See, could turn back to you and see if there's uh, uh, any further report um, that you have on this agenda item. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do not have any uh, other uh, reports uh, from any of the tribes that I represent on this matter. All right, thanks so much, Joe. Uh, we, we have one advisory body uh, report, that's the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. And uh, is Chair Heap gonna provide that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Member of the Council, before I begin, uh, I'd like to take a moment to wish Mr. Tracy a happy birthday on behalf of the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. We're always gratified that Chuck has another year under his belt after we abused him so badly and <laughs> we're, we wish him a happy birthday. Uh, I'll be a reading from agenda item E2A, the Supplemental SAS Report 1. The Salmon Advisory Subpanel received an update regarding the introduction of salmon in the Upper Columbia River Basin by the Colville Confeder Confederated Tribes during our virtual meeting on March 3rd, 2021. As in our September 2020 report, the SAS remains supportive of the efforts of the Colville Confederated Tribes and recognizes the cultural significance of salmon to these communities. The SAS supports the council's draft letter of support for the project and the council's recognition that the potential impacts of the project should be fully investigated prior to implementation. The SAS looks forward to hearing more about the findings and proposed options as the Colville Confederated Tribes enter phase two of this project and is ready to provide input as requested. That ends our report. All right, thank you, Richard. Are any questions of Richard on the SAS report? Thanks very much, Richard. We have two uh, public comments. Uh, one is uh, Justin Huligard, and the other is Joel Kawahara. So, Justin, please go ahead. I don't see uh, Justin on the attendee list. I, I do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, Patricia mentioned he's not online at this time. Okay. All right, so we will be honored uh, to hear from Joel Kawahara. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear, hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the members of the council. I, um, I served on the uh, Columbia Basin Partnership, and we discussed the uh, reintroduction of salmon uh, above uh, Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee several times uh, with the representatives of the uh, Colville Confederated Tribes of the Colville and uh, the Spokane Tribe. Uh, it, speaking about the report that the Columbia Basin Partnership published, they incorporated the goals for uh, salmon above the uh, those two dams in their report, and those were supported by consensus of the Columbia Basin Partnership. Um, for my, for my personal point of view, I am very encouraged by by this um, by this project. Um, I would note again one of the goals, the non numeric goals of the Columbia Basin Partnership were to promote uh, the social well-being across the Columbia Basin. A, kind of a big project for a salmon project, but um, I hope everybody agrees with me. Having salmon around makes makes for a, a bunch of happy people. So um, in furtherance of that goal, I, I support this project. Um, so I would I would support sending the letter uh, in the comments from uh, Ch Chair Cawson, they talk about uh, maybe in, um, putting a little more positive spin on the letter from the council. And I would encourage the council to consider that. Um, if I may, 
Mr. Chairman, I would characterize the uh, current version of the council letter as a, a bowl of oatmeal, a little bit warm, but uh, it could use a few raisins and a little bit of sugar to maybe make it a little more appealing. Um, those are the extent of my comments, sir, and I would be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thanks for that, Joel. I'll point out that not everybody likes raisins. Are, are there any questions uh, for Joel on his public testimony? Thanks very much, Joel. All right, that uh, concludes public comment and takes us to council discussion and action. And I gather the principal action we have is to consider the draft letter that was, if I remember correctly, attachment four. You all had a chance to look at. So let me uh, look to the board here and who wants to raise their hand to get us started with council discussion. Bush Smith, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would just like to make a comment. Um, uh, Chairman Rodney uh, and I have spent a lot of time uh, together in my former life as the SAS. Um, he's brought a staff that's been absolutely professional in explaining the uh, every step of the way. I, I don't know how many meetings, at least five that I can think of, may, maybe more. Uh, from the beginning of this project. And, and I just want to uh, commend the uh, Colville Tri and, and Chairman Rodney and, and, and his staff on the professionalism and the openness that he has, uh, that he has showed, um, you know, basically the whole step of the way. And I, I just like to thank him. I just like to make sure the council knows um, maybe some of the stuff they didn't see at the council table uh, that Rodney was doing excuse me, Chairman Rodney was doing behind the, uh, behind the scenes to inform and, and educate uh, the SAS and others. So I'd just like to thank that, show my appreciation and, and make that statement. And so thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Butch. All right, further discussion. Uh, does someone want to uh, take a stab and propose uh, what the council shall do with the draft letter that is in there at Kyle Attucks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In standard form, I was trying to raise my hand and a message notification popped up and I couldn't get it up. Um, I, I don't have a path forward to propose necessarily. I just wanted to um, thank Chairman Costin again for um, coming before the council and testifying. Um, when we discussed this last fall, I told the council that WDFW was very supportive and a partner in the efforts um, that he's been coming to the council talking about, recognize that the council um, may or may not be in the position to provide a letter of support and it may or may not be a, a strong letter of support. I didn't offer any edits as the, the draft letter was circulated. I, I didn't know um, what to put in it to, to try to make it a little stronger. Appreciate that um, Chairman Costin um, offered a couple of ideas for things that the council could consider if they were going to alter the draft and and wind up sending it. And one of those was just kind of a, um, he suggested that we directly address the need for feasibility testing with experimental releases. So kind of said, yes, the, this next phase is an important step as, as they move through the, the four phase process. So just wanted to point that out to the council as something to consider as we decide how to move forward. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Joe Oatman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, uh, we uh, took a look at the uh, draft letter that has been uh, prepared uh, for the council's uh, consideration. Uh, so that um, being the uh, attachment for, uh, based upon uh, you know this review and the uh, comments that I just provided uh, a few moments ago. Um, we've also looked at the uh, February 22nd uh, letter from um, the 
Covels. So the uh, supplemental travel report one with the uh, suggested uh, additions uh, to the letter that, that they want us to uh, consider uh, adding in. And based upon that, the comment that uh, I just provided, um, you know, I think that the uh, draft letter that has been developed uh, by council staff uh, supports, um, you know, their efforts uh, at this uh, time, um, perhaps along the lines of what uh, Kyle just mentioned, you know, whether there was any uh, you know, opportunity to um, you know, provide any, you know, edits or suggested changes to the letter. Um, having given that uh, a, a lot of thought, as uh, I you know, too was uh, uncertain as to uh, that uh, prospect. Um, so, if we did take additional time to, uh, you know, review and, and potentially, uh, you know, make changes to the letter. Um, I would think we'd want to add in some elements uh, of my comment um, that I made uh, to help bolster the uh, collaborative nature of this effort as, as it uh, uh, goes forward. So I, I made note that uh, you know the uh, uh, the Columbia Basin tribes who were involved in that effort early on um, in developing. Uh, the uh, the um, joint uh, report, so that attachment one for this agenda. Um, you know the the tribes that I'm affiliated with, affiliated with uh, the Clum River Treaty tribes. Um, you know were involved in that, uh, did support that, um, but uh, eventually, um, uh, as uh, the Goals, uh proceeded uh, with uh, phase one and now to phase two, um, uh, they haven't been uh, involved and, and have not otherwise provided, uh, you know, their uh, policy support to that. And so I think uh, where I think I am on this is uh, if a letter were to be uh, considered and uh, approved by the council, uh, I think I would uh, probably feel uh, comfortable enough with the uh, current uh, draft of that. Um, I do not feel comfortable with, with uh, adding in uh, some of the suggestions that are uh, provided to us through their uh, February uh, letter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and council. All right, thank you, Joe. I think one challenge we have is it's very difficult to wordsmith a letter um, during council action and to to bring back a letter and uh, later for final approval we'll of course use more floor time that we don't um, really have in this meeting or maybe not even in April so um, let me ask if uh, Chuck Tracy is available, if he has a suggestion on a path forward here. Uh, I'm available. I'm not sure I've got a, uh, a, a good suggestion right off the top of my head. Um, I, I, you know, I, I guess the way we've handled sort of uh, these sorts of things in the past is, uh, you know, if there's some, uh, some, uh, fairly straightforward guidance the council can give staff uh, that we could use to work between now and say um, uh, workload planning or uh, something like that. Um, we could consider, uh, you know, approval of the letter at, at that time, uh, or we could just leave this, I guess we, the other option, we could just leave this agenda item open and, uh, and uh, pick it back up after there's been some additional uh, the uh, work done by staff uh, based on whatever guidance the council is uh, willing to give here. All right, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, uh, first I'd echo the thanks to um, Chairman Croston for bringing uh, this forward to us and his uh, perseverance. Uh, 
in, in raising this topic to the council's attention. Um, and, you know, as, as uh, Joe Holtman said, there, there's a lot of different um, uh, government ent governmental entities, including tr multiple tribes uh, that are interested in this. And I think the, you know, the overall thrust of the, the letter, the way it was drafted, um, to me is, uh, is kind of hits the sweet spot from my perspective. And then it acknowledges that this is a very, very important um, project, that it's important to, to fully vet and look at all of the aspects of reintroduction and what that means and how to do it. Um, and ensuring that they're promoting healthy salmon runs, and um, it it talks about the broad stakeholder community um, that has supported uh, the Upper Columbia Basin. Um, you know, so from my I, we could I suppose uh, spend time trying to strengthen the letter a bit, but you know this this is a long term project. Um, I'm anxious to to follow it. Um, um, I'm anxious to, I'm, I'm hoping that, that it will be successful. And I think we're saying that in this letter, uh, but, but at the same time, there's a lot of work, uh, yet to be done in terms of the investigations to help, you know, inform, as the letter says, inform the process of rebuilding and restoring salmon stock. So, um, it offers support for moving forward. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it uh, leaves open, you know, our interest in being kept apprised of it. Um, there will be additional opportunities in the future for this council to weigh in on this and offer stronger support, um, uh, probably multiple times. Um, and so uh, I guess I am supportive of the letter the way it is written, understanding um, you know, that there are those who might want it to be a bit stronger, but I think it's a good place for us to start in it, and it uh, expresses our general interest in support of moving forward. So that's what I would say. Thanks for that. I think you raise a good point. There'll be many more bites at this apple as time goes on. Um, so let me just ask uh, the council if there is anyone who has strong feelings about the need to revise the letter. Uh, is there anyone who objects to sending the letter as drafted? And I'm looking for hands here. And I'm not seeing any hands. So it seems that... Um, we're content with the letter as it is drafted for now, uh, although there may be interest in future letters if we're asked to perhaps, uh, you know, adopt a different tone or, or whatever seems appropriate at the time. Um, let me ask if the council has any further discussion on this agenda item with regard to the letter or anything else. All right, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to turn to Robin, and hopefully Robin has some good news for us on this agenda item. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, it sounds like the council has had a, a good discussion and has um, agreed to send a letter, and that that letter would be reflected as is in attachment four. And um, if that is uh, indeed the council's wish, then we have uh, concluded the work under this agenda item E2. All right, thank you very much, Robin. <clears throat> but please don't go too far away because <laughs> as we complete agenda item E2, we have our last agenda item of the day, which is a biggie, agenda item E3, which is review of 2020 fisheries and the summary of the 2021 stock forecasts so, Robin, I pass the baton to you. 
All right. Well, thank you again, Chair Gorelnik. Again, this is agenda item E3, where the council will review the 2020 fisheries and the summary of the 2021 stock forecasts. So each year, the council does review the stock assessment and fishery evaluation or SAFE document. And we always just call it the review document of the ocean salmon fisheries. And then also the stock abundance projections that are found in pre-season report one. The stock status of the Non-Endangered Species Act listed and non-hatchery stocks are evaluated in the SAFE document relative to the status determination or criteria or the SDC for overfishing, overfished, not overfished, rebuilding, and rebuilt. These stocks are initially evaluated during the SDC in the preseason report one for being at risk of approaching an overfished condition based on the current forecast in last year's preseason structure. The evaluation is then updated in preseason report three once the upcoming salmon seasons are determined. There are three stocks that are required to have annual catch limits or ACL specified. It's the Sacramento Fall Chinook, which is an indicator stock for the Central Valley Fall Chinook Complex. The Klamath River Fall Chinook, which is an indicator stock for the Southern Oregon, Northern California Chinook Complex, and the Willapa Bay Natural Coho. The ACLs are equivalent to the acceptable biological catch and are specified based on formulas described in the Salmon Fishery Management Plan, which is provided under E3 Attachment 1, an excerpt of it at least, and then the abundance forecasts that are found in Preseason Report 1. Preseason Report 1 also contains an analysis of the 2020 regulations on the projected 2021 abundance for coho and some Chinook stocks. And this out analysis is intended to provide perspective on how fisheries might need to be modified in 2021 to accommodate the new abundance forecasts. The salmon technical team will review the results of the SAFE document for 2020, the stock abundance projections for ACLs for 2021, and stock status determinations. The scientific and statistical committee will review the forecast and determine if they represent the best scientific information available for use in modeling 2021 ocean salmon fisheries, specifying ABCs and setting ACLs. So your council action under this agenda item is to adopt the 2021 stock abundance forecasts, ABCs and ACLs, and take any action relative to stock status determinations as necessary. For your reference materials, uh, you do have available electronically the review of the 2020 ocean salmon fisheries and also the supplemental preseason report one. And in addition, we have a attachment one, which is an excerpt from chapter three of the FMP. And for supplemental items, we also have a tribal report uh, from the West, it's a joint report from the Western Washington Treaty Tribes and another tribal report from the Quinault Indian Nation uh, looking at precautionary management <laughs> needed for the preseason planning and of course your uh, STT report that's going to provide uh, a summary of the information in both the review document and preseason preseason report one. So that wraps up my uh, overview on this agenda item. Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Robin. Are there any questions of Robin uh, before we get started with our reports? All right, so first up is the salmon technical team. And uh, if Dr. O'Farrell is available, he may get started. And it looks like you're muted. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, apologies for that. Um, on behalf of the salmon technical team, I'll be providing uh, brief overviews of the review of 2020 ocean salmon fisheries and Preseason Report 1, 
And as uh, Robin just mentioned, um, it may be helpful for council members to refer to agenda item E3A, Supplemental SCT Report 1, which includes excerpts of the review and uh, preseason Report 1. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm uh, going to get started here on the review. In Chapter 1 um, in the Coastwide Ocean Fishery Summary, uh, we include a section on COVID-19 effects on salmon fisheries and data collection. Um, I uh, just would like to point this out to you. It's a relatively short section at the beginning, um, I, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about it uh, to the degree that I can. But I just uh, point it out to you because this is an unusual uh, situation, obviously, for a section in the review. So I point out that that is a, a in early in Chapter 1 of the review. With regard to catches uh, in 2020, Council area commercial and recreational um, catches of Chinook and Coho were well below the previous year. Um, this is the case in all three states and uh, in the treaty troll fishery. Um, Chinook quotas were not met uh, with the exception of the Klamath, uh, Oregon KMZ uh, troll fishery quota um, in July. And Coho quota attainment was mixed. And uh, with regards to quota, quota attainment, you can um, find um, information about that in Table 1-6. Uh, Chapter 2 of the review uh, discusses uh, Chinook escapement or salmon es escapement and stock status. Um, with regard to Chinook, um, I'm happy to report that Sacramento River Fall Chinook meet the criteria for rebuilt status based on uh, the last three years of escapement. However, Klamath River Fall Chinook remains uh, overfished. There are no new overfished Chinook stocks, and there are uh, no instances of overfishing for Chinook. And this information can be found in Table 2 6. With regard to coho, um, Queets and um, Strait of Juan de Fuca natural coho remain overfished. While Snohomish natural uh, coho meets the criteria for not overfished rebuilding, and for these uh, for the coho stocks, there are no recent instances of overfishing. I guess I would pause there. Um, that is a very quick overview of a very large uh, report, and um, I don't know if um, we would like to have questions at the end, or I'll just take a pause and see what the, the council would like. All right, well, uh, are there any questions thus far on um, the STT report? You're not waiving your right to uh, ask them later if you want to hold off on your questions. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands, so please continue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, moving on to preseason report one. Um, can you pause a moment? Uh, Phil, Phil had his hand up. Uh, Phil? Well, um, thanks, Mr. Chair. You know, this um, this document that Dr. Farrell just referenced, our review document, is um, one of the most comprehensive documents and compilations of data um, that I know of. It is, uh, it is where I, when I, it's where I generally go if I'm looking for something and I don't always know that it's in there, but if I look long enough, I can usually find it. And it's real easy to, to, uh, um, uh, well, you know, we're, we're on a tight schedule and, and, uh, appreciate Dr. Farrell's efforts to summarize it and all that stuff. And, and, uh, not suggesting that we do anything else, but just to acknowledge the amount of work and effort that goes into, the preparation of this document it allows us to to look back and see how we did it allows us to look for places where we need to improve um, and i just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the um, stt and everybody that um, contributes to putting this document together and and they do it in a really short time frame too in terms of when the 20 or the previous year's data comes in and making sure that these tables are just as complete as possible. So just a, a recognition of that, of, of how important this document is and the 
work that goes into it and how useful it is to the council in our process. All right. Thanks, Phil. Any other uh, comments or questions at this point in the STT report? All right, uh, Susan Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a question following up on the highlight that Mike gave about the uh, challenges with regard to sampling during COVID. You know, folks recall last March and April, the states did a, a huge amount of work in pulling together a report that sort of outlined contingency planning and looking forward to the, to the possibilities, even though we didn't know what was coming. Um, and so I was just going to ask the, the, the state of Washington, California, Oregon, um, uh, what they thought, uh, you know, if they had something to add with regard to the impacts of those challenges and the reductions in sampling um, and kind of what is the outlook, what is the outlook for 2021? Susan, would you mind if we held off on that until council discussion? Um, was, was that, I mean, I, I understood that question to be for the states and not for Mike. Did I misunderstand that? Uh, true, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So let's, let's, we'll get to that in, in council discussion, I think. That's all right. Sure. So we'll, we'll start off with that one, council discussion. How's that? Thank you. All right. Um, Mike, please continue with, with your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, We'll be moving on to uh, preseason report one now. Um, preseason report one um, in 2021 is, is dedicated to Doug Millward and uh, we have a, an acknowledgement at, in the acknowledgement section right at the beginning of, of the report and I'm gonna read it here. Shaman technical team dedicates the 2021 preseason report one to Doug Millward. In his 21 years as a member of the STT, Doug was a leader, a mentor, an inspiration, and a loyal friend. He championed both the resource and the fisheries, freely sharing his expansive knowledge. He worked and lived with passion and deep commitment. Doug, you are forever, you, you forever shaped the STT and are always in our hearts. So, um, everyone to Doug. Beginning part of pre one, um, we uh, reiterated a STT concern or recommendation from the previous year. Um, I will also read this as I um, have done in the past. Uh, in the 2020 preseason report one document, the STT included a concern regarding the potential overrepresentation of Columbia River summer Chinook stock within the Chinook fishery regulation assessment model or FRAM as it's been identified during the 2019 salmon methodology review process. In the absence of a formal resolution to this issue in the form of an updated Chinook Fram base period calibration, an interim solution was implemented during the 2020 preseason planning process. As of the writing of this report, it is still unclear whether a new Chinook Fram base period calibration that addresses this issue will be implemented. If the 2021 preseason planning process proceeds without the use of this new base period calibration, the STT recommends using the same interim resolution in 2021 that was implemented during the 2020 planning process. I'll just add that um, since we uh, wrote this STT recommendation for preseason report one, there, there appears to be a resolution to this issue that is consistent with um, the STT recommendation here. Okay, moving on. Um, in preseason report one, we also have a section on COVID-19, and this uh, particular was on technical challenges arising from the pandemic. Um, the um, focus of it here mostly was um, on filling some sampling gaps in early season uh, salmon fisheries in California. Um, there are um, some that are some level of detail uh, in in the full. Um, in the full uh, write-up in pre one and also for Washington, there's some information about um, uh, monitoring uh, that uh, was either curtailed or um, or not able to be done at all. Um, and I, so I just uh, 
requested you take a look at that to see um, what uh, transpired uh, as a result of COVID-19. Moving on to chapter one, um, table 1-1 as a summary of Chinook salmon forecast. Um, the forecast for Sacramento River Fall Chinook is down relative to the previous year, as well as for Klamath River Fall Chinook, although to a smaller amount. And the forecast for Winter Chinook, Sacramento River Winter Chinook is up. Columbia River stock abundances are generally similar to or greater than uh, the previous year. Uh, Washington coastal stocks are generally similar to last year as well. And uh, there's a mixture of um, from Puget, Puget Sound relative to um, 2020. Table 1-2 is a summary of coho forecasts. Um, there is a, a very large OPI forecast for this year. And uh, LCN and OCN forecasts are up as well. Um, Washington coastal natural forecasts are lower than in prior years, with the exception of uh, Willapa. The Queets natural forecast is um, below the escapement uh, range. Puget Sound forecasts are mixed. Um, the total Puget Sound forecast is up for both uh, natural and hatchery origin fish. In Chapter 2, um, <clears throat> we present our Chinook assessment. Description of forecast, computation uh, details of the ABC, ACL, and OFL for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook, as well as evaluation of forecast performance. Um, in Chapter 3, uh, we do the same for COHO, um, the ACL, ABC, OFL um, for Willapot. And with regard to this, I, I need to correct an error um, in preseason report one. Uh, in the computation of the OFL and ABC for Willapa Bay Co. Uh, there was a typo in the abundance value using the equations for the OFL and ABC. Um, so this occurs on page 54, section 3.2.1.4, second paragraph. The equation describing the computation of the OFL should read SOFL equals 36,908 times 1 minus 0.74 equals 9596. Additionally, the equation describing the computation of the ABC should read SABC equals 36,908 times 1 minus 0.7 equals 11,072. So, to summarize here, the OFL and ABC values in the text and tables are correct. Um, they do not change. The only mistake was uh, was a typo in the equation um, with regard to the abundance level. So just a typo, uh, the number that occurs in the reports is 32,868, but it should, should be 36,908. Just wanted to put that in the record. Um, there's no confusion. Um, moving on to chapter four, um, it is an odd number of years. So um, we have the pink salmon forecasts. Uh, forecasts for Puget Sound and Fraser uh, pinks are below average. Moving on to chapter five. Um, <clears throat> chapter five details the analysis of the no action alternative, which is 2020 regulations with 2021 forecasted abundances. Um, you can find this in Table 5-4. Uh, Sacramento Fall Chinook and Winter Chinook are projected to meet their objectives in the report. Klamath River Fall Chinook is projected to not meet their objective. Um, California Coastal Chinook is projected to meet objectives, their, obje their objective. Um, Columbia River Chinook are projected to meet their objectives. Oregon Coastal Oregon Coast Coho stocks are projected to meet their objectives, and uh, Puget Sound Coho are also expected to meet their FMP objectives. Some stocks on the Washington coast, uh, Queets, Ho, and Quilu, would, uh, are projected to not meet their objectives. And uh, Klamath, Fall Chinook, Queets River Coho, Strait of Juan de Fuca Coho, and Hood Canal Coho are at risk of approaching an overfished condition. Now, just point out that uh, Klamath 
Cuits and Strait of Juan de Fuca are already overfished, um, and but they still meet the technical definition of approaching an overfished condition. Whereas Hood Canal has not been declared overfished, yet is at risk of approaching an overfished condition at this time. Um, point out that Table 5-5 <clears throat> includes ABC, ACL, OFL, and escapement information. And preliminarily, every, uh, or in this report, escapement has exceeded its postseason ACLs um, in each year. So um, that is for salmon, means that they're in compliance. And that concludes a um, short presentation of preseason report one. I do have a few additional remarks to make about some potential changes um, that came out uh, after preseason report one, to potential changes to um, data use within some of the harvest models used for preseason planning. But I'll take a pause here to see um, what the wishes of the council are. All right, uh, let's see if there are any questions on preseason one. I am not seeing any hands. So uh, I know you have some important things to say now. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you. Um, okay, um, the ocean harvest rates for Klamath River Fall Chinook and Sacramento River Fall Chinook have been underpredicted for several years in a row. Uh, we have noticed this. Uh, we've been monitoring it, and uh, when we got the results from preseason report one um, and the postseason estimates from 2020, um, it was clear that um, we uh, needed to do something here. Um, we looked into uh, the causes of it, and it doesn't appear that. Um, the underprediction of the exploitation rates is due to an underprediction of effort. It, uh, it appears that the cause tends to be, uh, or the cause is likely the underprediction of contact or harvest rates per unit of effort. And um, to address this, the STT proposes a shorten the data range used to forecast contact rates per unit effort and harvest rates per unit effort in the KOHM and the SHM, uh, respectively. Um, currently, the data used to forecast the contact rates and harvest rates per unit effort, um, they differ a little bit by area and by um, stock, but in many cases, um, we use data from 1983 forward or 2003 forward. Um, but there has been a notable increase in these contact rates per unit effort um, in recent years, and it's, it's not just a um, very recent thing. It's something that has been gradually increasing for quite some time. And based on an uh, analysis that um, we've done uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we found that um, we improved the performance, uh, hindcasted performance of the harvest models in terms of um, getting harvest rate projections that are uh, closer to the postseason estimates. Um, when we restrict the data used to forecast these contact or harvest rates per unit effort for Klamath River Fall Chinook, from 2003 forward, and for um, the Sacramento Harvest Model, 2014 forward. Uh, when we implement this change uh, in the harvest models and evaluate the 2020 fisheries of 2021 abundance, the result is substantially higher predicted ocean harvest rates re relative to the status quo. Um, we will be uh, Developing, the we meaning the STT will be developing a an appendix for preseason report two, describing the work that was done here and um, and our recommended change to the harvest models. And we briefed the SSC on this yesterday and had an extended conversation about this topic uh, with the SAS as well. And that concludes my statement. Um, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Dr. O'Farrell? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, uh, Mike, for your report. I had a question. This is on preseason report one. It's on page 95, which is chapter five, table 
Um, and my question had to do with um, just the, um, well, maybe take Grace Harbor as an example there, where it lists the uh, ocean escapement and the exploitation rate um, for the 2020 abundance forecast. And then looking across there, looking at the 2021 abundance forecast, um it has a exploitation rate of 30.1%. Um and I'm wondering is that exploitation rate is that for ocean fisheries or is that uh for both ocean and and terminal area fisheries? Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um I don't, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. I will um, look to other members of the FTT if they could better answer your question. Um, otherwise, I would have to get back to you. Okay, um, that's fine. I, I can uh, I can certainly ask uh, uh, Wendy, the FTT member from Washington. Um, that question, I'll, I'm sure I'll be talking with her later today or tomorrow. Okay. Uh, further questions of the SDT? Uh, I have one question. Um, Mike, the, the time series for the uh, Klamath Open Ocean Harvest Model and the Sacramento Ocean Harvest Model differ by one year. Was that strictly an empirical process to determine the, you know, the number of years, seven or eight, uh, to be used in each of those models? So yes, Mr. Chairman, it, it was purely an empirical process. Uh, the process that we undertook was to do one year ahead forecasts of the exploitation rates, at, or I should say the ocean harvest rates, and to see how well they matched up with the postseason estimates. And it just turned out that um, different data ranges for those two stocks was, um, had the best performance. All right, thanks for that. Anything further of the salmon technical team? I'm not seeing any hands, uh, so thank you very much, Mike. We'll now hear from the Science and Statistical Committee, uh, Dr. Galen Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Galen Johnson of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and uh, Chair of the SSC, and I'll be reading our Supplemental SSC Report 1. The Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed the review of 2020 ocean salmon fisheries and preseason report one for 2021. Dr. Michael O'Farrell of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and STT chair provided a brief summary of the reports and members of the STT were available to answer questions. The SSC received preseason report one less than one day before the SSC meeting and a full review of the document was not possible. The SSC appreciates the work of the STT in compiling the reports and notes the addition of a section briefly describing the impact of COVID-19 in the beginning of each report. Impacts of the pandemic were widespread on both fisheries and data collection. For data collection, impacts ranged from reduced commercial and recreational fisheries sampling in California to a loss of coho smolt out migration sampling from some rivers in Washington state. The council is tasked with specifying annual catch limits or ACLs for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and an indicator stock for Central Valley Fall Chinook Complex, Klamath River Fall Chinook, an indicator stock for the Southern Oregon Northern California Chinook Complex, and Willapa Bay Coho. Preseason Report 1 presents ACLs for these three stocks in Table 5-4. The forecasts for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook are derived from forecast models that have been reviewed and approved by the SSC in previous years, although new methods were required to impute small amounts of input data that were missing due to sampling challenges posed by COVID-19. 
The Willapa Bay coho forecast for 2021 was derived from a model endorsed by the SSC for one-time use in 2020 due to insufficient time to address issues raised during the 2020 review. The SSC recommends completing the 2020 review of the Willapa Bay coho forecast as a salmon methodology review topic for this year. The SSC found the calculations of the ABCs and corresponding ACLs correct based on the forecast and um, um, that's based on the actual forecast, not the typo forecast that Dr. O'Farrell mentioned. Due to insufficient time to review the materials, the SSC neither endorses nor rejects the forecasts as the best available or the best scientific information available for 2021 management um, to set ABCs. Five salmon stocks had rebuilding plans adopted in 2019. We briefly summarized the current status of each. For the Sacramento River Fall Chinook, the three-year geometric mean abundance of hatchery and natural spawning adults is 133,549, which exceeds the minimum stock size threshold of 91,500 and the stock size of maximum sustainable yield of 122,000. So the stock meets the criteria for rebuilt status. For Klamath River Fall Chinook, the three-year geometric mean natural area spawning abundance is 30,167, which is below the MSST of 30,525. The stock meets the criteria for overfished status. For Queef River Coho, the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 2,395, which is below the MSST of 4,350. The stock also meets the criteria for overfished status. For Juan de Fuca Coho, the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 5,391, which is below the MSST of 7,000. So this stock meets the criteria for overfished status. For Snohomish River Coho, the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 48,385, which is above the MSST of 31,000, but below the MSY of 50,000. So the stock meets the criteria for not overfished rebuilding status. While none of the stocks were determined to be subject to overfishing, we note that exploitation rates for stocks other than Sacramento River Fall Chinook, Klamath River Fall Chinook, and Oregon Coast Coho did not have estimated exploitation rates for 2020. However, preliminary analyses do not suggest that harvest rates exceeded the maximum fishing mortality threshold. Klamath River Fall Chinook, along with Queets, Strait of Juan de Fuca, and Hood Canal Natural Coho meet the criteria for being at risk of approaching an overfished condition. In addition to the above stocks for Ho and Skagit Coho, the spawning escapements for 2018 and 2019 were below MSST or SMSY, but data for 2020 are not yet available. For Chinook stocks, the Southern Oregon, Quileute Spring Summer, Ho Spring Summer, and Gray's Harbor Spring all had three-year geometric mean escapements from 2018 to 2020 that were between MSST and SMSY. The SSC notes that disruptions due to the COVID-19 pandemic to data streams should logically lead to an increased uncertainty in abundances, harvest rates, and forecasts. However, all of the results presented in preseason report one are point estimates and associated uncertainties are unquantified or they were quantified but not reported. This has the unfortunate consequence of creating the illusion that forecasts for 2021 are as precise as previous years when they are not. Therefore, the SSC reiterates its strong recommendation that PFMC salmon reports provide and incorporate appropriate measures of uncertainty as is currently done for ground fish, coastal pelagic species, and highly migratory species. The SSC discussed forecasting methodologies used for salmon, for salmon stocks in preseason report one and noted that it is unclear if and how forecasting methodologies have changed from previous years. The SSC recommends that the STT develop a database or appendix for their report where changes to forecasting methodologies for each stock can be described and archived. And finally, in reviewing the salmon fishery management plan, um, the SSC identified two issues relevant to the status determination criteria. One, the FMP indicates that the intent of fisheries management in California is to maximize natural production, but the Sacramento River Fall Chinook escapement goal is for combined hatchery and natural returns. Two, North Lewis River Fall Chinook is listed under the Endangered Species Act, but nevertheless has an MFMT specified. 
that present exploitation rate calculations are not presented for this stock, so there is nothing to compare against the MFMT. The SSC would like guidance to determine if that should be included. And that completes our statement, and I am available for questions if needed. All right, thank you very much, Galen. Are there questions on the SSC report? All right, thank you very much, Galen. And I believe there is a travel report, and I will turn to uh, Joe Oatman for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have uh, three supplemental travel reports in the briefing book. Uh, the report one uh, deals with a joint testimony from the Western Washington Treaty Tribes on the forecast. Report two is the testimony of the Kanoa Indian Nation, a precautionary management vehicle for peace and planning. And the third one, or report three, is the uh, Hoopa Valley Tribe comments on the review of the 2020 fisheries and summary of 2021 stock forecast. And so I think I will go ahead and take those in order, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I do want to note um, that I will be reading into the uh, record the uh, report one, the joint testimony of the Western Washington tribes. And I am uh, um, referring uh, the council to the report two, the testimony of the Kuno Indian Nation. Uh, however, I, I will not be uh, reading uh, uh, that document. Okay. So it will be there for uh, reference uh, for the Council. And then after I complete uh, reading the Report 1, um, I would like to call up Mike Orca uh, from the Hoopa Valley Tribe to uh, provide the Report 3 to the Council. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that, I will go ahead and proceed. Uh, so I will be uh, reading from the agenda item E3A, the Supplemental Travel Report 1. This is the joint testimony from the Western Washington Treaty Tribes on the forecast performance for Hatchery Coho in the Oregon Production Index area. The Western Washington Treaty Tribes are concerned with the recent for forecast performance for the Oregon production in the area hatchery, which is largely composed of Columbia River early and late coho hatchery stocks. Since 2015, there has been an over forecast in five out of the last six years. Uh, here references uh, figure one, which is uh, on page two of this document. In two of those years, uh, in 2015 and 2019, the preseason estimate was more than three times higher than the postseason return. Uh, this is a difference of more than 500,000 coho in each year. For example, in 2015, the preseason abundance prediction was uh, 808,400 coho compared to the postseason estimate of 251,700 coho. This is from the uh, PFMC preseason report one. In 2019, the preseason abundance prediction was 933,000 coho compared to the postseason estimate of 300,500 coho. Again, from the preseason report one. The scale of these overestimates affects North of Falcon preseason mopping efforts. Salmon run forecasts are used during preseason planning to determine ocean. Uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty uh, Management Unit status categories and corresponding exploitation rate ranges. When a large stock aggregate, such as the Oregon Production Index Hatchery, returns at lower than forecast abundances, it affects the exploitation rates of coal migrating stocks. In Washington, the tribes are most concerned with pre terminal or ocean impacts on Queets, Snohomish, and Strait of Juan de Fuca natural coho stocks. In 2018, the National Marine Fishery Service declared these stocks overfished and they are currently under rebuilding plans. This management response was triggered as a result of low escapement in 2015. Internationally, the U.S. has an obligation to meet the provisions 
Indians of the Southern Coho Measurement Plan, adopted by the Pacific Salmon Commission. In 2019, southern U.S. fisheries exceeded the allowable exportation rates associated with multiple post-season abundance categories, including the U.S. Interior Fraser cat. Uh, the exportation rate was 13.3 percent. Uh, the the cap uh, was 10 percent. The Pacific Salmon Treaty post-season co-analysis. Uh, Reference lower than forecasted abundances for the Columbia River early and late hatchery stocks as a likely factor in the overage, in addition to environmental variables. The 2021 uh, Oregon uh, Production Index hatchery forecast is 1,607,900. A return this high hasn't been seen in over 20 years. Alternatively, the 2021 forecast for Washington Coast natural coho stocks, both in the Coho and Queens River, are the lowest preseason estimate since 2016. If the Columbia River early and late hatchery coho returns do not meet expectations, then planned ocean fisheries would have a higher impact on natural stocks. This could exacerbate the natural coho issues mentioned in this statement and result in unforeseen consequences. We urge a precautionary management approach when developing 2021 coho fisheries. We also recommend uh, the council council discussion regarding the potential for the Oregon Production Index Hatchery methodology review with the Oregon Production Index technical team over the next year. The scale of the uh, Oregon Production Index Hatchery over forecast in recent years is concerning, and we believe it merits investigation. Uh, lastly, uh, there is the uh, figure one that provides information on the preliminary preseason and postseason coho stock abundance estimates for the Oregon Production Index Area Hatchery. Uh, we also include the uh, reference to the preseason report one. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, uh, that concludes uh, this uh, uh, presentation of the supplementary trial report one. All right. Let me see uh, before we move on to the next report. Let's uh, see if there are any questions. Going around the table, I'm not seeing any hands. So I. Uh, we have one more tribal report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, the tribal report two uh, that is provided um, by reference to the council. Uh, council can uh, read that uh, as they may. Um, so the uh, last um, tribal report will be uh, from the Hoopa Valley tribe. And I believe Mike Orcutt uh, is uh, the, the individual who will be uh, delivering that to the council. And if I may, um, I'd like to invite Mike Orca to do so. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me. Loud and clear. Great. Um, one of my goals today was um, last year I missed and we tried to get on several times and uh, my staff got on the call, but I was not able to. And one of my goals for today is to um, make sure my um, revamp um, upgraded system is working and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to the council. Um, I've been around the salmon advisory sub panel. I served on that early in my career. I've been on the habitat committee as well and took some interest in uh, the report on the Klamath uh, situation with the dam removal there. But that's not talk not the topic today. Um, so um, for the record, um, my name is Michael Orkut. I'm the fisheries department director for the Hoopa Valley tribe. Served in that capacity for many, many years, represented the tribe on a lot of different forums. Appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony today. And um, one of the, we, we, for the record as well, we have submitted written testimony. So if I get something wrong or if it's not quite the way it's written, um, I'll 
rely upon accuracy of the report um, if that's okay with the council. Um, what I wanted to reflect upon is um, the dire situation um, of the Klamath River Fall Chinook. I believe the earlier report by Susan Bishop uh, noted that there's a number of um, petitions, including uh, Klamath Trinity Spring Chinook that's still under status review. Uh, Fall Chinook and the Klamath system have been periodically uh, petitioned as well. And um, would note that, um, you know, we've, we've seen a roller coaster and sort of a boom and bust in the system where in 2012, there was record abundance um, predicted and uh, somewhat realized in 2012. But by 2017, uh, there was a major reduction and probably the lowest um, predicted and very, very minimal, um, I guess you would call them de minimis opportunities, um, including for the tribal interest. And so what that resulted in as a council, if anybody that's been on the council was there in 2017, would understand that in that year, there was 814,000, excuse me, strike that 814 adult Klamath River Fall Chinook available for harvest by over close to um, 10,000 tribal members. Uh, there's over 6,000 in the Iraq reservation below our reservation and there's about 3,500 enrolled Hoopa Valley tribal members. And what I wanted to reflect upon there is um, in 2017 um, there were major concerns I believe um, there were tribes submitted letters to the council, to NOAA Fisheries, and I vividly recall being there in Santa Rosa and representing the tribe with our chairman at the time. And we were ran through the ringer a lot that year because Hoopod, um, in that year, um, we, 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 um, in, 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 in retrospect, um, after the, the se season was over, though, was that we had taken around, of the 814 fish, our share of it was 160. In that year, we harvested about 1,600 adult fall chinook salmon. And we went through a lot of scrutiny. We went to a bunch of meetings with the Department of Interior, with NOAA Fisheries, and the question at the time was, what are you guys going to do in 2018? What we said is we're going to manage our fisheries uh, responsibly. But in the end of it all, uh, when the final numbers came in, the ocean harvest in non-tribal fisheries was nearly the same as what the tribal take was of the 1600. So I, I've asked I'm not sure Barry Tom's on the call, maybe Susan or whoever's representing NOAA Fisheries. I've asked for some at least acknowledgement that um, the concern and scrutiny that was placed upon the tribe um, almost warrants a, uh, an apology in my opinion, but that's not ever been offered. So as you turn to my concern here in 2021 is that in other fisheries that impact uh, Klamath River Fall Chinook, specifically the non-tribal uh, in-river sport fishery, you will note in the um, mega tables that there was substantial overharvest in the sport fishery. And one of the reasons for that, as my understanding is that the California Fishing Game Commission that sets the in-river regulations changed the um, the um, total length for the, the break off between uh, grills or jacks and the adults. And that further exacerbated the problem. There was both over harvest directly, but in addition, because of the change in the commission um, regulations to, I think it was from 22 inches total length to 23 inches. Um, there was an additional impact there. And I guess in, what we're asking for consideration of is as another co-manager of the state of California that my, my understanding is we've participated in all the data collection, the stock reviews, the stock projections over the years. And my understanding of sort of the, the protocols have been is post-season, they, they set a number, it's 22 inches total length. 
And then postseason, based upon the coated wire tags and the age composition data that comes in from the, the sampled fisheries, there's a modification and it has some effect on the breakoff of that adult grills number. But when they raised the number, um, it increased the, the, the harvest of, um, they were harvested as, uh, as grills, but in fact, they were three-year-old fish. So our concern there and our request is for the Fish and Game Commission to reconsider that and take a more risk adverse approach and reset it at the 22 inch uh, total length. Um, and so that, again, the, the, to the outcome there we're looking for is at the end of the year that um, we're closer to what our expectations are in terms of harvest and harvest related impacts. So with that, um, Joe and, and members of the council, I appreciate the opportunity to address you. I'd be glad to answer any question there that you might have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Are there any questions of the Hoopa Valley Tribal Report? Thanks very much, Mike. I'm not seeing any Thank hands. Thank you. All right. I, I believe that completes all of the reports that I have. Let me double check that. Yes, I don't see an SAS report here. So that takes us, uh, the completion of reports take us to public comment. Um, I don't believe there are any signups. So that concludes public comment. And that will take us to council discussion. And um, I'm first going to call on Susan Bishop because she had a, a question she wanted to raise about sampling. Uh, during COVID. So Susan, if you're ready with your question. Okay, I'm not hearing Susan. So let's see who wants to go. Any discussion on this agenda item? I know it's the beginning of a long week. Uh, Kyle Annex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think I understood as Ms. Bishop started to ask her question what the question was. So maybe in hopes that she just couldn't, um, we couldn't hear her and she can hear us. Um, actually, I see her hand up now if, and I will um, defer back to her. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Kyle. We'll come back to you. Uh, Susan, please. Thank you, Chair Grillnick. I am very sorry. I seem to have te technology demons today and got booted off somehow. Um, the, the question that I was going to ask um, uh, originally, uh, and I'm uh, now's the appropriate time, I guess, uh, is, is I was going to ask the states, Kyle and Brett and Chris, with respect to the impacts of COVID-19 on their sampling, if they could just speak a little bit more uh, provide a little more context to what the, the, those impacts were during this last year. We had spent um, a good part of at least the April last meeting putting together a sort of a report on contingency planning and how we might handle what we anticipated or the states anticipated the challenges to be. So I'm interested in sort of if they could add to the STT report and also what they see as the outlook for 2021 in terms of whether some of those challenges may continue or whether um, uh, there's been remedies or lessons learned uh, that might change those challenges. Thank you. All right, uh, taking that as being a question addressed to the chair. So I'll look to see if any of the states want to um, provide any response to that question. Obviously, I was a challenge this last year. Uh, Kyle? Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Susan. The 
um, review document does a good job of, of sort of summarizing what happened in Washington. One of the biggest challenges was closures of the two major ports, the two only ports really on the um, north end of our coast. So we had to relocate our sampling efforts to the ports um, where fisheries for those areas were operating out of. Um, it didn't really affect our sampling for effort and catch or coded wire tags much. Um, no real reduction in sampling rates. We did um, lose DNA sampling that we would normally do and some biological data that we normally um, would collect. But all in all, I think uh, we did a, a great job of keeping sampling efforts up. Um, didn't see any failures in um, 2020, so no real reason to adjust in 2021 other than we are prepared. Um, to operate under the assumption that those port closures will remain in effect for a while and we'll be ready to relocate staff should those ports reopen uh, during the seasons this year. Um, so hopefully that's a good summary and answer Susan's question for Washington. Thanks, uh, Kyle. Uh, next, uh, Brett, followed by Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, as uh, and thank you for the question, Susan. Um, as we outlined in a CDFW report to the council back at the November 2020 meeting, um, as a result of COVID-19, uh, first, the state of California took uh, in-season action uh, prior to the onset of April fisheries to close those fisheries. Uh, due to limited access to launch ramps, closures of charter businesses, et cetera, that precluded uh, recreational fisheries from commencing as per usual and really in a fair and equitable fashion. Um, as the, at the onset of the open fisheries, the state uh, was also working diligently to uh, to generate uh, health and safety protocol for sampling the fishery and uh, acquiring PPE such that our staff could safely get out in the field and monitor as per usual. Uh, however, those uh, the needs to acquire that PPE and develop those protocols did delay our ability to get out and sample the fishery according to our uh, standard and rigorous protocol um, such that the uh, early fisheries, uh, some relatively small uh, time and area fisheries at the beginning of the season when we typically see low catch and effort uh, went without standard sampling protocol. However, um, it is important to know a few things about that. One, the vast majority of the fishery was sampled normally once those protocols and equipment were in place, such that 90% or more of uh, the harvest was monitored and sampled according to those rigorous protocols I mentioned before. Um, and the next point I'd like to make is that for some areas that were not sampled according to the more rigorous standard protocol, uh, we still were able to uh, have catch uh, and even effort estimates to cover much of those unsampled time area fisheries. Uh, and that came from electronic fish tickets and logbook data. Uh, moving on um, for those time area fisheries that did require some sort of coverage uh, beyond what we were able to achieve through uh, other means. Procedures for the purposes of stock assessment were employed uh, that were arguably more conservative uh, such that fishery effects uh, were likely overestimated as they relate to MSA and ESA objectives and just general stock assessment needs. Um, so uh, that coupled with the fact that, as I mentioned, 90% or more of the harvest was monitored 
as per usual, uh, those postseason assessments are are not likely to be sensitive to uh, the procedures that were employed uh, to adequately assess stocks for the entirety of the season, including those those area those relatively uh, small time area fisheries that were affected or impacted by the COVID nineteen pandemic. And then last, uh, to answer the final question. We do expect that 2021 fisheries will be sampled uh, and monitored normally um, as we do have those protocols in place and PPE uh, in place as well. Um, We're not expecting anything out of the ordinary in terms of fishery closures or our ability to monitor them according to our normal and rigorous standards. So thank you. Oh, got to find my button here. All right, uh, Chris Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'll I'll try and be a, a fairly brief. I think I think Oregon probably, uh, from the things I've heard and discussed with folks uh, over the last year, we probably had a, a little bit uh, more straightforward time than than California and Washington did. Uh, we did have some periodic ramp closures very early on in the pandemic, uh, associated with ports um, restricting access and. Um, uh, and you know, trying to uh, um, um, com- uh, comply and encourage the stay-at-home uh, procedures that were in place at the time, uh, but largely uh, after that, uh, and even during that, where there were fisheries going on, we were able to sample. Uh, as with the other states, uh, we focused a lot on uh, the sampling protocols and modifications of those for safety, particularly social distancing, but also including. Uh, safety equipment and such. Uh, And so as a result, we were largely able to sample uh, as we normally would, a little bit of uh, um, maybe lower sample rates in some places, but no significant or no gaps uh, in terms of sampling procedures. Uh, So really just mostly a modification, uh, a lot of effort involved uh, from the staff side and from our managers and planning how to do that well, but, but it did work. Uh, So we were able to largely, uh, I don't say quite business as usual, of course, because nothing was last year, but um, but certainly um, very close uh, to it and, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good sampling. In terms of this year, I think um, we expect that to continue. We'll, of course, start the season uh, under the same sorts of uh, practices. The trajectory in Oregon is is getting better relative to the pandemic itself. Uh, And so, you know assuming that that continues uh, to trend that direction. We're not currently anticipating any significant issues that would affect our sampling uh, and expect it to be as, uh, as, um, as good or potentially better than, than it was last year, would be my guess. So at the moment, that's what we're picturing. All right, thanks very much, Kyle. Or there, Chris. Um, further discussion? on agenda item E3. Kyle Attix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to speak quickly to um, what we heard from the SSC on the Willapa Bay forecast methodology. If the council recalls um, last March, this issue was in front of us and we had a fairly lengthy discussion about what to do with the the SSE recommendation to adopt the forecast for 2020 only and then put it back into the methodology review pipeline um, at the uh, later on in, in 2020. I believe the council actually adopted the forecast methodology um, not just for the year, but ad- adopted the methodology. So I would suggest that it is the appropriate methodology um, to use again in 2021 when we discuss uh, methodology review in April. I have some thoughts about um, the timing for that, given things I know about WDFW staffing and ability to to, um, get to that topic, but would just suggest that we have adopted that methodology and um, it is the appropriate one to use in 2021. Okay. Uh, 
I had a, a question. I need to bring up the SSC report, and it really isn't a question for the SSC. It's really perhaps for uh, Brett Cormos. Um, one of the uh, issues identified uh, in the SSC report is that the fishery management plan speaks of the intent to maximize natural production. Um, and of course, I'm not sure um, the council has much control over that since natural production is largely determined by the operation of the water projects, uh, much less so than the escapement. So, Brett, do you have a comment on that? It's okay if you don't, but I, that, that struck me a little bit. Brett? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the question. Um, I do, I can offer a couple of comments relative to that uh, information um, around the escapement objectives for Sacramento River Falls Chinook and that excerpt, uh, that, that component of the FMP that, that mentions uh, uh, managing uh, to an, uh, an escapement that maximizes natural produ production. A um, couple things. One, uh, we have made recommendations about the actual escapement objective itself um, probably a, a couple of times now in a couple of iterations of rebuilding plans for this stock, um, mentioning that, that that objective may warrant some review, um, mentioning that it is based on hatchery and natural origin uh, adult escapement, not just natural origin fish itself, um, similar to some other stocks that we manage like Klamath River Falls Chinook. Um, it isn't exclusive, uh, our management objective, given that it's both natural and hatchery origin, isn't exclusive of natural origin fish product production. But uh, like I said before, um, there are reasons to, uh, as, as has been outlined in rebuilding plans, there are reasons to consider that management objective going forward uh, and whether or not it's appropriate. Uh, the other consideration um, would be to uh, think about whether or not that excerpt from the FMP is appropriate in and of itself in this day and age. Um, it is uh, not necessarily a new feature in the FMP. Um, so uh, it's just a question of where to begin in my estimation, uh, FMP amendment or uh, embarking on what would be a pretty labor intensive, data intensive effort to examine uh, how appropriate our management objective is for this stock and uh, any changes we might want to make. All right. Thank you, Brett. Uh, any further discussion on this agenda item? Susan Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I wanted to address the SSC re report's comments regarding the question about guidance on the North Fork Lewis stock. Um, that stock is, in fact, an ESA-listed stock. Um, it is managed under a consultation standard as per um, pages 6 and 7 in our 2021 guidance letter. Um, the objective, the escapement goal objective that is in the current FMP is consistent with that consultation standard. Um, I, I believe this has come up before and it's been noted that the MSST that's in table 3.1 is likely uh, an error or an oversight um, and that we have, it should be marked uh, for cleanup initiative or cleanup amendment and we just haven't gotten to it yet. So. Um, I'm not sure best how to address that, but I would offer that clarification. All right, thank you very much, Susan. Anything further? Ms. Elke, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we're doing fine. I do not know if the council uh, plans on taking action to 
adopt the forecasts and ACLs, if that is something that needs a motion for. I would mean to check to remind us. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe uh, that a motion is appropriate. It's okay. for the council to adopt their uh, ABCs and ACLs. All right, I see that there in the council action. So I will look for someone to offer a motion. As Susan, your hand is up. I'm not sure if that's to offer the motion or not. Okay. Uh, I will look for another brave council member uh, if they choose to offer a motion to adopt the abundance forecasts and ACLs. Okay, um, then if we're not ready for a motion, then perhaps we need further discussion. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for the delay there. Um, and uh, not knowing what the reluctance for a motion might be on uh, the part of uh, the other council representatives, maybe I should hold off, but I, I am willing to do that for the good of the council. Um, so I'll, I'll wait and see here. Uh, all right. Well, that has opened the floodgates. Uh, Chris Curran. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, uh, my hesitation was me uh, scrambling to try and recall if the motion uh, would best be phrased to appropriately reference the supplemental preseason report one by the STT and that kind of language, not the uh, notion of the motion itself, so to speak. Uh, and so that was what I was struggling with and then uh, trying to find my raise hand button at some point too. Uh, I still won't have my, uh, haven't devolved the answer to that for myself yet. So if somebody's got guidance on that, uh, that might be helpful in, in breaking us loose here. Well, is it appropriate simply to refer back to uh, pre-season one? Or the, uh, I, I don't recall how we did this last year. That's my, that's my handicap. Mr. Chair, I could maybe help with that a little bit. That'd be great, Chuck. So uh, just, Jumping back to my notes uh, real quick, last year, uh, Mr. Cormors made the motion and uh, Mr. Attic seconded the motion to adopt uh, stock abundance forecasts, OFL, ABC, and ACLs as recommended by the SSC and outlined in STT report one and preseason report one. Chuck, that's great. All right, now I see Kyle's got his hand up. So my hesitation was to make sure I had the proper document to reference and to consider not including that as recommended by the SSC language based on the SSC report today. So um, if Mr. Cormos is comfortable making a motion, I'll, I'll let him proceed. I don't see uh, Brett's hand up. Kyle, maybe you want to do this. I will try to make a motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I move that the council adopt the 2021 stock abundance forecast, ABCs and ACLs as presented in agenda item E3 supplemental preseason report one. Kyle, is that um, uh, 
Does that accurately capture your motion? And um, I'm reminded uh, by Robin that there was a typo in the in the Walapa Coho, I believe, that was identified by Dr. O'Farrell. I did not annotate my copy of the document, however. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've, uh, oh, never mind. I think I see the correction's been made. The correction's been made in the published report? Uh, no, I, I was referring to the uh, inclusion of ABCs in the, in the okay. motion, uh, so that's correct, yeah. All right. Um, again, I think uh, in terms of the correction, Mr. Uh, Dr. O'Farrell mentioned, however, I, I believe that was in the uh, a formula for the uh, abundance forecast that did not affect the uh, um, ABC or ACL. Okay. And, those, and that's all we're adopting right here. So I, I, I do recall him saying that did not affect the, the result. All right, Kyle, is the language on the screen uh, accurately capture your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair, it does. And I need a second. I see Chris Kern, are you raising your hand to second this motion? I am indeed, Mr. Chair. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, let me see if there are any questions for the maker of the motion. And I'm not seeing any hands, any discussion on the motion. Susan Bishop. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I got to my hand too late. Um, I was just wondering if we could, uh, if, if Chuck could just clarify or someone could just clarify why we, why we don't need to note the um, uh, change, the correction to pre-1 for the Willapa forecast um, equation. Uh, I, well, so I, I believe the, uh, the, so the, number presented in text is uh, was what was correct. And I believe the correct number is in the, the tables there. Um, so uh, if you want to make that uh, distinction, um, that, that would be fine. My recollection from Mike was that the typo was in the formula, but the actual result um, was was correct. So the numbers that are presented are correct. Is that does someone have a different recollection? And we're adopting the numbers through this motion. You might you might want to ask uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, Dr. O'Farrell, or if you are available, I see you're you're unmuted, but I. Don't hear your voice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here. Could you clarify for us whether the numbers we're adopting here out of preseason one are correct? The ABC, ACL, OFL numbers that appear in the text and in the tables are correct. It's what, what the, the change that, uh, or the error that we noted was in the text, there is an equation that shows the calculation of, for instance, the OFL. And one part of that equation is uh, the abundance. And the abundance was uh, incorrect. Yet the answer is correct. The answer being the OFL itself, as well as the ACL and ABC. All right. That's that's what we needed to know. So, uh, so that uh, does that answer your question, Susan? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it does. Thank All you, right. Brett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm reluctant to say this, and uh, admittedly, I let Kyle uh, take a stab at stumbling on this, much like I did last year. Um, 
However, I do note that we're missing OFL in the motion here as one of the things we're adopting. And I only mention that since we decided to uh, be special, especially careful that uh, that number was correct. All right, so are you offering an amendment to the motion to include OFL? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I am, and thank you for making that so easy. I, I, uh, <laughs> I amend the emotion and and add OFL, OFLs to uh, the range of preseason report one uh, items that we are adopting here today. All right, thank you for that, Brett. Um, I'm looking for a second for the amendment. Okay, seconded by Krista Svensson. Thanks very much, Krista. Uh, speak to your motion as necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I made that clear already. I won't belabor the point any further. All right. Uh, any? I don't see any hands for discussion. So we'll we'll vote on the amendment offered by Brett Cormos and. Seconded by Krista Svensson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. Abstentions. The motion to amend passes unanimously. We're now back to the main motion as amended. Any further discussion on the main motion as amended? I'm not seeing any hands. I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion as amended say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? All right, the motion as amended passes unanimously. So um, we accomplished the adoption of these numbers. Um, before I turn back to Robin, uh, let me ask around the table if there's any further action or Chuck, if I've missed anything else. Um, and I'm not seeing any hands. So now I'll go back to Robin and see if we've done our duty here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you have. You have heard from the STT on their stock status, their report from the SSC. You've heard from the tribes. You've heard from the states regarding anticipated changes due to COVID in the upcoming year. You've addressed some of the uh, issues that the SSC uh, put out there in their report, and um, you ended up at a perfect place at almost perfectly the five o'clock hour. So with that, I will say that you have completed this agenda item. Thank you. Yes, it is 4.58. Um, we've completed our agenda for today. We'll start with Sam and tomorrow. Let me just turn to Chuck Tracy and see if he has any announcements before we uh, take a break until the morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not really announced, but I do, I do have uh, maybe just one uh, sort of follow up from this agenda item. Uh, well, we did adopt the, uh, uh, the council did adopt the abundance estimates. Um, I, I guess I would note that the action also uh, requires action on any relevant conservation objectives or status determination. So I don't think there's any really action needed by the council, but uh, I, I guess I would note that uh, with uh, the most recent abundance estimate, it appears that Sacramento River Falls Chinook are, uh, uh, should be classified as rebuilt, and I guess I would just look to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service to uh, uh, if we should expect a notification of that uh, at, at some point. Um, so other than that, I have, uh, I have no announcements, uh, just uh, start tomorrow at eight o'clock on salmon agenda. Um, just to follow up on your comment, Susan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tracy. Um, uh, uh, yes, we're, it's very, we are very happy to see that the STT has concluded that the um, Sacramento Falls Chinook seem to have met the criteria for rebuilt. Uh, NIFS will need to make an, a formal determination about that. And we will, um, to undertake that task um, as soon as we complete uh, preseason planning. Does Thank that you. help? Thank yeah, that's great. Anything further? 
All right, it's five o'clock.